he was just talking. It is okay. She only needs to be there uh, at the end for the discussion anyway. So we should start on time. Hello. Dr. Sajay, Shilpa. Hello. Yeah. We okay to start? Yeah, I think we can start because our first speaker is there and uh, chairperson is also there. Okay. Yeah. So, so ma'am will be start. Elizabeth, ma'am, you are ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. So we can go ahead, right? Yeah. Yes. So, Good to right. go. Good morning. On behalf of Airway Society Kochi, I welcome you to CAMCON 2021, which is being held as a virtual event. Airway Society Kochi was created in 2016 by a group of anesthetists with a passion for difficult airway management and teaching. We have organized CAMCON for three successive years. The conference and workshops are approved by the Difficult Airway Society UK and endorsed by the All India Difficult Airway Association and Airway Management Foundation of India. They have been very well received, the highlights being national and international experts in advanced airway management teaching at the hands-on workshop and sharing their knowledge and views in the highly interactive CME. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought the world to a standstill, but with our human resilience, we are bouncing back. Advances in technology has made it possible for us to hold CAMCON 2021 on a virtual platform. Our technical support team, A1 Logics, and my friends from Kerala and UK, Sam, Sajay, Jay, and Sajid, have worked hard to bring together an excellent program. We are truly humbled by the response we received with over 2,000 delegates from 41 countries registering for CAMCON 2021. We have an impressive lineup of faculty who are airway experts from different parts of the world, from UK, India, Switzerland, and Netherlands, who have agreed to join us in spite of their busy schedule on a Sunday. A special mention of thanks to our sponsors, especially the Intersurgicals, for their continued support over the years. Even though we miss the hands-on experience and the real-life meeting, we hope it will be a fantastic learning experience for all of you. And we hope that next year we will be able to have CAMCON at Kochi itself without masks and hand sanitizers. We will now move on to the first session. I shall introduce the speakers. Sorry, I shall introduce the chairpersons. Dr. Raj Sahajanandan is a professor and head of the Department of Anesthesia at Christian Medical College, Bello. He has recently set up a state of the art anesthesia skills lab and is faculty at national and international conferences with a special interest in cardiac anesthesia, simulation, and airway management. Welcome, Raj. Dr. Ekta Rai is Professor in Anesthesia at CMC Vello. She is WFSA Course Coordinator for Pediatric Anesthesia Fellowship at CMC. She has several publications in national and international journals and is a faculty at national and international conferences. Welcome Raj and Ekta. Uh, good morning. Welcome to uh, CAMCON 2021. We'll start our first session, which is Back to Basics, for which we have an eminent teacher, Dr. Ramkumar Venkateshwaran. 
he has been the head of manipal uh, hospital for the last so many years and uh, he has been the founder chairman of all india difficult airway association and he currently is the editor in chief of airway which is the journal of ada over to you sir for the, your talk a very good morning to all our delegates uh, at the very beginning i would like to thank the organizers of campcon 2021 for having given me this uh, topic on back to basics uh, as the starting lecture for the day's sessions when i was asked to speak on this topic i initially started wondering what i should be speaking and then as i pondered over the topic for a little while i realized that uh, most of the time uh, things go wrong wrong in uh, in medicine uh, in anesthesiology also because we don't pay adequate attention to the basics and uh, therefore i thought that you know we can address the various basic issues in airway management during an anesthetic in a sequential manner starting from a pre operative assessment of the patient with a special focused uh, airway assessment and go on to the intraoperative management of the airway and finally end up with the warding of the patient in the post operative ward so all these steps that we shall go go through i will try and address the basic issues that might go wrong and uh, of course i will present evidence from literature and i'll also present evidence from my own personal experiences as well as experiences from uh, my colleagues so that it will be more of a uh, you know a session that will be relevant so with this introduction i'll go straight away to the first step of airway management which is the pre operative evaluation now if you're working in a, in a teaching department very often the team that does the first pre anesthetic evaluation will be the team of the residents the trainees who will probably do the evaluation of the patient on the day before surgery and uh, uh, on the day of surgery we get another chance and wh I, what i would like to call that is a second look evaluation which is usually done on the day of surgery in the pre operative holding area by a more senior person and this can be used as an opportunity to reevaluate the patient's airway and also to educate the trainee on any point that might have been missed there's something that i've learned in my own practice from my colleagues uh, mistakes was that airway evaluation uh, should be essentially done both in the supine position as well as in the sitting position and the reason for this is on one occasion uh, when i went to examine a patient in the ward the patient was sitting up and then when i asked the patient to look up and look down to evaluate the range of movement of the neck what the patient did was the patient arched the shoulder backwards and created an artificial extension of the neck and this fooled me and uh, uh, needless to say very next day we had a problem in achieving adequate positioning of this patient for intubation and from that point onwards i decided that i should examine every patient not only in the sitting position but also in the supine position a lesson that i learned more than 35 years ago from from one uh, professor valery major from velour uh, was the 1 2 3 rule for a quick evaluation of the airway as is often required in an emergency when you don't have time to do a complete evaluation of the airway and this 1 2 3 rule is nothing but placing a finger in front of the tragus and opening the mouth and feeling your finger go into the temporomandibular joint that's one finger two fingers between the uh, incisor teeth uh, when the mouth is open tells you that you have adequate space for introducing either a laryngoscope blade or a supraglottic airway and three fingers from the chin up to the thyroid notch tells you that you have enough space in the submandibular region to displace the tongue during the, the process of laryngoscopy a very elegant paper by dr kodali and his colleagues in anesthesiology in 2008 brings out the importance of the changes that can happen 
in a lady's airway anatomy, not only during pregnancy, but also during active labor. So we know that we examine the airway in the first trimester. As we move through second and third trimester, airway changes do happen, and we need to keep that uh, in mind. And when a lady goes into labor, because she strains uh, to push the baby out, and uh, uh, there is also sometimes an inadequate pain relief is given, she may be also shouting in pain. And for all these reasons, you find that uh, the airway anatomy changes and the airway becomes more edematous. Now, coming to the second part, that is after evaluating the airway, we now look at positioning of the patient for intubation. And uh, for this, there are various recommendations in literature, starting with a pillow of a height of around 8 to 10 centimeters to a pillow that is non-existent, a no-pillow uh, situation. And uh, all these recommendations are probably appropriate because when you look at an adult who needs to be positioned for intubation, an 8 to 10 centimeter high non-compressible pillow is placed under the occiput. And this results in a flexion of the cervical spine of about 35 degrees, which is one of the steps required to attain a line of vision to see the glottis. Going to the other extreme in an infant, you find that the infant's head is very large in comparison to the chest of the infant. And here you may need to place the pillow, not under the head, but under the thorax, or maybe a shoulder roll in order to elevate the thorax uh, and make the head fall backwards in order for you to be able to attain the proper position for intubation. As the child grows, maybe to two or three years of age, then you may not need a pillow at all, either under the head or under the thorax. So the use of the pillow and the position of the pillow changes as the child grows. Now in an adult, we get the classical sniffing position by placing a 10 centimeter pillow under the occiput. This results in a 35 degree neck flexion as has been seen here. And uh, with extension of the face plane by 15 degrees, you get the final classical sniffing position for intubation. And this picture courtesy is from uh, uh, Dr. Maurya Indubala's uh, paper in Airway uh, 2020. Now, other than using the pillow for positioning the head, the other issue that we need to keep in mind is the relative height of the table. At what position is the patient's forehead in relation to specific surface markings on the operator's body is another issue that helps or comes in the way of intubation. So there is this elegant paper by Lee et al. in the British Journal of Anesthesia 2014 titled, Higher Operating Tables Provide Better Laryngeal Views for Tracheal Intubation. And to the right, you have four diagrams, A, B, C, and D. A and B have the patient's head positioned at the level of the xiphoid process of the intubator, and C and D have the patient's head located at the umbilicus of the, of the operator or the intubator. In A and C, the operator is providing mask ventilation, and in B and D, the operator is, is performing intubation. And the, the result of this paper indicated that when the head of the pillow, which is a ready-made available pillow, in order to achieve this position in the obese individuals, so now we have assessed the airway and we have uh, seen how we best position the patient with or without a pillow and how special positions like the uh, help or the ramp position are required in obese individuals. And the next step that anesthesiologists would uh, do is to oxygenate the patient prior to anesthetizing the patient prior to intubation. So oxygenation can be done either by one of these three techniques the pre-oxygenation technique, the re-oxygenation technique, and the continuous oxygenation technique. And I shall explain each of these terms. The bottom line in all of these three techniques is the administration of oxygen to the patient at the start of an anesthetic or during the process of intubation, by which the functional residual capacity of the patient's lungs are filled with adequate oxygen so that should the intubation or should the uh, placement of a definitive airway take a little longer than expected, the patient will not desaturate to unsafe levels. Now, pre-oxygenation is possibly what all of us started with, you know, we, when we were trained in anesthesia. And this is nothing but administering either 100% oxygen or various com combinations of oxygen and air. Uh, there are several uh, you know, views expressed in literature. But you give an oxygen-containing mixture in order to build up the oxygen reserves in the FRC. 
And that's what's called pre-oxygenation. And we do this for a period of three to five minutes. Re-oxygenation is nothing but uh, taking advantage of a situation when in between intubation attempts, when let's say you have failed to intubate the patient in the first attempt, you take advantage of that break by re-oxygenating your patient and building up the oxygen reserves in the lung once again. And the third term here, continuous oxygenation, is probably the safest, where we administer oxygen continuously at a rate of around 10 to 15 liters per minute through nasal prongs. The oxygen goes in through the nasopharynx and oropharynx, and even in an apneic individual, it results in what we call apneic oxygenation. So these are the three basic methods by which we oxygenate. The bottom line is give oxygen. Oxygenate, oxygenate, oxygenate. Never miss an opportunity to oxygenate your patient during the anesthetic. Now, I just mentioned that we can use uh, uh, different gas flows to oxygenate and for different durations of three to five minutes. We also must remember that if you choose to oxygenate your patient, to pre-oxygenate your patient through the closed circuit system, the circuit system has got a dead space volume which needs to be flushed with oxygen. And this is what we call priming of the closed circuit. Uh, we must ensure that we get a good mask fit. If there is a loose fitting mask, then there may be gaps present between the face of the patient and the mask, and the patient may not breathe the oxygen mixture or the 100% oxygen that you are giving to the patient, but may dilute that by breathing air in the spaces that are there between the face and the loose fitting mask. Another point that we can we must remember is that we should not lose the opportunity of oxygenation, oxygenation during transport. Let's say you are transporting a critically ill patient from an ICU to the operation theater for surgery. Or the other classical example is transporting a lady who has been in labor and now the decision has been taken to move her to the operating room for a cesarean delivery. All along during transport, and also while the lady is waiting outside the operating room for the anesthetist to get the operating room ready for surgery, we must make use of two uh, important facts. One, we must keep the lady on her lateral position so that we avoid uh, aortic cable compression, and we must administer oxygen continuously so that even before the anesthesiologist comes into the picture, adequate oxygen reserves are built up in the mother's lungs, and this will benefit both the mother and the baby. So despite whether you use pre-oxygenation or re-oxygenation or continuous oxygenation, uh, the safe saturation level would be more than 95%. And this is what has been emphasized in the All India Difficult Airway Association guidelines, where we have said that if the saturation remains above 95%, we are safe. But the moment it drops below 95%, it is time to escalate our airway interventions. Now coming to the next step, that is introduction of the blade. And this can be done by one of two methods. And the important thing is, as we are introducing the laryngoscope blade into the mouth, one must look into the mouth to see the structures that are being displaced. Look at the soft tissues that are being displaced so that we don't inadvertently damage any of the soft tissues while the laryngoscope blade is being advanced until we reach the larynx. So the classical method of opening the mouth is shown here, where the operator's right hand is placed on the forehead of the patient, and you tilt the head back so that the occiput is tucked under the shoulder, so to say. And this results in the mouth falling open automatically. And you are creating a cervical flexion of around 35 degrees, which is essential for getting the proper line of sight to intubate. The left hand of the person who is performing the intubation is now holding the laryngoscope. And the ulnar border of the palm and the little finger are now being used to further open the mouth. And this is more clearly demonstrated here in this artist's impression of opening the mouth by the classical method of tilting the head back and using your alna border of the hand or the palm and the little finger to open the mouth further. The second technique of opening the mouth is by what is called the cross scissor maneuver, wherein you place the index finger on the upper incisor, that is as is shown here, and the thumb is placed on the lower incisors. And by just crossing your fingers like that, you can open the mouth and create the space necessary to introduce the laryngoscope blade. So now that you've opened the mouth by one of two methods and you've been careful to look into the mouth to see the structures as they are being displaced, the um, operator 
who is performing the intubation now needs to announce the cook's modification in either one, two A, two B, three A, three B, and four. One, you see most of the vocal cords. In two A, you see the posterior cords. In two B, only the arytenoids are visible. In three A, epiglottis is visible and liftable. In three B, epiglottis is adherent to the pharynx. And in four, no laryngeal structures are seen. And accordingly, one and two A are classified as easy. Two B and three A as restricted, and three B and four as difficult. Now, why is this important? It's important because when you look at easy grades of one and to a most airway managers can intubate with conventional view of 2b and 3a experienced airway managers and when you go on to the difficult scenarios of 3b and 4 uh, cooks modification of cormac lehane grade even skilled airway managers may or may not be able to intubate and you may require the help of an ent surgeon in order to perform a tracheostomy so depending on the grade of laryngoscopy that is seen and declared by the primary operator we can plan our airway management accordingly what airway equipment do we need to keep ready we need to keep a stillet a bougie and a tube exchanger ready the supracardiac airway device is always a, a rescue device a savior in most situations so it's ideal to have a difficult airway cart in readiness at all times in a in a predetermined place uh, it may not be possible in every operative situation It's always wise to not only have appropriate equipment available, but also to have an appropriate assistant available. It is wise to have a trained assistant for every anesthetic, especially when dealing with extremes of age, obese patients, or identified difficult airways. And ego has no place in medicine. No matter how senior you may be, always make sure that you call for help in time. Once a difficult airway is identified, get an experienced assistant in the loop. preferably available in the OR and if an emergency cricothyroidotomy or a tracheotomy seems to be a possibility have an ENT surgeon also alerted and preferably present in the operating room what equipment should i use ideally we use whatever equipment we are familiar with do not use equipment for the first time when the situation becomes demanding you know it's not a great idea to learn driving on a crowded street Once you've intubated uh, your patient or you place an airway device, you need to auscultate for bilateral air entry and look at the waveform capnography for seeing at least three consecutive capnographs to ensure that the tracheal tube is in the right place. The supracardiac airway position is likewise good when there's free ingress and egress of gas is noted. There's no leak at 20 centimeters of water, and there are no sounds of gas entering the stomach. Once the airway device is in place. and ensure that proper fixation of the endotracheal tube or the supraglottic airway device is done by yourself then you have only yourself to blame and if the position of the head is changed to facilitate surgery check the correct position of the device once surgical positioning is complete and this is especially important for prone position double lumen tubes and ra tubes for cleft surgery we need to watch the capnograph and the pulse oximeter continuously like a hawk because monitors never lie so human beings may sometimes lie now any fool can intubate and one needs intelligence to extubate is a famous adage and uh, we need to have an extubation strategy plan which is known to the entire team extreme vigilance needs to be exercised at intubation as well as during extubation and if intubation has been difficult you ha- should have additional help and equipment ready at extubation If the decision is to retain the endotracheal tube and shift the patient to an HTU or an ICU for overnight observation, consider extubating in the operating room for a small subgroup of patients. Though the majority of patients may be safely extubated in the high dependency unit or the ICU. Now you must uh, prepare a difficult airway alert whenever you had an airway management problem, so that future anesthesiologists managing this patient may be. physically mentally and equipmentally prepared for the occasion now in summary i'd like to say that we should make airway examination an important part of a pre operative evaluation we should never be overconfident when the airway evaluation raises a red flag one should insist that the primary operator announces the grade of glottic visualization as it acts as an alert for the rest of the team as to what is in store as far as the airway is concerned 
be confident in at least one other technique of securing the airway should your primary intubation attempt fail and remember a supraglottic airway device often saves the day and always have one appropriate size supraglottic airway device on your anesthetic trolley all the time if a difficult airway is anticipated be prepared with assistance and equipment never hesitate to call for help call for help early there is no ego involved when patient's life is at stake never miss an opportunity to administer oxygen to maintain an spo2 more than 95% and go back to the drawing board following management of a difficult airway ensure an educative debriefing is done for everybody's benefit and remember finally no matter who you are and how experienced you might be no airway is safe safely secured by you until the capnograph declares it to be so so once again i end by thanking sam elizabeth and sajin for this wonderful opportunity and the entire team campcon 2021 for giving me this wonderful opportunity to share my experience thank you thank you sir for their wonderful lecture uh now uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the second speaker uh, who is dr rakesh kumar who is my teacher from maulana sir medical college he is a dynamic anesthetist and has been an inspiration and role model for many of us he is the founder chairman of uh, airway management foundation and he was the director and professor of maulana sir medical college at delhi for many years over to you sir he will talk to us about safe extubation in difficult airway thank you very much team campcon for this great opportunity bring greetings from ambedkar medical college which i have joined i'll be joining on 16th of january and from my previous institutions mamc where i worked for 40 years and sgt university where i worked for nearly 6 months i'll be talking to you about safe extubation in difficult airway and uh, it is known that respiratory complications after tracheal extubation are associated with significant morbidity and mortality and on top of that although the death and brain damage because of problems at intubation have been decreasing in the past few years the same is not true about problems related to extubation and we know that there are preventable human factors at play so there is all the more reason that we should know and give serious consideration to extubation extubation we know because it is an elective process wherein we leave the controlled environment of a safely uh, secured airway into an uncontrolled area wherein we are losing the control on the airway so it should be absolutely at our disposal as to when we extubate the patient although the vortex implementation tool is not meant to address this per se but if you look at it we do the uh, it is really applicable to extubation situations so so that we have to reoxygenate the patient we have to assemble all our resources to the best of our capability make a proper plan to extubate and remember that it is never an urgency to extubate the patient and we must stabilize the patient's general condition and oxygen saturation and the best person should be doing the job which do we have the experience to extubate when we are trying to extubate a patient my first exposure to extubation was in 2003 when i went through the asa guidelines 
and uh, heard about uh, the use of uh, something like an airway exchange catheter at that time and taking a cue from there uh, uh, we did something which i'll talk to you a little later but uh, organized guidelines for taking extubation were published by um, das in 2012 which prompted uh, a strategic step by the post to extubation and emphasized on post extubation care as well so as i said we we created our own indigenous airway exchange catheter it used to be called a tube changer at that point of time first a pedestrian one and then a more sturdy one which we have been using right up till now as well and at the same time around the same time 2003 i went full scale into airway workshops and cmes uh, initially as a part of mamc and later on as a part of airway management foundation and we have kept ourselves busy and at the same time dealt with extubation with great respect and we have a whole lot of wonderful instructors from all over the country which are part to party to it along with the support from wonderful sets of patients that we uh, we undertake and uh, devices and gadgets and simulators and mannequins which make it easier for us to uh, to transfer the knowledge whatever little we have and our last workshop was in uh, late february just before the pandemic hit the whole uh, world and it was in uh, end of february last year coming to safe extubation of difficult airway the first thing to make it safe will be to at least identify whether we are dealing with a difficult extubation or not and for uh, once we have done that then only we can think of optimizing if there are some reversible factors which are making it difficult and if we are able to optimize if we are not able to optimize them by the end of the surgery there is no point extubating the patient till we have optimized them and if it is not going to if it is going to take a few hours wait till that time or if it is going to take longer or if it is surgical requirement then tracheostomy is the answer if however we can optimize the the the, uh, the uh, reversible factors by the end of the surgery then we must answer the question whether it will be easier to reintubate in case we need it or difficult if it is going to be easy then if the patient can tolerate a wake extubation we we should go for a wake extubation but if the patient can't tolerate a wake extubation then we have to choose between a uh, supraortic airway device extubation or remifentanil extubation if the reintubation is going to be difficult then the way out is airway exchange catheter extubation how do we identify difficult extubation well the difficulty can be due to general risk factors as well as airway risk factors and we 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 should try to identify these at the time of free anesthetic checkup itself or during the course of surgery if we feel that something is going on which is going to make the airway difficult and near the end of the surgery because things might happen uh, like halo fixation right at the end of the surgery which can make the airway difficult so there there are predictors which really stare at our face and it is very easy to identify however it is not very simple to identify the subtle changes uh, which can happen because of edema or bleeding etc and the best way is to have always have a high uh, index of suspicion you keep looking at the surgical site again and again and the supraglottic changes in the airway dimensions can be uh, diagnosed with the help of a direct laryngoscope or a video laryngoscope but for subglottic changes uh, two uh, rather uh, uh, rough tests are available which is the cuff leak test and the ultrasonography uh, wherein we look for the airway collar around the endotracheal tube after cuff deflation but for the lower airway factor you have to depend upon fibroscopy or uh, or or chest x ray you know uh, just a word about cuff leak test the, the what we mean by cuff leak leak is that the the expired tidal, tidal volume or expiratory tidal volume with the cuff inflated minus the expiratory tidal volume with the cuff deflated and if it is expressed as an uh, as a percentage of 
uh, expiry tail volume with the cuff inflated then uh, it is uh, any any value more than uh, 10 to 25% uh, uh, or for an adult more than 110 to 130 ml of uh, leak uh, is reassuring that the likelihood of difficult extubation are less so once we have found that uh, uh, the, the the airway is difficult and we have some optimizable factors which are there uh, try to optimize these reversible factors and by that we i i i mean that not only those general and airway related factors but also optimize the location and the type of or the kind of assistance that you need at the time of extubation we all optimize in most of our extubations even in normal patients the oxygen stores the patient position and final pharyngeal secretions however when uh, when when we are suspecting airway edema to be uh, to be there then we must do something to manage it and uh, because we know that even iv hydrocortisone takes about 30 to 45 minutes to start acting it is it is a good idea that we preempt and use these steroids well in advance of the time that the edema will is likely to come up epinephrine nebulization is another wonderful way of doing it as we did in this case of uh, a large uh, large uh, uh, you know vocal polyp which was there and uh, we not only gave steroids to this patient right in the beginning of the surgery but we also uh you know nebulize the the the, the uh, part which which was likely to have edema that is the the vocal cords by using the uh, supraglottic airway device exchange technique wherein we put the supraglottic device alongside the endotracheal tube and then use this uh, supraglottic device to uh, direct the nebulization on to the vocal cords through this nebulizer which has epinephrine in it directly on to the site where the likelihood of uh, edema is there however if you cannot optimize the uh, uh, the reversible causes by the end of the surgery there is no point in going for removal of the tube we must wait for the the optimization to be completed if it is going to take a lot of time or there are surgical reasons to do tracheostomy go for tracheostomy but if few hours only are needed to settle it out then extubate this person in the icu or hdu after you have optimized the the, the reversible causes fully on the other hand if optimization is complete by the end of the surgery then we must consider uh, on table extubation but again we have to ensure that in a difficult extubation scenario whether reintubation will be easy or difficult if it is going to be easy then we choose any of these three uh, uh, choices but if it is not going to be easy then the only way out is to use an airway exchange catheter extubation if the reintubation is easy and the patient can uh, uh, can and tolerate awake extubation then these patients must go through the steps of a wake intubation which we do in uh, regularly in our routine practice so i'll not go into the detail of that the only thing i like to uh, put on record is that you switch off the nitrous oxide and volatile agents uh, even 5 or 10 minutes in more in advance as compared to uh, a, a normal airway situation but uh, you uh, uh, suction the 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 pharyngeal secretions before you switch off the volatile agents and once you have antagonized the neuromuscular block you wait till the patient has clear cut eye opening and the person is obeying command commands only then with the with the with the lung at near vital capacity by applying positive pressure will you remove the endotracheal tube and after the endotracheal tube is has been taken out then it is a good idea to keep the airway clear open and not allow the the secretions to go anywhere near the periglottic area and for that you can keep the head 
patient's head tilted and to the side that achieves both these uh, objectives. However, if the patient is in, has such conditions that make uh, it difficult for him to tolerate awake uh, extubation, that the patient cannot tolerate hemodynamic instability or the surgical uh, thing is at risk when you, if the patient is uh, extubated awake, then you try one of, one of uh, these two methods. And these two methods have very similar indications if you look at it. Uh, and uh, uh, because we don't have ramifentanyl extubation technique, what we use in our setup is LMA exchange extubation or the Bailey maneuver. And both these, remember, both these techniques are inappropriate alone if there is difficulty in reintegration, which I have already talked about. So where do we use LMA extubation or LMA exchange extubation? Uh, one of such indications that we use it regularly for is for post-thyroidectomy cases, especially where we are suspecting that there is likelihood of trachea or or vocal cord uh, paralysis is likely to be there. So in these cases, uh, we, you know, we can, we uh, see the, uh, the vocal cords and we remove the tube under vision, our scope has gone through the supraglottic airway device, as you can see here, and the tube has been taken out after suctioning the pharyngeal secretions. And once we have done that, we wait for the vocal cord uh, action to start. The, remember that the patient has still is still in deep vein of anesthesia, but we have reversed the neuromuscular blocking agent effect by giving a uh, reversal to this patient. But uh, what we do is we also introduce this fiberscope all the way down to carina. And while drawing it back, patient is breathing spontaneously, we can also look for the tracheal malacia, whether the tracheal wall is collapsing against the other wall. And if re uh, reintubation is difficult, Although the optimization is complete, the answer is to use an airway exchange uh, catheter-assisted extubation. An airway exchange catheter is uh, uh, around 80 centimeter long, uh, blunt-ended, uh, hollow, semi-rigid, thermostable um, tubing, which, which has graduations on it, and it is radio opaque and it is it also has a 15 millimeters connector supplied with it so the first thing that we have to do is to ensure that when we introduce this airway exchange catheter into the endotracheal tube it should not jut beyond the patient end of the of the of the endotracheal tube because that way it can injure the the walls uh, uh, of the trachea and to, to ensure that, what we do is that we measure the distance of, uh, of the length, the complete length of the endotracheal tube and the connection of the, uh, the length of the, uh, the, two, uh, the connectors which are there. And we add these to find out, say, about 30 and another 5 centimeters, 35 centimeters is the, uh, the depth to which we should introduce the, the, uh, the airway exchange catheter. Uh, also, we should uh, look at the centimeter mark of, of, of the endotracheal tube at the patient's lip or the nose, whichever the case may be, so that we know that when we have finally we are when we are positioning or fixing the AEC, we should know that uh, it is at the same depth to which the endotracheal tube had been introduced. Now, what we do is that we have, like here we have noticed that the tube was at 19 centimeter. And uh, we have sucked out and, uh, uh, you know, and, and suctioning has been done and we are ready to extubate and we have deflated the cuff of the endotracheal tube as well. Now the measured length which we have marked on the, on the airway exchange catheter, we introduce the airway exchange catheter to, the, to that marking that we have noted. And once we have reached there, we pull out the we pull out the endotracheal tube. We pull out the endotracheal tube, but 
holding the airway exchange catheter so that it is not pushed inside while we are pulling the tube out. And we also look that the depth to which the, the tube was, endotracheal tube was there, the AEC is only at that level and not gone any further. We can see it again in this patient of uh, flap repair where we had put in an end, uh, airway exchange catheter. And if you look at it, the, the vitals of the patients are maintained. We are about to uh, extubate this patient in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, sorry. So, we do here is that, okay. So we introduce the, uh, the required length into the, into the endotracheal tube and then we start pulling out the endotracheal tube. Please look at the, the way the, this is maintained nicely, right? And we ensure that the airway exchange catheter is not pushed inside while we are pulling out the tube and the mark which we had put is there at the nasal opening. Uh, these airway exchange catheters are tolerated very well. This is uh, 36 hours after we had put in an airway exchange catheter. And this is because the AEC takes only a very small part of the glottic chink as against the endotracheal tube, right? And there is a, a, a slight improvement in the in the airway exchange catheter extubation which is called the staged extubation wherein we not we do not put an airway exchange catheter but rather put a extubation wire which is a soft malleable tip wire which is pretty long and not the uh, the not the, uh, the the AEC and whenever we have to intubate the patient we uh, we slide this airway exchange uh, uh, reintubation catheter over this wire, and this wire is even better tolerated by the patient because it takes even a smaller part of the glottic chink as against the airway exchange catheter. Post extubation care of difficult extubation is also important, and these patients should be transferred under under close monitoring and oxygenation, and the and the orders and instructions for the HDU staff should be very clear and written instructions and the monitoring should also be of high level. If reintubation ever is needed, you just have to disconnect, uh, um, recheck re that the, the airway exchange catheter uh, is inside the trachea by connecting it to entitled CO2 uh, connector and thereafter you lubricate and uh, the end of the airway exchange catheter and slide the tube over it all the way into the trachea. And while you are doing it, while it is going into the oral cavity, it is a good idea to use a laryngoscope or a video laryngoscope to facilitate the entry of the endotracheal tube. So to summarize, uh, friends, extubation is a totally elective process. So take your time and execute it well. The goal of every extubation should be to ensure uninterrupted oxygen delivery to patient's lung and avoid airway stimulation. And as I told you earlier, for that, it's a good idea after extubation to keep the patient's head nicely extended and rotated to one side, which keeps the secretions away and keeps the airway open. But if you anticipate difficult extubation, either during PAC, during surgery, or near the end of the surgery, try to optimize if there is anything which is optimizable. If you are not able to optimize it, defer it till you can optimize or take customize the patient. So when in doubt, keep the tube inside. When in doubt, leave it inside. You know, it was it is something different from what you we used to be taught during intubation. So during intubation, when we did not have an title and other things, we were told, when in doubt, take it out. But when it comes to extubation, when in doubt, leave it in. And choose extubation technique based on the ease of reintubation or and the patient's ability to tolerate awake intubation. And learn various techniques through workshops, 
and practice in normal airway cases as well you know that is the way you will because you might not be using them day in day out so to to, to remain in touch it is a good idea to do that thank you very much for your kind attention thanks a lot thank you so much for your talk sir um you have very clearly demonstrated that you believe in seeing and uh, believing um not only in operation theaters but also in your uh, presentation thank you so much for all the videos sir um now we'll move on to our third speaker uh, dr rebecca jacob uh, it is an honor for me to uh, introduce ma'am here she is my teacher and mentor ma'am is uh, our ex head of department anesthesia christian medical uh, college vellore and she was with us for 41 years plus um the word pediatric anesthesia and ma'am goes hand by hand hand in hand um to give her current uh, you know achievements ma'am is uh, currently member of medical advisory uh, board uh, council and smile train and enjoying with her grandchildren ma'am over to you good morning everybody today i have been asked to speak on the tips and tricks tricks of managing the pediatric airway now infants are children up to 1 year of age and toddlers between 1 and 2 years i will be concentrating on this age group rather than on the older child <clears throat> now their size weight anatomy and physiology vary greatly from the adult failure to account for this can easily lead to complications like loss of airway and thus oxygenation as the child grows you have to consider factors such as loose teeth and enlarged lymphoid tissue now why is it important to manage the airway efficiently it's because these little babies have a high metabolic rate and a high oxygen consumption they have very little reserve capacity and a large dead space which gives rise to hypoxia and carbon dioxide retention thus an infant cannot hold his breath or remain unventilated as long as an adult can why am i worried because the hypoxia can lead to bradycardia a decreased cardiac output which means less oxygen delivery to the tissues hypoxia and hypercarbia acidosis and myocardial depression and cardiac arrest so i must ensure good ventilation to avoid hypoxia i minimize apneic periods i preoxygenate all patients if possible but can i still run into problems of course because their upper airway is prone to obstruction they have a large occiput which increases neck flexion and kinks the airway a larynx which is anterior with a large floppy epiglottis and a large tongue relative to the size of the oropharynx look at this baby if i have him lying supine or a pillow under the head he kinks his airway because his chin is touching his chest if on the other hand i extend his head then i open up the airway in the adult we know that to align the oral pharyngeal and laryngeal axes i have to put a pillow under the adult's head and extend his neck on his thorax in a baby it is different i have to use a roll under the shoulder to get these axes in a straight line and that is what i mean a roll under the shoulder with a neck extension where else can i expect problems in the oral cavity at the temporomandibular joint the maxilla the mandible and in the cervical spine now to assess the pediatric airway we use the kopur scale which is first described by lane in the older child we could use the malampati scale now the kopur scale gets us to look at the chin which c for chin o for the opening of the mouth p for previous intubation or obstructive sleep apnea u for uvula and r for the range of extension of the neck so each of these factors is given a number the more difficult it is is a higher number 
This helps us decide whether the intubation is going to be easy or going to be difficult. 16 would be a dangerous airway. What other problems can you expect during induction? Be very difficult to separate the baby from the parents. If there is any probability of a difficult airway or hemodynamic instability, do not have the parents present during induction. You know that a crying child has increased secretions. Check your suction before starting. A laryngospasm can occur at any time. Have expert help, drugs ready, your crash cart and difficult airway cart available. If there's a difficult IV access, which you have noted in a plump child or a child who's been poked many times before, ask for expert help early because someone needs to look after the airway and someone else has to start the IV access. If you are planning an IV induction, check the IV patency before induction to prevent unexpected extravasation before you give any drugs. Calculate the drug dosages carefully for each patient and stick to your calculations. If you're going for an inhalation induction, decide on the agent early. Now, this, th these two babies will have a difficult mask ventilation. You have to keep your equipment ready and get help early. What equipment? If I have all these masks, I still won't be able to induce this baby. I must think earlier and have an adult mask available for this baby. If you are inexperienced or unsure, do not give a muscle relaxant until you are sure that you can ventilate adequately. The position for intubation, place a roll under the shoulders for the mask holding and for intubation. A head ring helps to stabilize the head and you won't need people to come and hold the head for you. In older children, use a folded sheet under the head. Have all your equipment available. Make sure that the suction is working and ask for additional help. Now, the technique of direct laryngoscopy depends on being able to see the glottis properly because light travels in straight lines from the eye to the glottis. Now, this is important because the control in a baby is the problem with the tongue. A big tongue and a small chin, especially in a child who has a syndrome like the pear robin syndrome, would mean that it would be difficult to see the glottis. As the larynx is anterior, a little anterior pressure may be required to visualize the glottis. A cricoid pressure must be gentle and light because otherwise you squash the trachea and you will not be able to intubate. It is helpful to angulate the tube to the anteriorly placed trachea and you could make a J-shaped curve to the tip of the tube, which can be provided by a stillet. Now, if the baby has a cleft, the tendency for your scope is to slip into the cleft. So use a gauze roll or a blade with a higher flange in a child with a cleft. Try the paraglossal approach if you're familiar with that. If the child has a prominent premaxilla, be aware that you crack that premaxilla and there's an end artery there and you will lose tissue in the long run. Now, there is difficulty even after you view the cords. You may be able to see the cords, but the space in the mouth is limited. So consider a two-person intubation as is demonstrated here. One person does the scopy and helps with the uh, positioning of the trachea and the other person will intubate. Have a rough idea of the depth you need to insert the tube before you intubate. Beware of inserting the blade too deep. If the tube hitches on the arytenoids, gently withdraw and rotate to right or left and try insertion again. Choose a laryngoscopy blade you are familiar with, one that helps provide space and light to view the glottis while moving the tongue out of the way. If there is difficulty in lifting and controlling the epiglottis with the blade anterior to the epiglottis, you just put the blade posteriorly and lift the epiglottis directly with the blade. The only problem would come if your patient is under light spontaneous ventilation, then a laryngospasm could occur. 
but under muscle relaxant and deep anesthesia, lifting the epiglottis will not give you any trouble. If bradycardia occurs, ventilate adequately before re-attempting intubation. Consider pre-treatment with atropine. If you're using a neurovascular blockade or sedation, consider a nasogastric or orogastric tube if excessive gastric distension was created by bag mask ventilation. Now the complications are dislodgement, obstruction, tension pneumothorax, equipment failure. You must keep reassessing frequently to make sure the tube is in the right place. Remember that tubes migrate with head movement. Secure the tube well. Immobilize the head in neutral position and never let go of the tube until it is secured. A little movement is required to inadvertently extubate the pediatric patient. And while you're holding on tight, don't forget to ventilate. Now consider this baby. He's all ready for a cleft palate repair. A tube that has been used is an RAE oral tube. It is a tube which has been designed for the West. So the, it's a pre-configured tube and the length of the tube from the tip to where it sits on the um, gum is a standard length. Now, you'll find that this tube was a bit too long for the child, though the size seems all right for his trachea. So the anesthetist has put a rolled up gauze there and has fixed it properly. Now, his head, though it's in a head ring, the surgeon tends to keep extending the head. And what would happen? The tube could slip out. Or if the surgeon has got a gag in, and he's removing the gag or readjusting the gag, the tube can come out. Do you think you can reintubate the patient in this position? I don't think so. I don't think you'll be able to see the glottis in this position. So always have a pillow ready to put it again and under the child's head and bring the child to the position he was in when you intubated. A roll under the shoulder should also be kept ready and available. If you're planning to use a specialized tube, like an RAE or a flexometallic tube, ensure that you have a regular endotracheal tube with a stillet available in case intubation proves difficult. If you think there's going to be airway obstruction, ask the surgeon to put in a tongue stitch or place a nasopharyngeal airway. Always know your equipment and drugs, your basic equipment as well as your advanced equipment. But do not use equipment you're unfamiliar with, especially on a difficult airway. Practice on a regular patient. Now, you may have another problem when you use a video scope. Now, this is just a true scope I've taken as an example. Usually, uh, the focal length is from the tip of the blade to a mark on the blade. Now this mark should be near the teeth or the gums while the tip sits at the glottis and that is a standard um, length for a particular age. But if you have this baby come in, you know that there is no uh, gum there and you will not be able to place this uh, line at the gum. So choose a smaller scope. Always think laterally, think ahead. LMAs tend to malposition in infants and toddlers due to a small glottis and large mouth and tongue because they tend to rotate. Therefore, I tend to use an eye gel which has a broader stem or I intubate the babies. Now to summarize, prepare the patient, ensure the fasting guidelines, Secure IV awake in anticipated difficult intubation. It is your lifeline. If multiple attempts at intubation have been done, use steroids. If you're planning a nasal intubation, use nasal vasoconstrictors early. Antisialagogues are required in certain situations. 
and topical lignocaine is useful. Always have an assistant. Explain to the assistant the positioning, how to assist in a procedure, and monitor vital signs. It is important, I keep repeating, always have an assistant, have expert help if you need, call them early. Be familiar with algorithms, help formulate a reasonable plan. And regardless of what technique you use, you must have an alternate plan. Always be ready because in the event of failure, you must know what you're going to do. So don't fail to plan for failure. Have a difficult airway cart available. Have rescue devices available, both supraglottic and infraglottic. For the infraglottic, have your surgeons on your side. Always ensure good ventilation in between your attempts at intubation so as to avoid hypoxia. Extubation can be more difficult than intubation and be ready for that. Though this is a 2011 audit from the UK, it summarizes why major complications of airway management occur. This includes poor airway assessment, poor planning, failure to plan for failure, failure to use awake fiber optic intubation or even videoscopy, repeated multiple attempts, which is failure to stop, failure to change approach, and all this can deteriorate to cannot intubate, cannot ventilate scenario. To this list, I would like to add a failure to call for help early is also an important factor. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, now I would request all the three speakers, Dr. Ram Kumar, Dr. Rakesh, and Dr. Rebecca, to come online with your videos. There are a couple of questions. Um, I'll take up the first question. Uh, first question is for Dr. Ram Kumar. Um, and question says, why 95% saturation is set as a trigger for action? And the second part of the question is, is saturation SpO2 a good marker of oxygenation? For you, sir. Right. Uh, am I heard, Dekta? Yes. Am I heard? Yes, sir. Okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, 95% saturation is taken as the cutoff uh, because uh, we know that 95% saturation is still at the flat upper portion of the oxygen dissociation curve. Obviously, 100% or 99% is taken as being really good. But when you start having seeing a drop in saturation and it reaches 95, it indicates that there is some kind of a problem with the oxygenation. And if you were to wait further, it's possible that it might drop to 92%. And 92% is the point at which rapid desaturation starts. 92% on the oxygen dissociation curve also corresponds to 60 millimeters of mercury, which is the cutoff everyone takes as the point at below which anaerobic metabolism happens. So there are two reasons for 95% being taken as the uh, trigger. One, it gives us an early warning that uh, you know, there is a process that is set in, which if unattended on time, may lead to a very rapid desaturation. And two, we don't really want our patients going into anaerobic metabolism. And if you can help it, you can take uh, you know, recourse to corrective measures before that. Uh, I don't know, uh, questions asked, I think by, the person who asked the question is happy with the answer, I'm okay, you can go on to the next question. Yeah, so I have one question for Dr. Ram Kumar. Yes, uh, Ach, yeah. Yeah. So there was an interesting article by uh, Yentis in 2002 about the uh, utility of preoperative uh, predictive tests for difficult intubation. And what he said proved statistically was most of the uh, tests had a poor uh, positive predictive value. So as a, um, a teacher with so many years of experience, what would be the advice to the trainees about how uh, which test or a combination of tests uh, should be the routine uh, for preoperative airway assessment. Yeah. So thanks, Raj, for bringing up that point. Uh, I have, Honestly, I don't have an answer to that because uh, the very fact that we are still searching for the right uh, bullet or the right uh, you know, test to identify a problem 
means that all the tests available alone or in combination do not uh, rightly predict a difficult intubation there are times when you know all the pointers of an airway assessment look normal and then something in your mind you know because of experience 25 30 so 40 years of experience in your cell in your uh, career tells you that there's something wrong with this patient i'm going to have a problem that's intuition now intuition can never be quantitated or qualitated right so i think there is no answer to that i'm sorry i don't have a definite answer it's a combination and uh, you know uh, uh, an over and above that i think it's also your past experience that comes in you might have dealt with this kind of a combination before and you might have certain uh, you know tricks up your sleeve to overcome that so i think uh, a number of tests give you an idea intuition plays a, an important role and then overall experience comes in so i have no answer raj no um, answer which which test to go for yeah thank you sir i have a question for uh, dr rebecca the question says can we use curved blades for neonate or is it mandatory to use only straight blade by and the question is by dr murthu kumar so ma'am it's between macintosh and miller which one is your preference and why there is no hard and fast rule as to which blade to use use what you are most comfortable with a straight blade would be fine in some cases and especially if you are using the paraglottic approach the straight blade is useful but if you are familiar with a curved blade remember curved blade gives you more space in the mouth so if you are happy with that go ahead and use it if you need to pick up the epiglottis do so once you are under muscle relaxant do so but um, there is no hard and fast rule stick to what you are familiar with and what you are comfortable with uh can i just answer another question that has come up which keeps coming up all the time about use use of cuffed tubes in children show sure, ma'am please re- remember that not all cuffed tubes are designed properly most of the pediatric cuffed tubes the portion of the tube beyond the cuff is quite long and there can be endobronchial intubation and the pressure the cuff itself is a high pressure cuff i use uncuffed tubes most of the time but if i am going to do a laparoscopy a thoracoscopy or send the child to the icu i would use a low pressure high volume cuff with a small part of the tube beyond it always monitor the pressures in the cuff and keep doing continuous monitoring thank you the next question is to dr rakesh Uh, how do you decide on extubation in a neuro patient where uh, you find it difficult to assess the gcs after anesthesia as i told you whenever we are not sure about uh, extubation uh, timing uh, and you are not really sure about whether you have been able to optimize the optimizable factors it is best to defer it till we can because uh, we all know that uh, the intubation cutoffs are about 7 to 8 gcs so if you are not sure about the gcs we will wait till the gcs actually reaches that value wherein it is safe to extubate so my uh, answer will be to defer uh, extubation in those patients where i can't assess the gcs uh, and uh, Uh, neurosurgical patients because i think that was the question so my uh, very simple answer would be that whenever i feel it will be safe for the patient and he or she will be able to uh, uh, nicely hold his or her airway and also prevent uh, secretion from going in so till i am sure that the patient has reached the gcs uh, cut off gcs i'll keep the patient intubated thank you sir i have one more question for you um, uh, like both uh, uh, das and difficult air already difficult air we talk about remi fenil extubation and you have mentioned uh, the bailey's maneuver as an alternative but is there a role for dexmedetomidine as an alternative to remi fenil uh, uh, for extubation of high risk patient thank you all for uh, that question Uh, personally i don't have uh, personal experience with dexmed uh, to be used in place of remifentanil seems to be promising maybe you have uh, tried it i haven't so uh, but uh, much before uh, 
relevant material uh, thing was even written about we had started using the bailey and uh, we found that was very effective and uh, as good as uh, as the ramifentanil is uh, claimed to be so keeping that in mind we started doing this and uh, we could extubate the ex take out the tube with the patient in a deep plane of anesthesia so so could prevent the hemodynamic part of it and at the same time we had the added benefit of uh, peeping inside the the airway and look at the uh, the the periglottic area the glottis and even the for trichomalacia in fact uh, a lot of people say that they have never seen trichomalacia and i you know it is only in the last 3 years of my 42 years that i saw two cases in which one of them uh, we we caught it later on but uh, le- the second one we were able to find out very beautifully uh, i do actually have a video of that also where in the, the the right wall was collapsing over the left wall as but for that the patient has to be breathing spontaneously you can't diagnose trichomalacia with the patient still being ventilated so uh, we got added benefit but expert yes maybe it has some role uh, but uh, if you okay. Uh, i have a question for uh, dr rebecca ma'am a question comes up is paraglossal approach how do you do it at the same time there is another talking about rapid sequence intubation in children what you uh first the paraglossal approach is like you would use a rigid bronchoscope you go laterally and you go diagonally so from the outer aspect of the mouth you go towards the glottis so that you avoid this we use in clefts and uh, so we make sure that we are going to avoid the cleft and go across that is the uh, we will do a paraglossal approach rapid sequence intubation in pediatrics we don't do rapid sequence like we would do in adults we do not advise the cricoid pressure because in these little babies the cricoid is very um flop uh, i would say very soft uh, and the trachea would get squashed or deviated so you pre oxygenate you would use a regular endotracheal tube and i would use a stillet in that regular endotracheal tube because in this case i don't want to fail i don't want to have to ventilate does that answer the question yeah there is uh, one more question uh, is there a role of apneic oxygenation in difficult airway um any of you can take that question i i didn't get the question your mask yeah. sorry is there a role of apneic oxygenation in difficult airways i think it has okay it has i mean okay rakesh please go ahead but i started i think it has it has role in all kinds of uh, airway management for for us you know uh, it has become a regulation that all my post graduates have a binasal cannula launched and over that they do the pre oxygenation and as soon as they pick off their mask the oxygen at 10 liters which dr ram nicely elaborated on is on whatever the highest amount of auxiliary flow is available 10 or 15 some machines have 10 some have 15 that is my way of looking at it and we call it para oxygenation or uh, i think dr ram kumar used a continuous oxygenation so uh, how are we you describe um, uh, even a simple thing like nasal cannula and 10 or 15 liters is good enough and as long as you maintain a patient upper airway it can do wonders absolutely i think i think in interest uh, of time we will uh, can i just say one last comment yeah sure uh, most uh, modern anesthesia workstations have an auxiliary oxygen flow meter and this can be used for that purpose you know you can use your uh, main flow meters for the breathing circuit that you're going to use and the auxiliary oxygen supply can be used for uh, the uh, additional oxygenation to nasal prongs um, so there are four to five more questions i think we have to answer them online maybe you can just I have answer them on them ekta online yeah. i have already yeah. answered one online yeah, yeah. the chat can be saved my answer is there and in this <laughs> sure. time i will stop talking yeah, yeah. thank you very so much thank, thank you. you so much sir thank you dr rebecca ramkumar Thank you Thanks. nice see Thank you Thanks everyone again okay Thank you sir Bye. Thank Bye. you ma'am Yeah
over to you elizabeth thank you very much raj ekta ram kumar sir dr akesh and rebecca ma'am for the very interesting sessions and the active discussions we shall now move on to the next uh, session the chairpersons for the session are dr jacob john who is a graduate from trivandrum medical college and a postgraduate from cotem he has done his fellowship from the royal college of anesthesiology at dublin he is a senior consultant and group coordinator in anesthesiology at kims healthcare trivandrum he is a very cool and collected anesthetist and has always been a very beloved senior to me his areas of interest are difficult airway and ultrasound guided nerve blocks he is a speaker at various national and international conferences Dr Jaya Susan Jacob is a graduate from Trivandrum Medical College and did her post graduation from CMC Vello where she was the best outgoing post graduate she won the Valerie Gold major gold medal she is a senior consultant anesthesiologist and very much uh, at VPS Lake Show Global Life Care Kochi she is a very respected and uh, sought after anesthesiologist by her colleagues as well as the surgeons in Lake Show Hospital over to you jaya and jacob thank you thank you elizabeth for the introduction the first talk for this session is high flow nasal oxygen in covid a global perspective uh, it's the talk is given by dr rageesh gar who is an additional professor at all india institute of medical sciences new delhi he is an associate editor of the journal of anesthesiology and clinical pharmacology and the indian journal of anesthesia He has over 260 publications to his credit, and is a prolific speaker at various national and international conferences. Over to you, Dr. Rakesh. Namaskar. Today we'll be talking about a very important topic of high flow nasal oxygen in COVID-19. I bring greetings from my institute, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, wherein work uh, I work at uh, Institute Rotary Cancer Hospital of uh, this prestigious institute. Now, COVID nineteen has brought many insights into the management of uh, this pandemic of COVID nineteen. Though the conventional oxygen therapy was primarily restricted to the oxygen delivery devices, the non-invasive ventilation, the invasive ventilation. Uh, with uh, with uh, tracheal intubation, but the understanding of COVID nineteen has given many new technology tools, techniques, and thought as how we can bring the outcome in a positive way in patients who are suffering from COVID nineteen and require oxygen therapy. When we talk of COVID nineteen, the clinical symptomatology is not just restricted to the lungs; it is to the other organs also. but primarily concerns would be the involvement of uh, respiratory system the lung pathology leading to hypoxemia and requiring uh, the oxygen supplementation and other other respiratory support system but the deterioration in the lung functions is not as similar to the other respiratory dysfunction which we have normally thought of conventionally in covid 19 it is a, a thrombotic phenomena uh, which is leading to the uh, the the ventilation perfusion mismatch leading to respiratory dysfunction in addition to the infection leading to consolidation of the lungs and hence the management is not similar as the conventional oxygen therapy and that is why we need to took a look for something new new technology which which uh, uh, can deliver oxygen in patients with having some respiratory dysfunction due to covid 19 the conventional oxygen therapy was starting from oxygen therapy using uh, various devices then shifting them to an iv if not controlled and then to mechanical ventilation requiring uh, for those patients who are not maintaining oxygenation on an iv but this uh, use of newer tool of uh, high flow nasal oxygen has found its role in covid 19 uh, because of its beneficial effect and if you see the summary of recommendation for managing these patients who are hypoxic the hfnc is one of the important tool for maintaining oxygenation prior to the mechanical ventilatory support and the time of initiation for oxygen therapy uh, would depend upon the stage of uh, infection once the viremia is is uh, on the peak and then settling down the inflammatory response is starting 
this is the time when the pulmonary phase is involving and the patient have some respiratory dysfunction wherein you need to start the oxygen therapy. And the timing of this oxygen therapy is important because once the hypoxic episode starts, it further exaggerates the inflammatory response and the outcome. And that's why uh, the oxygen therapy should be started timely so that the hypoxic injury is not happening. Now, this is the conventional uh, use of various available conventional oxygen delivery devices, mm -hmm. depending upon how much uh, uh, oxygen and FI is required by the patient for maintaining the target oxygenation. But in case uh, if uh, these are not being managed with these conventional devices, the tracheal intubation or an NIV is one of, uh, one of the conventional options. But in COVID, it is always a big issue of uh, various concerns, you know, including the aerosol generation and uh, the infection to healthcare worker. And that is why the HFNC is one of the bridge that has been used for these patients. The advantages are many for using this technique because uh, this heated humidification of inhaled gases, it wash out the upper airways, it has high nasal inspiratory flow. It also has positive airway pressures and it decreases the entrainment of ambient air leading to increase of IO2. And all those benefits lead to the improved clinical outcomes, which has been very well seen in COVID-19 patients. And to start with uh, the, the HFNC, when we take on uh, the use of HFNC for COVID-19, there was some dilemma. Many of the effects has come up uh, with the evidence and they, they are being uh, the used uh, in, in present management scenario. If you see the initial era of uh, somewhere in uh, February, March 2020, there was a concern that whether this needs to be used or not because uh, they were not very sure. There were concerns of aerosolization. And subsequently, people have uh, other uh, views also, and they were just looking for whether high flow nasal oxygen is a safe, efficient treatment for COVID patients or not in an ICU. This means they were thinking of, but not for patients who are critically ill where mechanical ventilation was a, was a concern. And the reasons were that it's an aerosol formation. The equipment was not available. Intensivists were not using it. It was primarily the anesthesiologists which were using them. And the severe respiratory stress, the it was one of the indications for mechanical ventilation. But subsequent understanding and published literature, the availability of good quality PPE, negative pressure rooms, and uh, the invasive ventilation had a poorer outcome. The pathophysiology of COVID-19 on respiratory dysfunctions was elucidated, and that is why the HFNO has come into picture and it has better acceptability now. We have uh, good quality PP. The understanding has become much better. We have understand that the, how the aerosol spreads and it can be taken care of. And it has also been found that the high flow nasal cannula for COVID-19 patients, there is no risk of bioaerosol dispersion. So such type of uh, studies which has come up has given a reassurance that even this therapy will not increase the chances of a healthcare worker who are well equipped with the PP. Now they have they have uh, just summarized that the biosol, bio aerosol dispersion via high flow nasal cannula shows a similar risk to standard oxygen mask and high flow nasal mask with a surgical mask on patient uh, face might be benefiting this patient and that's why it has come into picture. Now this is another interesting study which uh, reassures that this is one of the important aspects. This is a retrospective observational study and they have used HFNC uh, to look for the response. They have found that the uh, patients uh, with certain parameters have shown a good response of HFNC uh, and they have identified few parameters, which was the primary the ROX index, which they elucidated as an indicator for the success or the failure of HFNC. But they found that the high flow therapy is useful in patients with COVID-19 and it has decreased the mortality and the ROX index below 4.94 predicts the need for intubation. And that's how they have come up with the ROX ratio, which has been found to be a good indicator for looking for the success or the failure of HFNC vis-a-vis -vis the mechanical ventilation. And that is why it has come into the algorithm in subsequent communications also, wherein uh, when a patient comes with respiratory dysfunction, uh, HFNC trial can be given, look for the response. If patient maintains saturation of HFNC, this can be continued. And, and other uh, patients who are not responding to them, they may require other type of respiratory support. And uh, it, they also reported that the outcome parameters uh, in patients who are requiring HFNC, uh, there, there were a significant improvement in multiple respiratory parameters of uh, those who are requiring uh, HFNC in patients suffering from COVID-19. And hence, it was very reassuring from this uh, 
this study that HFNC could be one of the important tools for patients suffering from HFNC, not only for mild, but also for moderate and even severe category. But the limitation why some of the patients had a failure in the earlier studies was that the management of COVID, we have to use other modalities like conscious proning or pharmacological agents which improve the lung functions, decrease the chances of infection, antiviral therapy. So these agents were also required. So the overall perception was it does not be oxygen therapy, but a multimodal approach. So if you want to improve the oxygenation, it is just not the HFNC or oxygen therapy or mechanical ventilation, but we have to use multimodal pharmacological and non-pharmacological modalities. You optimize the patient using vasopressors, antibiotic fluids, have a good chest physiotherapy, and simultaneously think of prone positioning, which has been found very useful. So HFNC with proning as has an improvement in the outcome, and it has been very well proven in this study that those patients who are prone, uh, their, their saturation improve, uh, improvement was very seen. The PO2 improved very nicely. PSU2 also came down. So this means it's a combination that can improve the patients further on. This is, uh, this is further proved in another study where they found that prone positioning combined with high flow or conventional oxygen therapy in secret, uh, COVID-19 patients, and there was a significant improvement. Now, even then, uh, the, the, the additional things like uh, covering it with surgical mask on the top of high flow nasal cannula further improves the oxygenation in a critical ill. And this is uh, another important issue because it will obviously decrease the aerosol and hence the decrease of the infection, which is well proven in this case wherein when the HFNC with surgical mask, there was further improvement in the PO2, the saturation improved, the PA-FA ratio also improved much better, and the PSU2 was more of a more or less uh, similar but acceptable. So this is how uh, they have found that even uh, uh, when they continued HFNC after test with the removal of surgical mask, there was in deterioration. So this confirmed that covering with surgical mask on the top of high flow nasal cannula improves oxygenation. Wearing of medical mask over high flow improves. This was shown in another study also, and which is uh, well confirmed. Now, uh, with regards to the dispersion of the aerosol, this is very well uh, confirmed from this study that if you use a affinity and cover the medical mask, the chances of aerosol formation is much more reduced and hence the risk of infection to healthcare worker is, is much lesser. So we can go ahead and use HF HFNO for, for these patients. Uh, this is a very important uh, uh, article which has surprised so many things. The advantages of HFNC is more reliable oxygen therapy in COVID-19. It is very comfortable and well tolerated when people believe that 60 meters may not be comfortable for patients, but this study has proven it that it is comfortable to patients. It can have various physiological changes. It reduces the dead space, increase the and expiratory lung volumes, and this beneficial physiological effect of HFNC has been found to recruit the lung the positive pressures delivered uh, during the by the HFNC makes the lung more ventilated, and the efficiency of breathing and improving the end expiratory lung fall volume forms the basis of the beneficial effect of HFNC. It improves the compliance of the lung, the work of breathing in patients with respiratory failure, and hence the outcome of patients would increase with the clinical use of HFNC in hypoxic respiratory failure with with. Uh, improve in the overall outcome with decreased mortality and morbidity. Concerns with HFNC related to the aerosolization or the tracheal intubation and mechanical ventilation need or excessive respiratory drive leading to more uh, self-sustained lung injury in the patient is, is not of a concern now and it has been proven. The high flow nasal cannula for acute hypoxic respiratory failure in patients with COVID-19, the uh, systematic reviews has been done and it has been well proven even in a last uh, review of 12 studies, including around 2,000 patients, and they have confirmed that the HFNC has a better outcome profile as come to patients who are not receiving HFNC. So that is HFNC becomes one of the important tool in, uh, in management of patients with COVID-19 mm -hmm. by reducing the need for invasive ventilations as compared to the conventional oxygen therapy. The high flow nasal oxygen therapy, how to initiate, it has various components, a flow meter, cannula, a heated uh, equipment for delivery of the humidified oxygen. The healthcare worker should be wearing a good amount of uh, appropriate PPE and the patient face can be covered with a uh, mask for it. The settings can be from one 
uh, from up to 60 liters per minute with FI up to 100 percent. So it needs to be titrated as per the target oxygen saturation, which may be around say 90 to 90 to 92 percent, depending upon whether the patient has previously underlying COPD or non-COPD. And the target should not be 9900 percent. A 94, 95 percent is acceptable for these patients. You need to monitor these patients for baseline status and ensure the patient is always on continuous pulse oximetry and try to titrate the oxygen flow and FiO2 accordingly. Also take care of the patients uh, who are at high risk like older age and comorbidities because in these the patients may be having more disease severity. So always think of optimization of the other parts also. And when to change the strategy, HFNC, it requires uh, interdisciplinary monitoring. If the work of breathing is increasing, saturation is not being maintained despite the full HFNC, this is the time you should think of other modalities. And for this reason, various professional bodies had suggested, recommended the use of high flow nasal oxygen therapy for patients with COVID-19. So to summarize, uh, COVID-19 is a novel disease. We know little about the respiratory physiology. We are learning more, but the evidence is being generated for oxygen therapy in COVID-19 patients. And the HFNC uh, has been found to be a very important tool, but we need to keep ourselves updated uh, so that we can use it more effectively so as to have good patients' outcome. So this is what uh, we have learned about the HFNC now. And uh, together, we will be able to manage the patient's saturation much better and win over the COVID-19. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. I am privileged to introduce to you an airway expert of national and international repute, Professor Sheila Nainan Maitra, senior faculty in the Department of Anesthesia, Critical Care and Pain, Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. She has many feathers in her cap. She is the president of the AIDAA, one of the chief architects of the AIDAA guidelines. She is also vice chancellor of the Indian College of Critical Care Medicine. She has been appointed the Chair of Intensive and Critical Care uh, Medicine Committee of the World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiology. And more importantly, she is one among the 14 international experts working on ASA Difficult Airway Guidelines and the Puma Guidelines, which is the topic of discussion today. She is on the editorial board of the in, interna, uh, in, uh, critical, may, many journals, including Anesthesia, Journal of Critical Care, Trends in Anesthesia and Critical Care Medicine and Airway. Over to you, Professor Sheila. Hello friends, greetings from Tata Memorial Hospital and the All India Difficulty Area Association. At the outset, I'd like to thank uh, the organizing committee of CAMCON 2021, especially Dr. Elizabeth Joseph, Dr. Sam Phillip and Dr. Sajayan uh, for inviting me. It's always a pleasure and a great honor to speak at CAMCON. I will be speaking about Universal Airway Management Guideline and that is the Puma Guideline. And what does PUMA stand for? It's the project for the universal management of the uh, airways. I'm sure most of you have heard of it at several meetings. Uh, unfortunately, this guideline was to pub be published in September 2020, but the publication has been delayed to February 2021. So what I'm going to do over the next 20 minutes is to give you an overview of what the PUMA uh, Universal Airway Management Guideline is all about. So in this talk, I'm going to speak about the concept of Puma, what is the rationale, the logistics, the methods, the format that we use, the, a little about the content, and also some details of the publication of the Puma guidelines. Now, this is the Puma team, and we are a group of 14 members. And uh, this is Dr. Karen Hagberg. She's from the United States, and she is the chair of the guideline committee. And we have Dr. Nicholas Crimes, uh, who is from Australia, 
and he is the project lead of the Premier Guidelines. And as you can see, we are a mem uh, many familiar faces, uh, and many of you might know these people. They are all uh, experts and authorities in the field of airway management, and most of them have been involved with guideline uh, development in airway management. So it's a working group of 14 members, and in this 14-member group, we have 11 anesthesiologists, three of whom are intensivists, and we also have three uh, emergency physicians. Now, you may have all seen this review that was recently published in Anesthesia, Difficult Airway Management Algorithms, a directed review. And this is a very interesting uh, review that was published because this looks at all the published airway management uh, guidelines over time. And what you see, the bars in blue are the new um, airway management guidelines that come over time. And uh, the orange bars are the cumulative number of guidelines over time. And these are the different specialities Mm, uh, in subspecialities uh, for which the airway management guidelines have been uh, developed. And as you can see, a majority of them have been adult airway management guidelines. So interestingly, we have 38 published airway management algorithms in the large, last 20 years. And that's really a big number. Now, when you have a victim of cardiac arrest and you're giving CPR, you know, by and large, we follow the same sequence and the same steps of course, there are regional variations and there are, uh, you know, area specific guidelines. But by and large, we do the same uh, things. We give CPR in the same way. We just give chest compression in the same way. The drugs we use are the same. And this is all possible because organizations like the ILCO work together with different uh, societies that form cardiac arrest uh, guidelines. We also have uh, the Indian guidelines for uh, CPR and they liaise with them and make sure that there is a uniform uh, kind of way in which we deal with cardiac arrest. Now, if you take the same analogy of cardiac arrest uh, to airway management, that is exactly what Puma is trying to do. If you look at the airway management algorithm, now look at the different algorithms across the globe. We have so many algorithms and we don't have a single unifying document uh, that is accepted and endorsed uh, universally across the globe, and that applies to all contexts. Different, different guidelines followed by different uh, society. And this is what Puma is trying to do. It's trying to uh, use the application of the principles of cardiac arrest, training and clinical practice into airway management. So like we have a universal algorithm for the management of cardiac arrest, we are looking at a universal uh, you know, algorithm for uh, airway management principles for uh, the management of difficult airway across different boundaries. So is it that there are 100 algorithms and Puma project is trying to create the 101st algorithm? No, this is not the case. In fact, it is not a difficult airway guideline at all. So what it is, is a unifying document. So what we've done is that we've taken all the guidelines on airway management from across the globe. We have looked at the commonalities in these guidelines. We've looked at the important useful points in these guidelines, and we've tried to put them together and make a unifying document. So it's universal. It's not another difficult airway guidelines. And it talks about difficult airway. We're dealing with difficult airway principle. And most importantly, it's independent of uh, context. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world, who the provider is, what is the location, what is the patient that you're dealing with, what is the indication for airway management, what is the urgency of the situation, or even the complexity of airway management, or even the type of airway. Uh, it's going to be something that will, a universal principle that will apply to all these contexts. Now, what is the rationale? for having this kind of guideline. Now, I'll just give you an example. And this is myself in the intensive care unit. I come from a background of anesthesia. So I do airway management in the operating room, but 80% of the time I do airway management in the ICU. So I'm in a unique position to compare airway management in the two areas. And I can tell you, unlike when I'm in the operating room with a very stable patient who's come fasted and has been optimized for surgery, that airway management is completely different from this kind of situation. When I'm in the intensive care unit, uh, look at the clutter around the uh, ICU bed. Uh, you know, even getting to the head end is quite a struggle. There's my ultrasound machine, my ventilator, my crash cart. This is a patient of septic shock. Uh, this patient not only needs airway support, but also needs hemodynamic support. I have very less help. There's just a male nurse there to help me because my resident is uh, resuscitating another patient. 
and this is a patient who i have to uh, you know work with uh, if if this is an a journey of mine there are various levels of skills not all are anesthesiologists so a very complex environment do i securing uh, the airway in the intensive care unit various levels of airway management uh, skills and most importantly uh, not only uh, anatomical difficulty airway but also physiologically difficult airway is what are the concerns in the uh, icu now if i had to apply the same airway management guidelines that i use in the operating room to this patient it doesn't take into account the various physiological considerations we talk mostly about anatomical airway we talk about waking up the patient now waking up the patient is okay in the uh, operating room you can postpone the case you can do it another day when you're better prepared this is not an option in the intensive care unit you have to give this patient a definitive airway so the rationale for having this kind of a unifying document with common principles is so that irrespective of what the context is and where you're working and what the type of patients is you are using uniform principles for airway management so just to give you an example if i had an adult patient who's pregnant and also a trauma victim and critically ill then which algorithm am i going to use because we have different guidelines for each of these settings so it's important to have a unifying document and if you see most of the guidelines that we have are all developed by anesthesiologists and they're developed for anesthesiologists working in different uh, operating room set, uh, settings with different types of Uh, patients but you know today that it's not only anesthesiologists there are intensivists emergency physicians paramedics airway assistants all of them deal with airway management and many of these uh, these uh, physicians don't have uh, their own airway management mm, guidelines and few of them do have some guidelines but majority are from the anesthesiologists so just imagine a situation where if all these clinicians where were say in an emergency department uh, came together to help to secure the airway uh, of a patient who had a difficult airway then which algorithm would you use right so it's important to have a unifying document or principles that would apply and help all these individuals from different specialties another very important thing is most of the algorithms that we have are very intubation centric they start with you know attempt an intubation and cannot intubate but we know today that it's not intubation which is important but is being able to ventilate the patient and oxygenate the patient that is even more important and we know this can be done by different devices like a face mask a supraglottic airway device and an endotracheal tube and we know today that all anesthetics we don't put a tube some start with a supraglottic airway device so what if you fail with a supraglottic airway device you know and you've not put in a tube at all so then what do you do most of these algorithms start with a failed intubation and this is why you need a universal algorithm which deals with whatever kind of uh, you know technique that you're using for anesthesia uh, when it fails what are the common principles that you can use uh, across the globe for different settings and also the transition into moving into doing uh, airway rescue is extremely important and this is what puma addresses in uh, detail now you all heard about the ml in bromley case and this is a case that has been uh, discussed a lot uh, and this was a very um, unfortunate uh, case of um, a female in which whom they tried to secure the airway they were not able to intubate this patient the supraglottic airway device that they put in as a rescue did not work and there was a lot of cognitive overload there's a lot of fixation errors a lot of things went wrong and they didn't transition into doing a cricothyrotomy uh, uh you know in in this crisis situation and uh you know they were obsessed with just trying to secure the airway in some way and even 15 years after this case uh when you look at the airway management guidelines none of these uh guidelines today are able to address the very situation that occurred in the Ellen Bromley case so cognitive efficiency and human factors are extremely important when we develop airway management guidelines because we know today that it is not only the technical skills but the non technical skills that we use during airway management can make a difference to the outcome of the patients and uh, puma has given a lot of emphasis to this in their uh, guidelines then we have countries without guidelines so are we going to wait for each and every country to have uh, their own guidelines no 
in other in uh, uh, another thing that's very important is we have different guidelines but they're always uh, they refer to, refer to different contexts for example we have obstetric guidelines different guidelines for emergency intensive care pediatric pre hospital now these are fantastic guidelines i like them very much but they are very context specific and what puma is trying to do is to have a single unifying document taking the commonalities between all these guidelines and giving uniform principles by which the airway can be managed irrespective of the context irrespective of the patient irrespective of which part of the globe uh, you are working in and what you're setting in is and that is what puma is trying to do make this kind of uniform principle for airway management so this gets rid of the uh, doing away with the siloing of ideas and also the divergent practices that exist in uh, airway management so essentially what we're going to do is have universal principles for managing airway and in addition this is also a platform for collaboration among different individuals and societies across the globe where we speak one language coming to multiple terminologies now you can see that in different guidelines we have used different different terminologies and as you know critical language is very important and what is critical language critical language is the language that we use uh, for in the context of airway management whenever there's a crisis it's it's a term term different terms that we use to express a sense of emergency and different action point terms and there's this very nice uh editorial that's written by Nicholas Crimes uh, on critical airway critical language and quite recently we wrote another editorial critical language during airway management time to rethink uh terminology so critical language is extremely important and what is very important about critical language is that you need terms that are simple are unambiguous we uh, you know are universally understood and also convey a sense of emergency now what puma has tried to do is that puma uh, you know has looked at all the guidelines and our idea was not to replace any of the terminology we used whatever was uh, you know dominant legacy terms that was in the guidelines however wherever we felt that there was any terminology uh, that interfered uh, with you know patient safety or we felt there was a disconnect between what was the dominant term in the literature and what was commonly used in practice there we tried uh to you know make new uh terminology because you know we didn't you have the methodology uh in puma to uh, you know use um uh, make new critical language because this was not the objective of puma and you need a completely different methodology to address the critical language that should be used in uh, airway management so if you look at the critical language uh that is dominant in the literature it cannot intubate cannot oxygenate that is kaiko and um front of neck access that is fona and uh if you look at what is most uh commonly used in clinical practice it is emergency cricothyrotomy so there's a clear disconnect between what is dominant in the literature and what is commonly used in uh clinical practice in addition to this puma has tried to do away with acronyms uh because uh, we don't want to use terms like uh kaikofona which is not universally understood and not universally used and cannot intubate we know today intubation is not the only way of ventilating or oxygenating a patient and in addition cannot oxygenate is not very uh you know uh, there's a lot of ambiguity in what oxygenation means especially in the era of um, apneic oxygenation because we know that we can continue to oxygenate a patient for longer periods of time however uh you know airway rescue has to begin at a time when you cannot ventilate the patient so in view of this i can tell you that we have done away with terms like kaiko and um fona and uh, we wanted to use rather than acronyms we wanted to use clear unambiguous terms that do not that convey the sense of uh, emergency and uh this is the reason why and i can tell you uh that we have used a new terminology in the puma guidelines which has replaced fona and this will be the neck rescue what about the methods that were followed by uh, puma and again coming back this is a guideline committee as i mentioned earlier the 14 member working group of anesthesiologists three intensivists and emergency physicians the method we followed is and we have been working on this guideline for the last 4 years let me tell you four long years and in, in, in addition to this because of the delay uh, in publication this will go on to february 2021 and uh, we have experts which are across four different uh, continents and we meet at different uh, you know time zones 
uh, and all through video conference every alternate sunday saturday we have a meeting and i can tell you that my timing uh, in india is 2:30 am so we have two hour meetings every alternate sun saturday for the last 4 years so that's the amount of hard work that's gone in and this is just to maintain the time uh, you know differences between united states and uh, you know australia and the uk so it's been extremely challenging especially for me but i can tell you this has been a fantastic learning uh, experience you know interacting with all these experts brainstorming uh, while developing these uh, guidelines so a lot of hard work has gone into it this is not just a cut copy paste job we did extensive guideline review we took all the available evergreen guidelines we looked at the commonalities in these guidelines in addition to an extensive literature review was done uh in all the areas where we made uh, statements and this was reviewed by several experts in the puma uh, group and uh, following this we made statements of common principles and uh, to approve this we had online survey among the group members and this largely used likert scale rating and in addition to this we also had free text where people could put their uh, comments now whenever there were gray areas or there were disagreements we resolved this through video conferencing in addition for the gray areas we also have uh, in addition to this uh, puma group we also have a 60 member advisory group and this is uh, stretches across 17 countries <coughs> excuse me and we put these points up to them and they uh, addressed various uh, gray areas and these got resolved uh, through the opinions from these uh, uh, experts across the world uh, so puma guidelines is not a rehash of the existing guidelines there's a lot of novel um, you know uh, uh, statements that we've made there are a lot of silent areas in every management which have not been addressed that puma has uh, made uh, statements on what about the format the content and the publication so i can tell you that the universal principles we have five documents that we are coming up with uh, one is a concept and the methodology paper that has already been published in anesthesia in addition to this one will be on airway evaluation one will be airway strategy airway rescue and the fifth one will be on communication of the outcome so this is the concept and method uh, publication uh, and this was uh, published in uh, anesthesia recently so this was a puma uh, the part 1 of the concept and method uh, paper of the puma guidelines and the other four should be published in february this will be published not only in anesthesia but it will also be published in emergency medicine and intensive care uh, medicine journals and the full guideline as i mentioned this should be sometime early in 2021 now our plan is not only to publish guidelines but also have training program and uh, uh, educational resources so we will have uh, various um, you know hopefully face to face workshops uh, meetings web based programs and we will also produce various uh, educational resources for people to use including an airway app i'd like to end by saying that uh, puma is not just another difficult airway guideline it is basically a unifying document not context specific unified approach to general airway management principles and this is important it's not just another guideline and what's really unique about puma it has universal airway principles and these are independent of the context the geography the provider the location the patient the indication even the urgency and the complexity of airway management so this is something we're really going to be looking forward to something very unique and an absolute unifying document that i'm sure all of you uh, will really appreciate now what needs to be looked at is whether having this kind of unifying approach to airway management improves outcomes really needs to be uh, evaluated so i'd like to end and this is a picture of the last picture when all the entire group met during the wam meeting in amsterdam and uh, on behalf of the entire puma group i wish to thank each and every one of you for a patient listening wherever you are uh, in the world i hope you take care and stay safe thank you very much for your attention Thank you very much, okay, and Professor Sheila, for the excellent talk.
we'll just move on to the questions. Um, there's a question from uh, Dr. Jay Dasan to Dr. Rakesh. How would you compare the effectiveness of CVAP versus HFNC in COVID patients? A very good question indeed, because uh, an intensivist, uh, when somebody uh, is managing the COVID patient, the use of CPAP or NIV is a very common phenomena. But uh, for COVID-19, it has been proven that HFNC has its role. So before somebody goes for CPAP, HFNC can be given in addition to the other adjuncts which I've already mentioned, like uh, conscious prodding and other chest physiotherapy measures. But in case if you give a trial of HFNC and patient is having increased work of breathing in spite of an HFNC trial of about 60 to 90 minutes and patient is uh, using his accessory muscles for breathing, the saturation is not being maintained, patient is getting tired, this is the time where the CPAP needs to be done. So I think uh, we cannot say head to head comparison of CPAP versus HFNC, but I will say it will be a series of sequely of events starting from conventional oxygen therapy, going to HFNC, then going to CPAP, and finally uh, going to the invasive ventilation. That should be a series, and HFNC is a very well acceptable modality uh, prior to the initiation of CPAP. Okay, thank you. Dr. Rakesh, uh, the role of HFNC in weaning of COVID patients. I think yet a very important question again, uh, uh, weaning from uh, HFNC. HFNC uh, and weaning of course. Yeah, so there could be two options here. Uh, one is when somebody is on HFNC itself, he has been on high flow, say 60 liters of FiO2 of 100%. So this is one situation. So herein, as we do for the other oxygen therapies, we simultaneously come down with flows as well as the FiO2 gradually. So for example, somebody is on 60 liters and uh, FiO2 100%, we'll try to bring it to 80% and then try to decrease the flows from 60 to 50 liters. And as we do for uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, Patients with the ARDS on mechanical ventilation, the FI and the uh, PEEP and those phenomena, same thing will be uh, analogously applicable here also. So we'll come simultaneously with FI and flows uh, continuously, and then we can shift it to uh, the patients on conventional oxygen therapy. Second situation of weaning would be where patients have gone on CPAP, an IV or patient was on mechanical ventilation. Now there is no much robust data of weaning from mechanical ventilation, invasive mechanical ventilation to HFNO, there is no much data. Uh, but it has been seen that if a patient is quite comfortable, patient is getting, getting extubated, they are usually trichistomized. And in those situations, we don't have much data, but yes, still in those patients, once the patient is trichistomized, they can be weaned off and they can be put on HFNO rather than again on mechanical ventilation if patient is deteriorating for some reason. So we should be using HFNO as a rescue measure to mechanical ventilation in any critically ill patients who are not maintaining a saturation of more than 88 to 92 percent. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh. Uh, may I add a comment to that, uh, Dr. Sure. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, just to add, uh, in the general population, not COVID, uh, both high flow and non-invasive ventilation extubation to this has been shown to be beneficial in high-risk patients. Now, in COVID, of course, we are very concerned about, you know, some people have even done delayed extubations because they're worried uh, more so about a re-intubation in these patients. And we know today, uh, you know, delayed extubation is not required. So especially in high-risk cases and those which you're kind of worried about that, you know, you're not very uh, certain about whether this extubation is going to be successful and you have concern, uh, you know, definitely extubation onto both high flow and non-invasive ventilation electively uh, in COVID patients. Uh, can be practiced and we do this in our intensive care unit and uh, now the confidence as Dr. Akesh has beautifully explained in this talk is much more because earlier we were worried about the aerosol generation but now we know that if a modality is going to help a patient avoid a re-intubation it's better to use that and keep yourself protected and wear adequate PP than to avoid that therapy and land up with a re-intubation uh, for this patient. Just wanted to add that. Thank you. Dr. Rakesh, there's a question. There's a question for Dr. Rakesh. Okay, Jay, go on. It's, uh, there's a question asking, how would you measure the carbon dioxide during HFNO? This is by Dr. Vargas Sherian. 
I think it's uh, really a pleasure to listen so many queries of HFNO because uh, it has come up as a very real rescue tool in COVID-19 patient. I, I must agree that the carbon dioxide uh, measurement is always an issue, especially when you are using high flows. So we cannot measure it. But if you see the pathophysiology of uh, the carbon dioxide exchange in patients of uh, COVID-19, it is not as same as a sepsis-induced ARDS. As I mentioned in one of my slides, the pathophysiology is almost different. So these patients are not retaining carbon dioxide so much because it's a diffusible gas. Carbon dioxide is a better diffusible gas. So the retention of carbon dioxide is not much of a great phenomenon. The reason could be the pathophysiology and the beneficial effect of the HFNO itself. When we use an HFNO, it has many additional effects, like it creates a peep, it uh, washes away the dead spaces, uh, the exchange of air is much better, and hence carbon dioxide being a better diffusible gas across the alveolar membrane, it is easily far washed off. So even for prolonged uses of uh, HFNO, and uh, whatever the parameters, if you say I quoted three studies, the PaCO2 levels were not much higher. So we do not have a modality of measuring anti-tidal carbon dioxide in this level, but in fact, it is not desirable to maintain them routinely, to monitor them, even with ABG pictures, except from a study purpose or for the patient, have some deterioration in the clinical situation. We exactly do not need to measure it in the anti-tidal carbon dioxide, but in fact, we do not have a modality to measure it, and it's not desirable, it's not required actually. So we can go ahead and use HFNO in our critically ill patients with COVID-19, with beneficial effect, nothing to worry about the retention of carbon dioxide as such, whatever the existing data is available. Thank you. Dr. Sheila, there's a question for you. Um, if we have resource rich and resource poor settings where the equipment, the airway management, the outcomes differ. So how will Puma address these issues? Yeah. Thank you very much. That's an excellent question. I've been asked this actually several times. Because across the globe, even availability of the equipment, there is variation and there's variation in clinical practice. So what Puma is giving, it's not, it's not, it's saying, for instance, that you know, prefer using a video laryngoscope. It's telling you that the outcomes of first pass success is better. It's not mandating. This is not like a legal document which says that these are the desirable things that you should follow. So what uh, Puma is trying to do is give you um, you know, principles for airway management so that you can improve outcomes. So, uh, of course, um, you know, it will result in, you know, some places they may not have uh, the tools that are described. But I can just give you an example that sometimes these kind of documents really help you. For instance, I'll just give you an example. Entitled CO2 was not used by a lot of intensivists, especially physician intensivists in uh, across India. And when we had the subgroup analysis of the NAP4 project of uh, ICU data, it actually showed uh, the high incidence and increased morbidity and mortality in patients in whom uh, capnography was not used uh, and uh, much higher compared to the operating room. And this kind of data really helped us with the critical care society to uh, you know, convince administrators uh, to make capnography available in the ICU. So I think that even in places where equipment is not available, sometimes I think it is because of lack of awareness and also administrators and hospitals, they need data to show improved outcomes when they invest in some equipment. So I think a document like Puma, which gives you, uh, you know, tells you that these are the things that you should use and these are the techniques and these are the principles that you should follow, which can help you improve outcomes in your patients. I think this is that can be very uh, useful, especially in the developing world to improve outcomes uh, from patients. But yes, it is a concern. I agree that all the things that you mentioned may not uh, be available. The one tool that we uh, were concerned about was uh, the video laryngoscopes. But looking at the availability of video laryngoscopes uh, in India and also the uh, local manufacturers and the cost having come down so much, I speak to some of my friends abroad and they say, oh, we don't have as many video laryngoscopes as you all have, even in some small district hospitals. So I think it's just a matter of, um, you know, awareness of what we should use. And of course, cost of things will come down with time. So I don't think this should really be a concern. Thank you. There's one more question along the same line, madam. What about non-English speaking societies? How would you address them? What right. is critical language? Well, yeah. though, do you have a translation for all this or will that be coming up soon? So a uh, very, very important question. And this was especially, uh, you know, a concern among the Europeans 
and uh, you know like I, i mentioned we had a lot of discussion and debate you can imagine over 5 years if we are just debating about critical language how much discussion on twitter this, there's a lot of you know brainstorming that's gone on and uh, you know they felt you know acronyms was something we definitely didn't want to use because you know the people who are publishing and writing these papers are not the actual people who are securing or dealing with difficult airway and we needed language that was extremely uh, you know simple and uh, unambiguous and it had to convey a sense of emergency if it didn't do that for example fona does not people don't understand uh, what fona is in a lot of parts of europe in china and different places so the first step of course is to publish this in english but as a second step we have uh, made a plan for having this translated in different uh, languages um and this is the uh, second step so that's a very important question because in european languages in chinese language span uh, south american language we are planning to get this uh, translated but of course the first attempt is to have it uh, done in english and this will be done subsequently and it will be very uh, it's very important and useful of course and there is one more question should individual societies stop producing separate guidelines and everyone just follow puma So this is an excellent question. Now you can imagine, as president of All India Difficult Airway Association, one would have thought there's a direct conflict for me to be part of Puma, and many of them are also, uh, you know, with their societies. So uh, as you know, um, All India Difficult Airway Association came up with the guidelines which we publish in IJ and also the Critical Care One in IJ CCM in December 2016. and now in december 2021 we are actually coming out as we promised in 5 years uh, with the revised guidelines so you know we are in the process of this and then here we have puma so again no every society needs to be uh, you know threatened by puma puma is not a replacement of guidelines as i mentioned it's not a guidelines at, at all it is a document of principles of airway management so it's telling you how to optimize oxygenation how to do this so it's not for a particular kind of pain it's not in the ot it's not it's something that everybody can use we have emergency medicine people so talking to them we realize that there are many things that you know we as anesthesiologists we are in these kind of silos you know we are not uh, uh, cross talking with people from intensive care from emergency medicine so their requirements are different so you have to have some common principles and ultimately what you're doing is airway management like i said what you're doing is chest compression what you're doing is uh you know in, in cardiac arrest has to follow a similar kind of pattern so we have made some very uh you know uh, uh, very robust principles of course entirely evidence based that can improve your outcome so i would say rather than replacing these are actually going to complement uh the regional uh, guidelines that exist so this was not the goal of puma to you know get a, uh, get rid of all the uh, guidelines and just have one guideline that everything would, would follow of course that won't be possible so it's like uh, principles and uh, unfortunately you know i would have loved to reveal the content but i'm not able to do that uh, because it's not yet published but i am sure it will be something that you know will will make you very happy when you see this and i expect this to uh, enhance the utilization of all the international guidelines of different various societies we just hope that the guidelines which come out will be available free for everybody in the world to read immediately yes it will be it will be that's the plan yeah and what's good is that not only anesthesia but we've also liaised with uh, you know uh, intensive care uh, societies i mean journal and also emergency medicine journal so it will be available uh, you know uh, across specialities and that's something we've uh, worked on a priori so i i think it will be globally available and the plan is to publish this free yes thank you one last question to dr rakesh do we need to use the same high level pp for hfno as for intubation Uh, we have to use uh, uh, the uh, level 3 pp not exactly as intubation where you use the barrier devices and other modalities while uh, doing the tracheal intubation but yes uh, you need to follow the, uh, the as uh, <coughs> suggested pps for the intensive care which includes a cover on which includes a gloves which includes a n95 mask and preferably with a gaze, uh, with a face shield or at least a goggles and a head cover should be there so this is the minimum requirement for hfnc to be used and to be on a safer side a patient can use a triple layer surgical mask over the hfnc that will prevent the contamination of the environment and the other precaution that i mentioned uh, earlier also it is just not the oxygen therapy it is a multimodal approach same precautions will be applicable for hair also the, the, the 
uh, the place where the patient is being managed, it should have uh, at least 20 air exchanges. So you need to take care of those phenomena also. Patient should not be actively coughing. Uh, in that case, you can use uh, other pharmacological agents that we are using as a part of modality of these patients' management. So, I mean, it's just not PP. We have to you know, include uh, the extended adjuncts to the PP to prevent the uh, contamination of the environment and prevention of a healthcare worker from getting contaminated. But yes, PP should be level three for that. Okay, we are over of time. We wouldn't be taking up any more questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Rakesh and Dr. Sheila. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jacob, Dr. Jaya, Dr. Sheila, and Dr. Rakesh for that excellent uh, talks and discussion. We'll now move on to the third session. This session will be chaired by Dr. Rakesh Kumar, who has already been introduced. Sir is a regular at uh, CAMCON workshop and his uh, his station is always one of the most lively and well appreciated ones at the at CAMCON. Dr. Meera Kurup is the other chairperson. She's a, a consultant pediatric anesthetist at King's College Hospital, London, UK. And she's also a regular at our CAMCON workshop. Uh, she does a lot of voluntary work in India and Africa. And I'm just waiting for COVID 19 to get over to go with her to Africa. <laughs> over to you, Dr. Rakesh and Meera. Mira, are you there? Hi. Yep, yep. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, the first speaker I would like to introduce is Dr. Mary Matthew. Uh, Dr. Ma uh, Mary Matthew and I have shared the same alma mater while we were um, studying anesthesia. And then um, she has remained a friend. Mary is now additional professor at the prestigious Regional Cancer Center, Trivandrum. Mary has accumulated prestigious awards. Uh, one of them is the International Union Against Cancer Award, otherwise called ICRAD Award for Training Oncology Intensive Care. She had also experience from other famous institutes across the globe. Her main interest is uh, anesthesia for oncology. Mary is the author and the publisher of many articles across uh, many peer-reviewed journals. Handing over to Mary. Hi, Mary. Good morning. Happy 2021. Recent advances do not only mean new machines, new instruments, or new techniques. It's also about using old things in a new way. So that is why blind nasal intubation, the forgotten art, has a role in the management of difficult airway and a place in the Advanced Airway Management Program. So let's go through everything about blind nasal intubation, the art of blind nasal intubation, how it became a forgotten art, the revival of the art, all literature concerning this art, and how we have converted it into a modern art. Now, what is blind nasal intubation? It is the technique by which an endotracheal tube is inserted through the nose into the trachea without actually viewing it. That is why it is called a blind procedure. 
how is it done it is done with the aid of listening to the breath sounds so it is an awake tracheal intubation procedure it was first done by uh, magill and robatham in 1914 during the world war when there were mass casualties and it was done as a field procedure because you didn't need any instrument and you only needed the endotracheal tube to intubate the patient so now i'm going to show a video of how it was being done So you see, uh, there is every risk of the patient transmitting a disease to the anesthesiologist because you have to bend down and hear the breath sounds carefully. before you can intubate the patient then why was this technique forgotten because the, the invention of the flexible bronchoscope by the time it was 1980s and 90s almost all educational institutions corporate hospitals and big ho- uh, centers all over the world had acquired this as a part of the difficult airway marmamentorium of the anesthesiologists so all anesthetists began were very busy trying to master this technique and the old technique got regretted so why are we thinking of reviving it today because today we are in a pandemic situation and now the intubation of patients using fiber optic bronchoscope should be avoided due to the risk of contamination due to aerosolization so what are the indications or the situations in which we can use a blind nasal intubation in an oncology setup in a cancer center we saw that elective surgery was shut down for 2 3 months and all patients have advanced in their stage of cancer they have been giving it getting chemotherapy and radiotherapy but we see a lot more trismus and larger oral cavity tumors than before these are indications for awake tracheal intubation and they should be done even tracheostomy which was an emergency procedure for difficult airway is now being done electively after intubation because of the danger of spread of aerosols in especially in covid positive patients now in the covid icu where you have patients with difficult airway and the patients are uh, desaturating but are comfortable you could secure the airway with a blind nasal intubation before putting the patient to sleep if you are not confident of securing the airway bleeding and poor visualization has always been an indication for uh, blind nasal intubation now non apneic patients needing airway support this is our area we don't think about a patient coming in the casualty with drug overdose or head injury they are still breathing but they need protection of the airway from aspiration and impending respiratory failure or arrest there you can use blind nasal intubation because advanced airway equipment may not be available in this peripheral centers and you may not have personnel to help you cardiology icus neuro icus patients with cardiac failure copd cva everywhere you could use this technique for securing the airway so we went through the literature all what is available about blind nasal 
so that we could develop a new technique or a safe technique to use during this pandemic the most useful article was this in the european journal of anesthesiology about how to teach blind nasal intubation so world over in 2013 they recognized the need to learn the art because they found that in many suburban and rural areas there was a dearth of advanced airway equipment and they made it their mission as a global outreach program to teach blind nasal intubation as a life saving technique in difficult airway situations so i am going to we took a few points from them and i am going to, to show you what how exactly they conducted this workshop uh, on mannequins because it's a difficult thing that to make a mannequin breathe because you need a patient to breathe to do uh, or practice blind nasal intubation so they use this uh, in, uh, thing called beck airway airflow monitor it's a whistle so listening to the sound of the whistle of the air going in and out they uh, taught these students uh, blind nasal intubation they also used the endotrol tube which has a wire which you can flex the tip of the endo endotracheal tube to go into the larynx but both these are not available in india so we couldn't acquire this and further literature search showed, showed that many people had made their own whistles so we decided to make our own very whistle Uh, there were also articles who used uh, where uh, anesthetists used uh, ng tubes to guide the uh, tube into the trachea and even an led source of uh, uh, led light with a flexible uh, copper wire with a battery operated switch uh, to show where the uh, tube was and to guide it into the trachea we tried these out but we didn't find it very uh, effective so we didn't uh, use this idea the capnograph guided awake nasal intubation is a good idea because uh, you can see that in when it goes in the esophagus there's a flattening and into the tube you uh, into the trachea you get a very good ca capnogram but the problem is that even in if you have a very good uh, uh, mouth fit, uh, mask fit you could get a good capnogram even with mask ventilation but it is a good idea and we did incorporate it into our uh, the method of doing it the ultrasound guided blind nasal intubation was not really very helpful because you could see the tube into the trachea or esophagus but the nasopharynx the pathway through the nasopharynx we couldn't follow it well with ultrasound guidance now this was one of the very useful techniques that we saw that is uh, if you see that the natural pathway of the endotracheal tube will come and lie between the larynx and the pharynx and the esophagus and if you want it to go into the larynx you could give burp or you could inflate the tracheal cuff so when the tracheal cuff gets inflated the tip goes into the larynx so we took a video scope picture of it see so this is where it naturally lies behind the arytenoid if you inflate the cuff instead of picking up the pathetic magus the tube tip automatically rises up to the center of the larynx so this was a very useful technique that we found and we went through the ida guidelines which told us that you have to reduce the tracheal intubation time reduce aerosol generation and prevent aerosol transmission to the uh, uh, intubating personnel so we kept that in mind uh, we also found uh, studies which showed us that blind nasal intubation takes less time than fiber optic intubation and that was very encouraging in fact uh, in, because we had to keep time in uh, mind and we also uh, had reassuring uh, studies that showed us that the cardiovascular response heart rate and bp and airway complications were not very different or in fact same as the uh, as when you do fiber optic intubation so having this uh, learned all about this in the literature so we decided to do the best we can with what we know and in case we find newer uh, better methods tomorrow we will change so we took the whistle idea we took the capnograph and we introduced the viral filter because having a viral filter between when when the patient is breathing will filter the corona virus and reduce the chance of spread of virus into the atmosphere and to the person so this is how the 
uh, they conducted the airway workshop in Rwanda. We tried it out with a lerdal uh, mannequin. Uh, you have to manually uh, press the lung and you could intubate so that the, when the toy stops, uh, you know that the tube has entered the trachea. Now, okay. He's our technician, uh, Mr. Evan, who helped me to make this whistle. You can see that we used the squeaky toy uh, whistle, uh, which is costing about 10 rupees and a 100 ml saline uh, cup, cap. And we used a viral filter in between two L connectors and blocked the uh, opening of one of the L connectors and uh, the port of ETCO2, we, put, we inserted the whistle. So uh, on assembling, this is how it looked uh, as a T piece. It's not too heavy to connect the endotracheal tube here so that the air goes out only through the whistle and makes a noise. And you can uh, have the air uh, sampled for ETCO2 and the viral filter in between. So, uh, because they're all elective uh, procedures and we are only uh, targeting anticipated difficult areas, if their patient is a uh, cancer patient, you usually have a CT scan. So, if you have an osteric software, you can see a 3D picture or you could uh, go down to the packs and they would have a virtual airway endoscopy. You could make out whether the larynx is anterior, whether there's a floppy epiglottis, whether there is subglottic stenosis. All these make our blind nasal intubation more difficult. Uh, always get a difficult airway consult, a tracheostomy consent, and an RTPCR done. Now explain the procedure to him, close the mouth, breathe rapidly, and no swallowing. Now, glycopyrrolate is given for drying up the secretion so that the local anesthetic acts better. Medazolam for angiolysis, morphine not for sedation but for cough suppression. Xylometazolin uh, drops are given into the nose so that uh, there's no bleeding when you pass the tube. Uh, calculate the sa safe dose of lignocaine, give it transnasally and tell him to open his mouth and put it into the back of his mouth. It works just as well as transtracheal, which you can't give because of aerosolization. Now, pre-oxygenation, you could do for three to five minutes. No need of supplementary oxygen during the procedure. They do not desaturate and they maintain the saturation they have preoperatively. Now, I'm going to show you a video of uh, how this uh, procedure is done. Before that, please note the following points that uh, when the, you see the video. The tube has been softened in a black, uh, bucket of hot water. So it is really soft and pliable so that it doesn't produce trauma. Two, close the other nostril. This is not seen in the video, but that is uh, that should be done is the other than the nostril that you're intubating, the other nostril should be closed with the finger and the mouth closed with a mask so that all the air moves only through the filter. Use a tent or better still an aerosol box to increase the distance between the patient and the anesthetist. Since you're not using any instrument, the, the aerosol box is quite convenient and gives you an armrest. Now, listen to the whistle sound. The moment the tube enters the trachea, the whistle sound, uh, the quality of the sound changes. It goes into almost a soprano and you can clearly make out that the tube has passed into the trachea. Now, watch the capnograph, which is there in the background of the video. The, my assistant is also showing, pointing it out that the capnograph uh, gets better when the tube goes into the trachea. Now, if you are not uh, successful with this method, the, uh, you could use burp so that the trachea goes down a bit and the tube passes through the trachea. Rotating the bevel helps a bit because if it is hitching against a vocal cord, you could turn it and pass it through the larynx. Inflating the tracheal tube cuff, the, uh, I had shown you the literature, that also helps when the trachea uh, larynx is anterior. Thank you. 
So, uh, actually, we have been uh, advised to use the video laryngoscope in in times of difficult intubation. But uh, these are the problems that I had uh, because if you have a um, a tent or some barrier between us and the patient, it's quite difficult to access the patient. And now, anyway, they've taken off the uh, requirement of putting a, a barrier for intubation. But since we are not allowed to ventilate, then again, the patient has a strong chance of desaturating if I take a second attempt. And sometimes the patient comes out of scolding and proper fall and then jumps. And then the patient coughs and moves. So there is a greater risk of aerosolization in a very difficult anticipated intubation than if you do a awake uh, tracheal intubation. So despite the myriad of uh, airway devices that we find, blind nasal intubation still remains an adjunct in the difficult airway man uh, management armamentarium. Its utility in clinical settings in urban, suburban areas and in the present pandemic cannot be overlooked. And this is a skill dependent totally on the skill of the practitioner alone. And so I feel that blind nasal intubation is like basic life support. Hope that you'll never need to practice it, but you definitely need to know it and master it as a life-saving skill. My sincere thanks to Dr. Elizabeth. Uh, it was her brainchild to make me present this uh, topic on a, in an advanced airway forum. Thank you, Dr. Sam, who's always been very encouraging uh, and uh, supportive in this presentation. And thank you all the uh, organizing committee of CAMCON for giving me this uh, opportunity to present on a web platform. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Madam, for that wonderful presentation uh, of an art which has, uh, you know, which has been forgotten, as you mentioned. But uh, you have very nicely elaborated upon many ways of making this blind nasal intubation 
less blind if we were we if i were to use the terminology because by the use of whistle um entitled co2 cuff inflation technique and so on and uh, in addition to that uh, you know some people have also added a stethoscope which can be uh, put uh, in in circuit uh, along uh, with the all the connectors that you have described and thereby uh, keep the person who is doing this procedure away from the patient's face i am sure you must have used that as well now we go on to the second topic uh, which uh, you know to some in, in in some ways related to the first one because a lot of people use uh, airway blocks while using the blind nasal intubation as well uh, to uh, to kind of supplement the whole procedure and to uh, to do that the current role of airway blocks we uh, have dr shiv kumar who who is a, who is a, who is a consultant a university hospital uh, good morning dr shiv uh, his career spans from jipmer pondicherry to aims delhi to uk and he has special interest in regional anesthesia vascular anesthesia ortho and trauma anesthesia he has um, um, he is into teaching in a big way teaching and training and uh, he is also teaching and training the frcs students he has uh, more than 40 publications and uh, chapters in the book review articles editorials and so on and he loves to use the social media in education so i am sure that he'll he'll love this platform uh, ship all yours ship do we have you yeah i'm i'm here i, I think they're going to share my video hello good morning everyone yes yes i wanted to at least have a look at you thank you for appearing on the screen <laughs> yeah hello everyone uh, i'll be today talking about current role of airway blocks uh, my name is dr shiv kumar singh i'm a consultant in anesthesia at the royal liverpool university hospitals so first question is obviously is why airway blocks why do we need to know about them all of us in our life will face patients who need anesthesia and these patients have airway compromise or trauma to the upper way unstable uh, cervical spine and in these cases we need to secure the airway awake and to secure airway awake we need to know about airway blocks okay, so that's where uh, my talks comes in so airway blocks may be required for having an awake look so this is we're talking about awake uh, video laryngoscopy or it may be required for awake fiber optic intubation which could be oral intubation or it could be nasal intubation so when we are talk about the airway blocks we talk about the innervation of the airway and if we are going to do a nasal intubation uh, the tube need to pass through the nose to the nares uh, or a pharyngeal area and then into the trachea so for the nares so area that's the that's supplied by the trigeminal nerve or a pharyngeal area supplied by glossopharyngeal nerve and the vagus supplies the trachea part of it if you are actually planning to do a oral intubation then uh, you could avoid uh, blocking the trigeminal nerve so the three nerves that or three main areas that need to be blocked is the trigeminal area, the glossopharyngeal area, and the vagus area. If you look at the trigeminal nerve, all three divisions are actually involved. So we have antirhythmodal nerves, which are branches of the ophthalmic division of trigeminal nerve, uh, sphilopanadon nerves coming from the maxillary division, and the lingual nerve, which is part of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerves. we don't uh, bother about much about the lingual nerve then we have the glossopharyngeal nerve as we talked about it and the vagus nerve uh, we have the superior laryngeal and uh, its branch the internal laryngeal and the recurrent laryngeal nerve so when we look at awake uh, video laryngoscopy or oral uh, awake fiber optic intubation 
In that case, uh, we are going through the oropharyngeal route uh, to the trachea, so we need to block the glossopharyngeal nerve and the vagus nerve. But if you're looking at the nasal uh, awake fibrotic intubation, in that case, you need to block the uh, trigeminal nerve branches and the vagus. If you want to block the oropharyngeal air area, then you can actually, but you can avoid it. It's not really necessary uh, unless you are going to have someone pull the tongue. That is actually required uh, when you are going to do a sedated or uh, patients who are mildly sedated and uh, uh, you want to do that where the tongue is falling back. So first we look at the trigeminal nerve, how we're going to block. Like I said, lingual is not important. What's important is to uh, block the antirythmoidal nerves and the palatine ganglia and the nerves. So we can actually use a cotton taped applicator uh, that is soaked in lignocaine. And uh, for ethmoidal, you need to go on the, uh, you know, uh, anteriorly, uh, through the nose, uh, almost parallel to the to the nose, uh, the opening, and uh, you apply the antithmoidal uh, and the anterior part just near the uh, you know cribriform plate. Uh, for the sphenopalatine ganglia, you need to go almost uh, uh, parallel uh, to your maxilla, and uh, it uh, goes in the middle turbinate, just posterior part of the middle turbinate. And uh, you, again, uh, have the lignocaine uh, soaked, uh, the cotton applicator, and uh, you can actually apply uh, two of them uh, in that area, if that is, uh, because that is that is very important for the uh, anesthetizing the airway, nasal, nasopharyngeal airway. You could also use atomizers, uh, uh, Devil bliss atomizers, and this can also be modified. So instead of actually having the manual pump, uh, you could also use uh, oxygen uh, tubing. You need to actually have a hole. So where you see the right hand, and uh, that's actually got a hole in it. So you can uh, then control uh, the atomization. We also have uh, the commercially available uh, applicators or the atomizers uh, that can be arranged to syringe. I will talk about them in a minute. We also have uh, the sprays. Now, this one is uh, the one which I use. Uh, we have lidocaine uh, uh, with phenylephrine spray. Phenylephrine is a vasoconstrictor. So instead of actually applying vasoconstrictor separately, uh, you can use this uh, combination and uh, this will anesthetize uh, the nasopharyngeal airway and also cause vasoconstriction, so increase the space uh, for passing the tube in. Lignocaine on its own is also available. This is uh, available as 10 milligram per spray, so you can actually uh, you know, calculate your dose very easily. The other thing I use is, uh, you know, lignocaine uh, gel uh, that is applied to an esophageal airway. And it also helps you to, you know, uh, gauge the size of the, uh, you know, what kind of size of tube you could be able to pass through the nasopharyngeal to the nerves. And uh, because it's important that you do not cause much trauma. And so you can anesthetize as well as you can then also know what size tube could easily pass. Uh, through the nose. You need to be careful with the dose of lidocaine used, and uh, we need to not exceed the dose more than nine milligram per kg lean body weight. Not the total body weight, but the lean body weight is important here. So blocking the glossopharyngeal nerve. Glossopharyngeal nerve can be uh, blocked uh, using just a spray. And uh, that's uh, the easy way, but you can also block it by doing injections. You need to be careful when you're using injection, intraoral root injection, because the carotid artery is just running behind it. Uh, so there are very high risk of causing intravascular injections when using the technique. Okay. As you can see, that it's easy to actually see the tonsillar pillars, and uh, you need to actually just go anteriorly to the anterior tonsillar pillar, uh, inject local anesthetic there, it'll spread to the glossopharyngeal nerve. And like I said, you can easily do it with just spraying uh, with uh, some lignocaine. 
You can also do an extra oral injection. Uh, you need to find the midpoint of the mastoid and the uh, mandibular angle, uh, hit the stalite process and walk off it, and you will be onto the glossopharyngeal nerve. Again, remember the internal carotid artery is running very, very close by. Uh, so always aspirate and inject uh, before uh, you try to block anything. When you're talking about anesthetizing the oropharyngeal airway, we always talk about whether we should be using anticelagogues or not. And uh, it is said that uh, it's important to actually have a diamucosa for the local anesthetic to be uh, you know, effective because the saliva will dilute it. So most people do actually use anticelagogues, though we don't uh, normally uh, use it because we tend to actually do nasal intubation mostly. But if you're going to use uh, glycoparolate, then use 200 uh, micrograms, 200 to 400 micrograms. And if you're using IM, then use it 40 to 60 minutes before uh, you get the patient to the theater. If you're going to use it IV, uh, then give 100, 200 micrograms. And with that, uh, be careful because that is going to cause undesirable clinical consequences. If you're talking about that is tachycardia. It will cause tachycardia, irrespective. Even though it is antisolical dose, it will cause tachycardia. So the last part is the vagus nerve, and there are lots written about it. Uh, how do you block the superior laryngeal nerve or the internal laryngeal branch of it and the recurrent laryngeal branch? How are you going to do? Uh, so that is Jackson Cross forceps. So you, this is used for application of a, a cotton pledget uh, soaked with uh, lidocaine, and this is then, uh, you know, kept in the pyriform fossa on both sides, and that can, uh, you know, block the internal laryngeal nerve. Or you could actually talk about doing uh, blocks, and uh, there are two techniques in which in some people would actually go and hit the greater corner of the hyoid and just walk off it. Or they would go one centimeter medially and four to five centimeter below uh, caudally and then pierce the thyrohyoid membrane and inject a local anesthetic to it. So there is, again, different techniques in which you hold the uh, hyoid bone if you can actually feel it and push it towards your thumb. Okay, that I'll show you in another image that it is. So you actually, so with your left hand, you hold a hard bone and push it uh, from the, your left side to the right side towards them. Uh, hit the uh, greater corner of the hard bone and then walk off it and inject local anesthetic to, pro, uh, to uh, block the superior laryngeal nerve. Or you could just uh, block, like I said, go one centimeter medially and four to five centimeter cordard, and <clears throat> then you pierce the uh, thyrohyoid membrane and inject local anesthesia, piercing the uh, you know, thyrohyoid membrane. That will block just the internal laryngeal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. To block the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve, you can actually use a, a transtracheal or tra go an injection through the crocodile. Uh, thyroid membrane and inject local anesthetic into the trachea directly. So transtracheal uh, injection through the crocothyroid membrane. Uh, uh, deposit local anesthetic, let the patient cough, that will likely spread uh, the local anesthetic in and out uh, and anesthetize the end. Uh, you can also, if you are actually used to doing the uh, ultrasound, you can do ultrasound guided block as well. You can actually, uh, you know, uh, trace the uh, thyroid cartilage, which is easy to see, and uh, uh, follow it up to the hyoid bone. Uh, you can not see it directly, but you can actually see the, uh, you know, the vascular, the neurovascular bundle can be seen. You can hit the, the uh, cone and uh, just walk off it. So you can actually do a block uh, using ultrasound as well. As some people actually say, why actually do all these kind of blocks, you know, poking needle here and there, why not just nebulize? So we'll take lignocaine, um, doesn't matter 5%, 10% lignocaine. 10% lignocaine is always in the CD cupboard. It's not uh, freely available. And uh, nebulize it. Give them time, 20 minutes or so, and the uh, patient will breathe through the nose. It will anesthetize. It will anesthetize in the nasopharyngeal airway, the oropharyngeal airway, and the trachea. So do that. That's one way of doing it. So lignoc nebulization is this. The most common method of uh, doing the anesthesia for the airway is by topicalization or spray as you go. 
uh, they are commercially available uh, devices like ENK device uh, for that. But most of us would actually just uh, use an epidural catheter and uh, attach a syringe. So in this case, we take around three or four syringes and we load it with 2% lignocaine. And uh, so two mLs of lidocaine and uh, three mLs of air. So you need to have that air to push uh, the lignocaine and, uh, you know, and then it will uh, spray itself. So this is a look at it. So that's uh, epidural catheter uh, with the uh, lignocaine through that. Like I said, there are commercially available atomizers uh, available. You can have a bottle form, uh, metamizers. And uh, so this uh, can be attached to uh, lignocaine or you can uh, pour lignocaine into an atomizer. Uh, there are syringe uh, with uh, the atomizer, which can be uh, uh, attached to it. It's conical. It fits into the nares easily, and you can calculate the amount of dose uh, delivered as well. So they're very pretty accurate. Or they can have an atomizer stillet, malleable stillet, so you can actually steer it. So you can steer it through the nose or through the oropharyngeal airway. And again, it is attached to a syringe, so you know how much amount you are actually delivering. <coughs> Sorry. Then there are airways uh, they, that comes, uh, this is the oropharyngeal airway that comes uh, attached uh, with a atomizer as well as uh, oxygen. So you can attach the oxygen. So one of them you as the atomizer, uh, with lignocaine and the other can be attached to the oxygen tubing. So you can deliver oxygen as well as uh, the deliver uh, the local anesthetic. Now, as far as uh, the literature is concerned about, uh, you know, evidence of the blocks versus uh, the other techniques, there isn't much, uh, but uh, there are a few uh, commonly quoted, uh, you know, articles which talk about the difference uh, between blocks and uh, in topicalization. And they say that blocks of the glossopharyngeal and superior laryngeal nerves uh, are associated with higher plasma concentration of local anesthetic. So there is a greater absorption. Uh, there is chances of local anesthetic toxicity. As I've said, uh, your glossopharyngeal nerve lies very close to the carotid artery injection on there. And obviously there are going to be multiple injections into blocks bilaterally. So you're going to give glossopharyngeal um, you know, the other nerve blocks, superior laryngeal blocks. You need to do them both sides. So multiple blocks, multiple needle, needle punctures are uh, required. So what do our guidelines actually say about them? And so the ASA uh, guidelines don't uh, mention. So there are practice guidelines for management of difficult airway. And uh, they actually talk about, you know, you need awake intubation in patients uh, who have difficult airway. Uh, but they don't talk about uh, how it need to be done. Okay, so technique we need to use for awake tracheal intubation. That's not. That's left to the anesthetist to decide. Uh, what about the difficult airway society? Difficult airway society came out with guidelines very very recently, uh, just last year, early last year, and they were published, and they do actually talk about it. So if you look at it, uh, they talk about oxygenation, topicalization, sedation, and performance. So it's important to keep oxygenation. <clears throat> you can use sedation, okay, and then you, but we are not interested. I'm not talking about other aspects, which will be uh, you know, covered by other, other faculty. I'm talking about topicalization. So they do talk about topicalization and they say that uh, you can use 10% spray, which I was talking about 10 milligram per spray on um, the tonsillar pillars in the base of the tongue. And you can use around 20 to 30 sprays <laughs> During inspiration of five minutes. For the nose, uh, you can use co-phenylicane, that is the lidocaine with phenylephrine, that is 5% lidocaine uh, with phenylephrine, so it would cause vasoconstriction as well. And you can always repeat them, and you can also actually use it along with go as you spray. Uh, you need to actually have, uh, you know, uh, spray, like I said, you have 5 ml syringes filled with 2% uh, lidocaine, and uh, each is filled with 2 ml of uh, the lidocaine and 3 ml of air, which can be delivered uh, through an epidural catheter. Or you can use, if you have a MAD device, then you can actually use that for that. And it's important like, how to calculate the maximum dose. I'm not going to go through this. And like I said, it needs to be a maximum need to be 9 milligram per kg. 
uh, of the lean body weight, not the total body weight, but the lean body weight is the maximum dose used. To end this talk and the summary of that, we need to actually have knowledge of the innervation of the upper airways. Uh, we know that need comes to, comes from the trigeminal nerves, uh, from the glossopharyngeal nerve, and the vagus nerve branches, or the vagus nerve. You need to have the knowledge of appropriate local anesthetic techniques and vasoconstrictor drugs. So if you're using the nasal airway, uh, use uh, topical uh, you know, vasoconstrictors. Uh, Lodicane with phenylephrine is a good uh, you know, drug to use. And then you need to actually have idea about the various techniques available. Uh, you can use nebulization, you can use nerve blocks. You can use combination of it. It does not have to be just, you know, uh, one or the other, you can actually use. So you can use trans uh, tracheal injection through the cricothyroid membrane um, to reduce the coughing, and as well as uh, spray as you go. Or you can use uh, the nebulization technique with. So you can use. So just be careful that you do not exceed uh, the total amount of lidocaine used because the chances of uh, local anesthetic toxicity are high. And always have uh, intralipid in the theater, operation theater, in case you land up in trouble. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you all. Have a nice day. Hi. Hello. Now, yeah, now we are introducing Dr. Jairam Dasan, known to everyone as Jai. Dr. Jairam Dasan is a consultant anesthetist at uh, King's College Hospital, London. He um, is my current colleague and he has brought Kings to the forefront of airway management and advanced airway management by his own endeavor. He has specialist interest in advanced airway management, bariatric anesthesia, obstetric anesthesia, trauma and maxillofacial anesthesia and craniofacial anesthesia. In fact, a jack of all trades and the master of them too. He uh, is the airway management lead uh, since 2010 at King's College Hospital, and he's the founder of King's Advanced Airway Management Workshop since 2006. And he's the chairperson of that as well. He is an invited speaker and airway faculty for Association of Anesthesia, Great Britain and Ireland, European Society of Anesthetists, World Congress, and there it goes. He's world famous. Over to you, Jay. Thank you, chairpersons, for your kind introduction. Thank you. Ask Scientific Committee for your invitation to give me this chance to give us this talk. I do not have any affiliations or disclosure to make. To start with, I would like to mention a few words um, regarding my hospital and what we do at King's. King's College Hospital is located at the Southeast Thames region, that's not too far away from the, the London Eye and uh, the other attractions in city. King's College Hospital is a large university hospital and it is a major trauma center in London as well. Kings run the largest transplant, liver transplant program, and we are a major trauma center in, in London as well. We run regular airway workshops, and we have airway training programs for the last 15 years at Kings. We have more than 
40 large scope systems and more than 20 fiber optic systems, which enable us to provide teaching and training on advanced server tools as a frontline rather than as a backup system. Personally, I was fortunate enough to perform and learn more than 7,000 video laryngoscopic intubations as well. Let me take you through an unusual, a couple of unusual airway cases where you may find it useful to estimate the importance of my topic for this discussion today, which is hybrid intubation technique. This is a 60-year-old female suffering from mucopolysaccharidosis. She presented with a severe flexion neck deformity and severe TM joint, temporomandibular joint um, ankylosis. And you could see the, the hard and protruding tongue, and which is always outside her mouth. She couldn't put it back. She was unable to breathe lying flat or eat. So the planned operation was for the tongue reduction, which probably enabled her to breathe better, sleep, and eat. So from an anesthetic point of view, the plan was an awake tracheal intubation, and we attempted awake tracheal intubation while we are oxygenating through the thrive. But awake tracheal intubation failed as the nasotracheal tube was unable to negate the acute angle created by the hard and large tongue base. So the plan was to try a combination technique or a hybrid technique using GlideScope and fiber optic flexible intubation system together. So we used a GlideScope for visualizing the water pharynx and possibly to compress to some extent the tongue base and also to know where the tube is on the fiber optic system when the tube gets into the water pharynx. So started with a gladscope visualizing the oropharynx and the nasotracheal tube was coming as over, uh, over the fiber optic system. So we came along gently, we were able to compress the tongue base to give a more of, a, of, sorry, less of an acute angle for the tube to pass and see the larynx and then tracheal intubation was made possible. And at the end, we did an, a planned staged extubation as well. So case number two, this is a six-year-old child presented with a dental abscess and with severe trismus as well. The mouth opening was very minimal. The plan was to have an inhalational induction and then perform a fiber optic intubation. So um, we... The inhalation induction was done and child is asleep and breathing spontaneously. But when we did the fiber optic, we found that it was extremely difficult to go along the acute angle created by the oropharyngeal swelling. So the fiber optic intubation attempt failed. We tried this supraglottic airway device in order to um, ventilate or use as a conduit, but unfortunately, the seal was not good enough. So the next plan was to use a pediatric air track, which was inserted, and that provided us a conduit to get the fiber optics scope and the tube over it, and also to angulate it nicely towards the larynx without much problem. So the combination technique helped to visualize the larynx and to negate the fiber optic system and the tube. And intubation was completed, and which was a traumatic. So you might ask, what is hybrid intubation technique? It is the use of a combination of tracheal uh, or, uh, or, or tracheal or nasotracheal intubating equipment with the synergistic properties resulting in a better intubating condition. So you could use more than one intubating instruments. Hybrid intubation technique came very useful in the management of mainly complex airway management. An example is a combination of video laryngoscope like a glidescope 
or a flexible uh, fiber optic system along with that, which you have seen the last two cases, how we managed it to intubate those two patients without much of a morbidity. Why is important why the hybrid intubation become an important matter to you? As we all know, the human airway structures are not in straight line and the oral nasal and laryngeal and pharyngeal axis, they are all, all can be aligned even in a normal setup it is difficult. So in a pathological or difficult airway management situation, it is even more complex. And also we know the anatomy changes from person to person and also anatomy changes according to the pathology of the oropharyngeal airway. So all this add to the complexity of one thing is a visualization over the intubation. So we know there's no single strategy which will work for all the airway management or airway care. So we need to adapt to the changes. What do we know so far? We know video laryngoscopic systems are excellent to visualize the larynx. Especially the MAC blades are normally good and the curved or hyperangulated blades are extremely useful in very anterior larynx, which you may not be able to see on a direct Macintosh laryngoscope. We also know flexible intubating scopes are useful and eat save lives and, and make a good uh, your practice, make it easier in a tortuous and a difficult airway situation. So there are instruments with particular properties which may be useful at particular instances. So why we still struggle? Yes, we do struggle. We all know that even irrespective of the best laryngoscopic view from the video laryngoscopes and irrespective of the ability to, neg to negate the oropharyngeal and laryngeal um, anatomical changes by the fiber optic system or flexible intubating scopes, still we have a problem. So when we struggle in this situation, why can't we use a combination of these two together and make the intubation condition much better way? So it is good to look at how the video laryngoscope make your visualization part of intubation easier and what price you have paid for that. In a normal Macintosh laryngoscopy, you may be able to see the, all the grades one and two, probably three and four, you won't see the larynx, obviously. And then came the uh, video laryngoscope, which enabled you to visualize all the grade three and grade four Cormac and Lehane laryngoscopic view to grade one and two. That means visualization made very easy. This is, this is especially happening when you use the hyperangulated or very curved blades or deep blades or difficult airway blades, which is very much angulated, which helps you to visualize all the difficult larynx in an easy way. What, what price you paid for that one? You can see on the screen, there are two, the oropharyngeal angle in one and the oropharyngeal angle, the other, the line in the other. By putting a hyperangulated blade through the oropharyngeal airway or oropharyngeal space in a difficult or anterior larynx, you created the oropharyngeal axis extremely difficult now. It could have been much more easier and streamlined, but now by the introduction of this hyperangulated blade, visualization easier, but the path to get there physically make it difficult. That is a change happened when the visualization became easier with the hyperangulated blade. The access to that part became more curvaceous. So hyperangulated blades has got some benefits as we all know, it improved the laryngeal view. But we all know because of the curve, because of the curvature here or the curvature here, you may not be able to compress the tongue mass. Without compressing the tongue mass, we cannot get a straight axis. We are, we are going around that uh, uncompressed tongue base. That's what we saw in my first case I presented to you earlier. So the hyperangulated blades induces a large or pharyngeal curve, or what we call sometimes called as a primary curve. 
So the potential difficulty in tracking intubation become more prominent. So we also need to know there is a disconnection we created through this hyperangulated blight in very anterior or difficult um, or complex airway cases. In the past, Macintosh laryngoscope provided you an easy laryngeal view means an easy uh, laryngeal access or in or in orotracheal intubation. But here you have made the intubation and laryngoscopy slightly disconnected by the introduction of hyperangulated or difficult video laryngoscopic blades. So that disconnection needs to be looked separately. That means one, one issue is the laryngoscopy and the other issue is intubation. So you disconnect the concept of intubation into two parts, which was almost together in the previous or, or the, the, the uh, conventional Macintosh laryngoscopy. Now you can have an easy laryngoscopy or laryngeal view, but you could have a difficult access to the airway because of this hyper angle or, or the, curve, the curve we created by the introduction of the um, hyper angulated blades. So where the hybrid intubation come into this equation? Whenever you have um, airway visualization made easy by hyper angulated um, laryngoscopes, one part you are successful now is visualization. Now, by introducing another instrument, which has got the flexibility to access the tortuous route, like fiber optic or uh, what you call it, video, video, um, uh, video intubating scopes, so any of those flexible intubating systems, we can combine the property of both to achieve successful intubation in difficult cases. So what's the solution? The solution is to continue to visualize with the video laryngoscopes, that means almost all pathological and non-pathological airways by video laryngoscope. But we may not be able to get access to use, to guide that tube to the right place, we can use flexible intubating scopes in combination with the video laryngoscopes. So to establish a definitive airway during the management of complex airway, a hybrid intubation strategy became handy and useful to you. Clinical advantages, what are the clinical situations where particularly you will come to value this hybrid intubation techniques? Mainly the complex airway cases where you can see, but you can't get the tube. That's number one. And also the skill is important. In an experienced airway operator, any intubation situation, they can manage it. That's why they're experienced. But majority of us are not that experienced because we don't do airway list every single day. So those who are moderately skilled in airway management, sometimes the best of many would be better than the best of one single technique that make it easy for you to manage it. So what are the other situations where you can go uh, use hybrid intervention? So a technique, one is ET tube exchange in the operating theater or in the ICU, where you can visualize one tube is coming while we can see the other tube is going in over the fiber optic system. Even if you get stuck in the arytenoid, still you can manipulate and you know exactly where the problem is and we can act upon it. Say for tracheostomies, when you do the percutaneous tracheostomy and the, uh, the surgical tracheostomy, you can visualize where the cuff of the tube by video laryngoscope orally and while you can look it up the fibrotic system to see the uh, subglotic structures as well. Panfacial fractures where we need to tube exchange from nasal to oral, um, you can again use combination technique. Cervical fractures, normally we take the color, color off, but there's no guarantee that we can immobilize a, a fractured a cervical um, um, vertebra. So in that situation, what you could do is keep the collar and use combination technique to manage the airway very well. If there's a blood in the airway, the mechanical effect, mechanical, the properties of video laryngoscope allow you to lift the structure up and suck and clear the airway, and then you can use fiber optic. As you come in, you can just visualize it through the video laryngoscope and advance the fiber optic. So in, in bleeding airway, this can be a useful, the combination technique, like hybrid invasion technique. 
And the trauma, again, as I said, uh, torture the anatomy. We don't know exactly where we are going. A combination of uh, video laryngoscope and fibrotic become handy. Mm -hmm. So can you do um, hybr hybrid intubation technique in any situation? Yes, you can. You can do under general anesthetic as, in, as I did in the child, and you can do awake atrocal intubation as I did in the, the other um, case I shown in the, the beginning. And also it is useful in intubation and extubation. During extubation, in the, one of the slides previously I showed you, we did the staged extubation technique by visualizing with the video laryngoscope and, and fibroptic to exactly the position that wire correctly. So what are the equipment we likely to use? We can um, use any form of video laryngoscope, that's one, or we can combine those with any form of flexible intubating systems. So for example, uh, CMAC, very common, Glidescope available in most, of, most, part, most part of the world, Airtrack has been in, the, in um, uh, practice for a long, long time, McGrath King Vision. So you can use any, any video laryngoscope as you wish. And again, there are nowadays we have got disposable uh, flexible intubating systems are also available from Ambu and Verathon as well and many other companies. So you can combine these two categories together to, for the hybrid intubation technique. It is nothing new. Hybrid intubation technique has been in practice long, long time ago. So it's, it's not a new entity, but now we are, because we are using more and more video laryngoscopes and more and more um, hyperangulated blades, we can get into occasional trouble. So that stops you sometimes why I can't get it, because that change in your practice can have as room for this uh, kind of a, a stuck situation. So this makes you to think, okay, a combination, a hybrid technique become more valuable. So it doesn't matter oral intubation, nasal intubation, or transtracheal. Any approach you do, you can use combination hybrid technique. So it can be useful for nasal and oral approach. Is there any limitation for hybrid intubation techniques? Uh, I would say the uh, available resources are not the same all over the world and depends on which part of the country you are in as well. So resources limitations are one um, issue possibly. There may need more, more manpower because we, you normally can perform a case with yourself, but when you do fibro, when you do a hybrid innovation technique, you might need another skilled person to be with you. Sometimes your assistant may be able to help you, or you may have to get another anesthetist to help you out as well. So there is an involvement of an increased manpower. Teaching and training, obviously, there's nothing can be done without teaching and training. There's no shortcut, I'm afraid. That need to be uh, good. You should be good in fiber optics and the video lighting scopes. And again, if somebody gets an extremely trismus, uh, limited mouth opening due to trismus, it may be difficult. So a reasonable mouth opening is also important. So in conclusion, um, hybrid intubation technique, when you take it forward in your practice, you need to know that few things. And every intubation, um, system is successful and depends on the operator and the patient's condition. Uh, if you're an expert, yes, you can do well, but we are not in that position. Majority of them are, are usual um, standard practitioners. Combining the qualities of two or more intubating systems make the hybrid intubation as a useful tool in your practice. So you may need to be skillful and trained in more than one instrument. Resources uh, are only limitation which we can see in this uh, technique, um, where, why we can't do it. But again, that is a temporary or a time limited factor as we push forward for our, what we need for safety of patients that can be made available. And also we know there's no one single system or one uh, single tool which fit for all patients or airway situations. So in short, for a moderately trained operator, a combination of more than one um, intubation technique and adding one uh, property of one instrument and with the addition of the other would be useful when you deal with difficult situations. 
and make your intervention successful and a successful practitioner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Three golden topics in advanced airway management. Thank you, speakers. There are quite a few questions. I'll start with Dr. Mary Jo Thomas. And sorry, Mary, I pronounced your surname wrong. Sorry, apologizing. No, the, the, no you have had you have you're getting quite a few questions so to give other speakers some chance i will limit the questions to you and you might have to answer them on the chat is that okay yes. so the first question is oh before that wow 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 60 seconds for a blind nasal intubation that's like a sauna or a calm blue sky you know um and the first question is should fiber optic be chosen over blind nasal intubation in patients with um, altered airway anatomy, especially head and neck tumor, especially as SARS-CoV-2 is sensitive to sterilization, meaning fiber optic uh, bronchoscope can be sterilized. So whether we should choose fiber optic intubation to blind nasal. Uh, it's just the question of whether a fiber optic uh, instrument is available in the COVID ICU. I think most of the COVID ICUs, I, I do not know, but how many of them do have a fiber optic is how the availability of the instrument is the question. So if you do not have an instrument, so you see the patient is desaturating, but he's awake. That's the usual uh, scenario in a COVID patient. You could have him cooperate with you and use this technique. It is safe uh, for the anesthetist and the patient. Uh, have the tube in so that you can give some pressure support or any uh, respiratory support that is needed. That is the whole idea. You need to think that there's an alternative way. If he's a difficult airway, you're not sure of securing his airway. So this is an alternative method that we need to think about in the COVID ICU. I do not, uh, I, if you have a fiber optic uh, awake, well, very good. Well, you can go ahead with it. But if you do not have, when there is a lack of resource, so it's definitely a good way. You're not going to lose an airway by putting him to sleep and then, you know, uh, finding it difficult to intubate because the patient is awake and he will definitely, they do cooperate when they know that there is a need and that's the only way that you can secure the airway. They do cooperate very well with you as long as you talk and, you know, that's a safe way, definitely a safe way of securing. Thank you. Can I come in there? But uh, in, in our setup, we have actually moved complete to the uh, disposable uh, fiber optic scopes. Uh, so we just use uh, the AMBU scopes, they will single use, use them and they are easily available. Uh, so you don't actually have to actually get it from anywhere. Uh, they are on the difficult airway trolleys. And so you just use it and throw it away. Thank you. But the situation is not the same everywhere. So this is a uh, yeah, third where the absolutely. such instruments are not available. Yeah, yeah. cost is always a uh, yeah. issue. Uh, that's that's always there. But I say that there are options available. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Doctor Rakesh. Uh, so you you said you will be asking. Uh, okay. So um, I'll, I'll I'll okay. So um, Mary, back to you. Um, uh, there's another question, how safe to use blind nasal intubation in COVID patient? You sort of uh, explained that. Um, and another question, can armor tube be used for blind nasal intubation? This is by Dr. Jaya Jacob. Yeah. I personally do not use armor tubes because uh, one of the contraindications for armor tubes is a nasal intubation because it has metal rings in it. And uh, usually we use it when you're scared that the tube will kink. But uh, in an nasal intubation, usually as of now, I have not had a problem with the tube kinking. And uh, since it's less traumatic, I, I generally use the normal uh, endotracheal tube, which is softened. And in case you need to use a uh, tube which is of lesser size, then uh, usually we retain the tube for 24 hours whenever it's a difficult intubation. So then suctioning becomes a problem. This uh, tubes can get uh, you know clogged with mucus. So it's better to use the ideal uh, size tube for nasal intubation. 
and moreover an armor tube at the tip is little floppy even for oral intubation we use a stillet so so i think i do i have not used it maybe it could be okay but i think for these reasons we usually uh, don't use an armor tube we just use the normal endotracheal tube which is dipped in a bucket of hot water with the cover so that it really softens and just take it out uh, immediately before you are going to use it because even the ac temperature in the ot can make it hard and again thanks so thanks very very neera yeah i come in yes please uh, we uh, you know we have been practicing uh, nasal intubation and uh, a lot of uh, work on blind nasal as well and uh, we loved the ilma tube because the 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 soft blunt tip which is siliconized or silicon tip is the least traumatic it is in literature as well the only problem which occurs as uh, mary has pointed out is that they are too floppy but for that she herself has suggested the the technique that we use very often that is cuff inflation so the cuff inflation technique you know makes it very um much more easy to uh, direct it into the trachea that is my take on it shall we move on to dr shiv and uh, jay please yes you ask from jay then i'll uh, okay uh, ask shiv and then we'll wrap it okay jay um uh, the question to you is which position better for hybrid uh, intubation supine so or sitting if you are if you are performing an awake technique it's always better to sit the patient up and then you mm. can perform both um combination procedures in that way if it is as um patient in um, general as under general anesthesia much easier for you two people to work together uh, in a supine position with a slightly head up tilt so it is just for practical reason for one for the patient that's awake better to be sitting in position uh, that's what we done in the first case but it is for you to be practical is better to be supine with a head up tilt because two people can stand around and work together thanks jay um there's only 3 minutes left so i'll hand over to dr rakesh you have more questions jay but can you answer that in the chat please of course, of course. thank you thank you Shiv uh, very nicely uh, summarized the whole uh, thing about block, and uh, you recommended combination of uh, techniques uh, for airway blocks and uh, minding the total dose. The questions for you are: Do the blocks increase the chance of aspiration by Navanita? Absolutely. I mean, you have to. That depends on the duration of the surgery. So, if you're doing an awake uh, intubation using blocks, even for nebulization. if your surgery is going to be just say 30 minutes or 60 minutes the effect of the local anesthesia is going to last for nearly 3 hours so you need to be careful for 3 hours you do not feed the patient okay the second question is are the invasive blocks obsolete and uh, secondly are they uh, uh, they do they increase the risk absolutely i mean if you look at it there are simpler techniques so if you look at uh, the spray as you go or nebulization they are far uh, you know uh, superior in a way that they are less invasive now if you look at uh, uh, described you need three areas to be blocked right uh, glossopharyngeal airway um, you know block is well like i said that's the most dangerous one uh, mm -hmm. especially if you're using a needle uh, you're next to the carotid artery so intravascular injection also you need to actually do multiple injections you need to block both sides right so i think so you you so you doing really, multiple injections so your risk actually increases so i think you uh, summarized it very well when you said uh, use combinations yeah uh, where uh, the injection is going to be uh, you know more uh, dangerous uh, we should definitely avoid it uh, especially in the in the light of uh, afi guidelines which you just pointed out wow Yeah. and uh, which has uh, given us a lot of uh, uh, spray uh, doses which uh, which are available you know like uh, almost uh, 50 uh, puffs you know if only puffs were to be used uh, in yes. an adult by 40 ml you said in yeah. a, in a lady who was 60 kg only yeah. it depends the other other thing is that uh, not everybody has got 10% uh, lignocaine Uh, in uh, in our theaters, ten percent lignocaine is available. It is actually kept locked, 
Uh, so, and you have to be very careful with that dose when you use for nebulization. The mm -hmm. other thing is that one one thing which uh, uh, you know combination one is the transtracheal injection. So that is that is still used. So you don't need too much. You just need two or three mLs of lignocaine, and it anesthetizes your uh, trachea as well as when they cough, they anesthetizes the vocal cords and the epiglottis. So when the tube goes in, you know the patient doesn't. Can cough. I ask? Yes, yes, yes. Do you use uh, transtracheal during this COVID season? We have stopped because the patient. No, I, I don't use anything. My my technique is very simple. I use uh, the uh, lignocaine with phenylephrine for nose, and followed by the nasopharyngeal airway, which is actually loaded with uh, lignocaine gel. And then it's just uh, three syringes. I don't even use four. Uh, three mm -hmm. syringes, two percent lignocaine with three mLs of air in five mL syringe, and uh, you know spray as you go. It's it's a very simple technique. But if right. you have got yeah, time, it works very well. It really works well. But uh, during this right. COVID pandemic, we are unable to use it. Otherwise, it works very well. Yes, so, absolutely. Yes. I mean, uh, nebulization was never actually considered as a uh, you know aerosol generating because lignocaine will itself actually stop patients from actually coughing. Especially so if you are actually nebulizing it, it actually stops patients from coughing. So I think uh, uh, we are in the last minute of the uh, of this yes, session. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, all the three speakers, uh, of, uh, Dr. Mary, Dr. Shiv, and Dr. Jay. It was Thank a wonderful you. session and uh, uh, talked about something which now I think will uh, give a, a complete picture of how to manage a difficult airway situation. Whether you used to want to use hybrid technique or the blind laser technique, we have Shiv who has blocked the whole airway for us. <laughs> so you can go ahead with blind or multiple visualization, as uh, Jay has put it. And thanks, Meera, for joining all of us. Together. And it's a wonderful time that we have had. So have a great Sunday and uh, wonderful sessions going on. Thanks to the organizers, uh, Elizabeth, uh, uh, Sam and Sajan, uh, and it's a, it's a pity that we are not there at a uh, lovely location at uh, Kochi, but hopefully next time. Kochi has this habit of uh, getting under the deluge sometimes, you know, it is sometimes drowned in uh, floods and <laughs> sometimes because of the pandemic, but I'm sure we'll be lucky next time. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you to the organizers. Go to the organizers. Okay. It's my next duty to introduce the um, next speaker. It's uh, Dr. Desan. I'm going to introduce Dr. Muhammad Islam Nasir. Uh, Dr. Nasir did his early training in anesthesia in Pakistan, and he developed the IGEL supraglottic airway device when he was working in the United Kingdom. And then he moved on to develop the VGEL, which is a veterinary supraglottic airway device. And uh, in respect of his contribution, vast amount of contribution in the field of airway anesthesia, Dr. Nasir was awarded the prestigious McKeven Medal by the Difficult Airways Society in 2016. And Dr. Nasir is well known to every single anesthetist and he transformed our anesthetic and airway care. Dr. Nasir, an anesthetist, inventor, innovator, and an entrepreneur, continues to devote his life in the field of airway management. His wisdom and sense of innovation is going to shed some light on the future of airway management. Dr. Nasir, the floor is yours. Good, Good afternoon, uh, uh, everyone uh, in Kochi. Uh, thank you, Sajay. Thank you, Jay. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for inviting me into this exciting, but in a difficult times. Um, I'm sorry, I wish I, I was there and I could have been there, but. Uh, uh, the time are very unprecedented and uh, challenging. Let's, let's uh, kick start. Sajay gave me this uh, topic uh, of uh, the futures of airway management. 
and i thought that was something very close to my heart and i found myself very excited with it and uh, let's kick start the uh, just from disclaiming that i'm um, the inventor of i gel we gel but in this topic there is no conflict i'm sure you understand uh, i work with intersurgical and doxinoint um, on research and development uh, i also chair uh, a charity called life life uh, which is registered in uk as well as in pakistan i just want you to just step back and think that the patient do not die because of the failure of intubation okay they could die but most of the time we rescue them but they really die because of failure to oxygenate the airway has been very, very well understood to some extent to large extent uh, to really perfect extent um, from mention of its uh, in the old testament um, to sorry my screen has suddenly got something uh, old testament uh, to aristotle describing at the glottis vocal cords and trachea to alexander the great saving one of his near dead uh, soldier by slitting his uh, neck hippocrates intubation uh, devices uh, adjuncts been created a uh, lot of work has gone in to make the that one part of which we understand to get the air into the patient to oxygenate the patient to have a safe uh, airway to supraglottic devices from early uh, 90s uh, till today including uh, i gel um intubation uh, adjuncts laryngoscopes video laryngoscopes you name it um, to fiber optics have been our armamentarium in the operating theater which really uh, help rescue the patient but imagine god has created a uh, human body a very complex structure i remember we we just actually try to understand and rescue this area but having said that remember the whole body is not very largely understood and even in my view this area is still not very much understood we think we know it but we don't and i usually say more i know more i know that i don't know so it needs exploring further and a lot of things are being done to understand it largely to just to understand how to get into this hole safely and properly so i go back to again the same slide saying that the oxygenation is more important than a failed intubation intubation could be achieved quite easily but the other things uh, are more important too nef4 has put another you know in my view a big plunger uh, a big spanner into the back of an anesthetist and uh, us clinicians uh, who care for our patients airway we know very clearly and we have seen i'm sure in our lifetime that when we are intubating um, uh, a big well behind it could start welling up and if it goes into the lungs you know and i know what happened to it but also particularly if you google silent aspiration i think that's the even bigger killer uh, bigger comorbidity uh, which actually is caused during our anesthesia events um and it happens quite clearly i'm sure you have heard this lecture of uh, professor um, tim cook it's not in the in the presentation but deaths is this is a paper that aiden gave me my mentor um uh, deaths associated with anesthesia 1956 anesthesia a report on 1000 cases by edwards morton pask and wiley commonest cause of death during anesthesia aspiration of gastric contents mainly associated with hernias having my left hand a report from 2011 airway complications commonest cause of death during anesthesia aspiration so aspiration uh, has been labeled as a single most common cause of death during anesthesia events and this is not me calling it it's, it was a study by morton pask and kiley uh, back in 1956 which started in 1949 uh, published ultimately in uh, 1956 where um, it was very commonly seen that aspiration was the common cause of death during the cesia events and in almost 
well, five years um, in the report of um, NAP4, again, aspiration being the single most common cause of death um, during anesthesia events. So have we really done much or have we really improved on the airway management, uh, if, you, if you really call it? We have been talking about difficult intubation. We have been accomplishing difficult intubation, but have we really put our emphasis on the aspiration? Yes, there have been a lot of um, aspects which have been uh, ironed out from uh, pre-operative uh, preparation of a patient, knowing that he is a full stomach or is uh, symptomatic with uh, regurgitation uh, prone uh, symptoms. Um, but when um, has aspiration happens, it does happen mostly in non-symptomatic patients, especially in intensive care. Um, in operating theater, procedures more than five, six minutes, 10 minutes, uh, aspiration is bound to happen. Okay, I understand there are difficulties we face uh, in certain manners of having a difficult airway, but really um, other factors also uh, come into play. So what are the uh, you know, sort of future um, developments happening? Um, we have to think out of the box to really address this complex issue or a complex problem. Um, there have been a um, lot of uh, work done on virtual rhemboscopy and bronchoscopies where you can um, look at the hardware, look at the software uh, quite clearly and help. I wish I had more time to actually go on each aspect in more detail, uh, but you can actually um, Google it, find it, and these references, and I'm sure you will be able to go into further detail of that. Uh, I have to finish this within 15 minutes. Um, also, uh, 3D imaging um, of the computed uh, tomography, uh, that does help in difficult uh, assessing the difficulty uh, in the difficult intubation scenario of patients like treated problem syndrome, um, like uh, um, golden horse syndrome, and uh, see exactly how the airway lies and what difficulties uh, you face uh, really. Cone beam is another one, uh, cone beam computed uh, tomography also is an innovative tool in uh, the assessment of an airway, which also gives you all the hardware from the software uh, and you can uh, play in between um, and see exactly how your airway looks like. And you can separate soft pellet, tongue, airway shapes and uh, the airway caliber could be assessed quite easily. Uh, so those areas are also developing um, in, a, in a big way. Um, so look in this picture, for example, the comparison of a normal uh, oval airway shape in a 32-year-old healthy male on the top with an abnormally round shape uh, in a 52-year-old uh, male uh, with obstructive airway symptoms. Similarly, 16-year-old male here, um, uh, sorry, female here, with a history of obstructive airway uh, symptoms. If you look at the top 2D image of an apparent normal airway, but if you look at the bottom one, um, just at a one centimeter cut, uh, lower showing an incomplete airway occlusion. So these, these kind of technologies uh, are very helpful and very useful uh, in assessing. I'm sure you must have heard Kepler uh, intubation system. It's another um, you know, urgent coming probably uh, in our um, uh, theaters helping and difficult intubation or normal intubations uh, where you can use the Kepler arm uh, to be able to intubate uh, the patient instead of uh, you intubating the patient. Facial image uh, analysis um, um, for a fully automated prediction of difficult um, endotypical intubation. I mean, facial recognition is a big thing uh, all over the world from security perspective, even uh, in uh, UK, Europe, USA, the way everywhere, um, I say just to recognize criminals and things, but it's actually also being advanced to use to uh, predict uh, a difficult uh, airway. Uh, also, it's, it's, it's pretty easy uh, to um, you know have a have a, a dimensional um, areas and be able to predict the difficult airway. I'm sure most of you <coughs> use <coughs> ultrasound and are using ultrasound and could easily um, assess the airway, uh, largely the upper airway uh, in, in, in many, many dimensions and directions. 
uh, it's been been used i think since almost 2010 9 uh, onward and it's also developing uh, further uh, for the techniques are being developed i'm sure you know this big data thing uh, from google um, uh, visual analytics and anesthesia and healthcare um, so essentially those uh, data are being also put on the side uh, through this big data uh, of all the 7 billion people on this face of earth um, or those people who go through uh, difficult airway um, and nowadays uh, people um, traveling across the world uh what if they meet uh, an emergency or need of anesthetic and their data could be quite easily accessed um with all the confidentiality is intact um and to all the clinicians all over the world so those those things also very helpful i'm sure you must have heard and seen videos and uh, on the youtube um where <clears throat> acupuncture and stevia but in a very selected uh, group of patients Uh, are being done even major surgeries like um, you know sort of tumors uh, thyroid um, um, i've seen also cesarean section being done even open heart surgery being done with acupuncture anesthesia but it's in a very selected uh, number of cases but uh, i know chinese are working very hard in improving those acupuncture techniques to uh, be able to um, use the acupuncture on each and every patient um, but that has not been achieved but uh, they're working very hard on that as well um i personally feel uh, it will be unfair if i don't mention um uh, the new drugs development uh, which essentially the mainstay of their changing i mean i wish again i had a time to go through each drug uh, one by one um but essentially each of the drugs pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamics are being changed um and those are actually just to make them cns safe um with intense analgesia with the uh, least uh, respiratory depression uh, or the preferred is the no respiratory depression whatsoever uh, and the patients are intensely analgesed um and relaxed the breathing fine like acupuncture anesthesia if you like to call it um but no uh, pain so in that respect all the hypnotics even propofol propofol analogs midazolam dimethylam uh, etomidate analogs carbomethamidate xenon ketamine remifentanil dexmedetomidine clonidine you name it uh, there are a lot of uh, work going on especially on synthetic ultra short acting opioids as i said again to take the this is like dissecting uh, the hair um, essentially taking the bad effects of you know sort of from the isomers to isomers as isomers and uh, just dissecting um they are better um uh, half than the bad half uh, taking that away and causing the main stage is to cause a intense analgesia um least sedation hypnosis possible and without respiratory depression um uh, that's the take home message so those things are developing and they're developing big way um and this is also a very interesting one that using the current or the new new drugs with a closed loop systems uh, for hypnosis or even anesthesia so models uh, um different computerized uh, machines are being created which will deliver uh, as and when required basis so that you know a, a certain type of infusion continues till is needed whether in operating theater or whether in intensive care but in my view uh, close to my heart is this nanoparticle technology of engineered um, micro uh, particles carrying oxygen i think this is the ultimate in my my view if they can manage it there is a lot of work going on on this uh, i wish i can uh, learn my um, a level uh, mathematics and uh, for the um, the way they are creating this it's like oxygen in a bottle uh, so it's a injectable oxygen essentially and if you can't intubate the patient you sit tight just inject into the patient and wait till sajay or j comes around and helps you rescue the airway uh, of the patient so that's that's in my view is ultimate 
um, but meanwhile, you continue using uh, IGEL and uh, happy, happy days. Uh, I'm not sure whether the IGEL or the airway adjuncts, intubations, and other supraglottic devices will go out of fashion, but it will, it will continue. But keep saving lives, um, guys, and um, um, IGEL still is being used um, pretty widely everywhere. But my last word, please be careful with regurgitation, especially silent um, um, aspiration uh, is really, really a bad thing. And I usually recommend and say, you know, if you are in a worry, especially an intubated patient, please put a throat pipe around. And you have a wonderful day and happy belated, happy new year uh, to all of you. Thank you. This was a keynote session. It was in supposed to have a discussion. Thank you, Dr. Nasser and uh, Jay. Um, that is a, you know, very informative session. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce the chairs for the next session. That is Dr. Gunjit Dua and uh, Professor Sheila Mahatra. Gunjit is a consultant in Guy's Hospital uh, in London. She is the co-director of the well-known Guy's Airway Management Conference, uh, which is uh, incidentally going to happen next weekend. Uh, and um, she's the clinical content lead for the RCOA uh, web events. And she's also the training program director for South London. And she is involved in uh, developing multiple courses focusing on airway management and human factors. And you already have seen uh, Professor Maitra, and she is the president of uh, All India Difficult Airway Association and the vice chancellor of Indian College of Critical Care Medicine. And uh, also the secretary of the Indian Division of the International Nosocomial Infection Control Consortium. Over to you, uh, Gunjit and Sheila. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sajay, for that very kind introduction. I now request uh, Gunjit to go ahead with the session. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. And thank you, Sajay, Ellen, and Elizabeth for the kind invite to this meeting. And I think I echo everyone's sentiments since morning that we miss uh, meeting everyone, but we'll have to carry on this way for the time being. So I won't take long and again, take the pleasure to introduce our colleagues from UK for this uh, looks to be a great session in the contentious times where we will be covering uh, current evidence on uh, aerosol generating procedures, obstetric airway management and above all human factors. So uh, first I would like to introduce Krish and Krish has been a colleague since long here and we have always seen him very enthusiastically teaching at lots of airway management courses. Krish has been a consultant and anesthetist in UK in 2000. He was honorary secretary of DAS and organized a very successful difficult airway society meeting back in 2014. He is uh, was a working party member for Infection in Anesthesia Working Group, which was recently published in 2020. And Krish will be enlightening us today on the current evidence based in aerosol generating procedures. Thank you, Krish. Over to you.
I would like to thank the organizers of uh, CAMCON for inviting me to do this talk. And uh, also thank you for the very kind introduction. We shall look at the aerosol generating procedures and the current evidence base uh, for it. So the learning objectives are we look at the definition and we should look at the respiratory system, a quick uh, recap of what we studied many years ago in medicine, learn something about the COVID-19 virus, look at the guidelines, and uh, also discuss the physics and how we can protect ourselves from this virus. The definition of aerosol generating procedure comes from the World Health Organization section on high-risk aerosol generating procedures. And we shall look at all the procedures that can cause aerosol generation and the level of evidence that we have for each one of those procedures. This is a detailed document by the World Health Organization published in July 2020 and for, is the backbone for many other subsequent publications that came out. This is a section that uh, focuses on uh, aerosol generation procedures in detail and also on transmission of uh, the virus. And as you can see, this particular document that came out in, on uh, 16th of October 2020 has looked at detail and uh, what it has done is reviewed nearly 5,000 results focusing on 367 relevant articles and they have tried to identify the important procedures that can be classified as aerosol generation uh, generating procedure and look at the evidence base. What is the evidence for calling them uh, high risk for transmission of the infection? This is an interesting uh, article as well in great detail from PHE and uh, uh, for uh, greater detail of uh, the topic, I would recommend uh, you consult this document. Let's look at the respiratory system and how it protects us. It has several functions. Most importantly, the upper airway protects against aspiration, humidification of air, heat of the air to from colder uh, atmospheric uh, temperature down to the body temperature of 37 nearly, filters of uh, the dust particles. This is an important pa part and we shall look at it in a bit more detail soon. It also has an immunological function because there are macrophages guarding the alveoli that uh, remove any dust or unwanted uh, foreign body that comes uh, to the alveoli. We breathe a number of polluted uh, particles that are out there and some countries like Japan and China and um, Indonesia and many parts, we have seen people uh, wearing masks well before the pandemic hit the world. So there was almost a routine practice for these countries to use masks. And there is a good reason behind it. As you can see, there are numerous sources and sizes of airborne particles. For example, we have Poland, which uh, uh, is about 10 micrometer in diameter. You have clay particles, tobacco smoke, smog. All these are tiny particles that are hanging in the atmosphere and they can we can easily breathe them in and bring them into our respiratory system. So they are there in the upper airway. In fact, it's very protective, the nose, the mouth, and all that. They have a system where it actually picks up most, uh, they pick up most of the foreign uh, particles that travel to the, towards the lung and they're removed. Whereas <clears throat> particles that are larger than 100 micrometer, they are not typically drawn into the body uh, by inhalation because of their size. They often get removed. Whereas particles less than 100 micrometers, say from 10 to 100 micrometer, they have to encounter the twists and turns of the airway system and they get deposited and they do not travel very far. However, particles that are less than 10 micrometer can actually make their way into the bronchioles and, uh, and uh, where they are uh, and down almost to the alveoli. But, but however, they have come up with the macrophages, which pick them up and remove them from our system, protecting us further. Smaller particles that are less than 100 nanometers would actually get as far as the alveoli, and they may even escape the macrophages and can potentially get into the circulation. This is relevant because the 
uh, SARS virus is in the diameter of 60 to 100 nanometers. So if it gets passed and gets into this wide area of lung, which is nearly 100 square meters, I'm told, in few day, if the virus gets into that vast area, it has the potential to get in and uh, establish itself. So this is the virus, 60 to 100 nanometer. As you can see, the bacteria is one to two microns, and there are other viruses that you see that are slightly bigger, but the coronavirus is a much smaller virus, 60 to 100, 100 nanometer. Of the, they are bigger than Zika virus and Parvo virus, but 60 to 100 nanometer is a significantly smaller virus to travel in towards the lungs. So this virus travels because once through droplet infections, which has the diameters of five to 10 micrometer. And uh, when we sneeze, the droplets come out, about 40,000 droplets come out in a sneeze at a speed of 100 meters per second. In a cough, 3,000 droplets come out at a speed of about 50 meters. And as these droplets hit the atmosphere, they break down into smaller particles, which we call the uh, aerosols, and they can travel farther. Some people call them droplet nuclei, which is a very good term to describe the aerosol, because having discarded the peripheral epithelial cells and uh, structures and saliva uh, going through dehydration process, the aerosols, they carry the core of the infective material. They can carry a number of viruses in them. In winter month, the air is thicker. So when we cough into, uh, during cough or sneeze in winter, the sneeze and cough that comes out confronts air that is thicker. Therefore, they have a greater chance of aerosol pro uh, production. Therefore, infection is more common during winter months. In summer months, the air is rarefied and therefore infection is less because uh, the droplets, they tend to dehydrate and move up towards the hotter part of the air and they also do not produce as much aerosol as would be possible in winter months. The transmission of the virus occurs through droplets, through aerosol, and also because the virus has been coughed out on various fomites like uh, the board, the work table, and then uh, if we can actually carry them on gloves. So it's very important to stop the transmission of fo virus from fomites. We must uh, wear gloves, wash hands repeatedly, and uh, make sure we are not leaning on things uh, or shaking hands or touching face. Uh, there's also proof that the virus can make its way into feces and urine and may also into the blood. But this looks like currently, looks like a very doubtful route of transmission of the virus. So aerosol is produced by talking, singing, uh, at gym, when people are straining, coughing and sneezing, of course, as we had discussed earlier, in closed spaces, when this uh, is generated, it tra travels in air currents and can go a distance. So, for instance, it has been shown that a person in a closed room sitting nearly four to six meters from two other individuals, when he was there for about an hour, he could actually transmit the virus to the other two, though they were sitting quite a distance. This is because over a period of an hour, small aerosols build up and gener gener generated in a room and tend to travel and cause infection. So though there is uh, much to show that the aerosol is generated by speech, singing and coughing, and that the important point to, uh, point to bear in mind is that duration is an important factor. A person can, in, who's been uh, uh, talking for nearly five minutes may produce as much, uh, as much aerosol as would be produced during a cough. The list of aerosol generating procedures from the uh, PHE on Public Health England that is based on uh, the World Health Organization lists all these as aerosol generating procedures. Those that are in red, like the tracheal intubation, manual ventilation and tracheostomy, they, and also the non-invasive ventilation, they I have co colored them in red because there is evidence to show that these are definitely aerosol generating. Those in yellow, like bronchoscopy, have weak evidence, and there is no evidence to show currently that the blue, those in light blue, 
or aerosol generating procedure. However, the PHE and the World Health Organization have recommended that we take full precautions when we are dealing with these. And therefore, they are listed as aerosol generating procedures. The, the lack of evidence does not mean that transmission does not occur. The reason is many since the pandemic have been wearing PPE. Therefore, when people are wearing PPE and protecting themselves, it is hard to quantify and prove that these are not aerosol generating procedures. Therefore, PHE and the World Health Organization have recommended that we treat all these procedures as aerosol generating and take adequate precautions. Aerosols have been generated by uh, perfumes and by various other things like the nebulizers, antinox. So aerosol is sometimes generated for benefits, particularly a nebulizer can carry the drug into the alveolar space uh, but it, because the aerosol is generated from outside the human body, it is not, does not cause infection. And also, it breaks down with tiny uh, uh, particles that travel with less force into the airway. Therefore, they do not uh, agitate and bring down infective particles. So these do not cause infection. Antonox nebulizers and humidified oxygen are not uh, aerosol generating procedures though they themselves are aerosols. Here you can see that the compressed air in a nebulizer, this is a cross section of the nebulizer. You can see that as it comes up, it travels up, hits the baffle and the aerosol goes into the patient and it is it, it gets into the patient very quickly at uh, about 200 to 400 micrograms of the 2.5 milligrams of solubitamol that we give gets to the patient. Only a small fraction gets in. A large part of the drug gets deposited in the nasal airways and the upper airways, but a small portion of the aerosol gets all the way to give the patient the benefits of the drug. And therefore, this is unlikely to bring out the virus and cause a problem. And this slide shows the difference between the medical aerosol, which I have just discussed, and the aerosol generating procedure uh, that we have discussed uh, as well earlier. So physics of aerosol, they have to obey two theories, the kinetic theory and the Brownian movement theory. So in the kinetic theory, all the particles are constantly in motion, particularly the smaller one. We know about the molecules and mo motion in a, in a gas chamber, and that's what causes the pressure on the walls of gas. We know that as anesthetists, so that is easily understood. But also the biological particles like the bacteria, the virus, and also the pollen grains are constantly moving. And this is called the Brownian motion described by Robert Brown in 1827. And he showed how the pollen grains were moving in a solution. So you would expect that if the particles are moving, you cannot expect the viruses to sit quietly along the mucous membrane as shown in this picture, but they would rather be moving around in this particular fashion, moving in and out with the breath. And also they are all around the patient when their patient is talking and potentially they can travel by air waves uh, in different directions. Some of these uh, aerosols, uh, diameters four micrometer, can hang around according to this research paper where they use light uh, scattering, high sensitive laser light scattering. They found that these may actually, though not visible, may hang around the atmosphere for eight to 14 minutes the aerosols might be there. So this is an interesting paper to read and therefore also confirm that substantial probability that normal speaking causes airborne virus transmission in confined environments. This particular study was uh, a, a very good study which looks at uh, droplets, aerosols, and how they may be transmitted. Here is a droplet and it has got a central part of it, which is uh, made up of saliva, mucus, epithelial, various types of cells, and also how harbors fungi, virus, and bacteria. So this particular droplet, about five to 10 micrometer, when this is coughed out, like we see here, it comes up against the air and breaks down. And at the periphery, you can see here that it, it actually becomes uh, aerosol or droplet nuclei which will carry the virus. The droplets themselves tend to gravitate 
down and move and they as they move they become smaller and smaller as uh, shown here my wall in 1955 that we see the as the cough comes out this is the time from zero time about particles that are less than 100 micrometer they last they do not reach the ground and up to 140 you can see they have rarely reached the ground a lot of them tend to become aerosols and then they go stay in the atmosphere only larger particles that are about 200 micrometer they tend to become smaller and they may end up hitting the ground therefore up to 2 meters the larger particles can travel but the rest of them can become uh, aerosols and be hanging in the air for some time and may even travel through air currents here is a infected person who has a sneeze and you can see that a sneeze a lot of the droplets may tend to gravitate down but a generation of aerosol also occurs at about the same time and it tends to travel like a cloud and there could be a considerable amount of these uh, nearly 40000 droplets come out in a sneeze in a cough about 3000 particles come out and you can see that they also produce some aerosol and then they they some of them gravitate down same is the case the simple breathing and exhale exhaling which also produces enough aerosol that can infect uh, if that person stays in the environment for sufficient period of time he may be breathing out a lot of this aerosol that can cause infection wearing the mask is the key to avoiding the problem and this has to be done along with all the good uh, phe guidelines of standard uh, infection control precautions and also the transmission based protocol that came out which talks about hand space face and of course uh, the ppe that we're going to talk about there are different types of ppe that are available people have been using homemade cloth masks it gives some protection if nothing at least it stops the individual from spreading virus outside it gives about 40% protection but that's not good enough the surgical face mask can give up to 80% filtration but unfortunately there are leaks around the surgical face mask so it is not as effective when you are dealing with a patient who is actually covid positive and you are within 2 meters of the patient so we have to depend on more uh, efficient face masks and this would be the ffp2 mask which uh, filter about 95% effective 25 times more effective than the surgical mask and there are now about 50 times more protective than homemade masks the ultimate one the ffp3 99% particularly when they are fit tested are the best masks to use in this crisis and i personally always go by the ffp3 mask i always use a visor or goggle and also fluid resistant gown and gloves for every aerosol generating procedure that i undertake without fail there is no substitute to safety and we have to be cautious in dealing with airway generating procedure a paper came out from birmingham from bristol which claims that aeros anesthesia procedures may generate fewer aerosols than presumed study that suggests i do not question the validity of this but in this crisis i would like to say that i would not like to follow this particular guideline or this particular uh, research uh, outcome i would not like to use it at all the reason behind there are so many unknowns in this complex situation that people who uh, approach a patient who is could be covid or uh, suspected of covid if they do not take sufficient precautions can potentially get infected so there has been a lot of pressure on hospitals and on management to get the cases done and in this complex tug of war between efficiency and safety sometimes safety is under threat so this is a controversy my belief is please always use ppe when dealing with aerosol generating procedure so for this controversy i have put together a verse which says what i am trying to say in just four sentences it's a game of chess between commerce and science where we side and wish good science to win but commerce finds ways facts to undermine and owns the chess board and pieces therein in conclusion hand space face absolutely vitally important 
PPE correctly, put it on and remove it correctly. Practice, learn how to do it correctly. Because even if you use PPE, if you take it off badly, you can end up infecting yourself. Risk assess patients green, amber, and red. This is important to do in every hospital. Use fluid resistant gowns, FFP3, eye protection, gloves in all AGP procedures, whether green, amber, or red. Just use the AGP completely. And that is the recommendation that we have fallen back on with this new va uh, variant hitting UK. And the reason behind that is there are just too many false negatives and increasing number of silent carriers. Almost one in three may be silent carriers, it is predicted. And of course, if you're dealing with airways, video laryngus goes for preferred, and this slide shows why, which I recommend. And of course, and there is one more slide which I have added for you to look at. This is about how to deal with cardiac arrest. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Krish, for a very interesting and informative uh, lecture on aerosol generating procedures, the current evidence. You've given us very practical uh, tips, and I really like the words that you ended with. Thank you so much. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions that we'll take in, uh, at the end. Uh, without any delay, we'll move to the next presentation. And I'm very happy to introduce uh, Professor uh, Mary Mushambi. Uh, Professor Mary Mushambi uh, is the honorary consultant uh, anesthetist uh, in the UK. She's also the Difficult Airway Society DAS Professor of Anesthesia and uh, Airway Management. And she's also the Associate uh, Director of the uh, University Hospitals of Leicester, Leicester, UK. And there's a whole lot of, uh, you know, uh, things I can say about Dr. Mary Moshambi. But one thing I'd like to say is today we're at, on the 17th of January. And I can say that Dr. Mary Moshambi, I have already, you know, this is the third presentation I'm seeing her deliver in India. So I can tell you that she's really a very popular uh, figure uh, in India and very loved by the people here. And uh, who better to speak on this topic? Uh, she's an expert in obstetrics, and she's going to be speaking to you about obstetric airway in 2021. Over to you, Professor Mashambi. Good morning. Thank you, Sajay, and the organizing committee for inviting me to speak today. I'm delighted to be part of your faculty. I'm going to be talking about obstetric airway management, and I thought I'd cover three topics. I thought I'd look, look at rapid sequence induction in the obstetric patient to see how can we modernize the obstetric airway management. And then I'm going to look at how to manage a pregnant woman with an anticipated difficult airway. And lastly, I'm going to talk about a controversial topic, which is this suggestion of using a supraglottic airway device as the primary airway device for caesar elective caesarean sections. Okay, so you might ask me, why have I selected to talk about rapid sequence in the obstetric patient? Well, the reason is when we look at the obstetric airway morbidity and mortality statistics, there's no doubt about it that obstetric airway management doesn't fare very well. For example, if we look at the incidence of desaturation during rapid sequence induction, obstetric women desaturate to less than 90%, 10% of these women do that. Less than 95%, 20% of the women desaturate. This is not good, particularly when you compare it to the non-obstetric patients. Similarly, if we look at other statistics, we know that incidence of failed intubation is higher. We also know that the incidence of front of neck is higher than in the non-obstetric patient. And if you fail to intubate, the chances of needing a front of neck is 1 in 60. The chances of dying after an obstetric general setting is also higher. And if you fail to intubate, the chance of that woman dying is 1%. This is quite alarming and we need to do something about it. So what can we do about it? Well, you know that in 2015, we published the Obstetric Failed Intubation Guidelines in the UK. And one of the algorithms that we included was this, the Safe Obstetric Gen Anesthetic Algorithm. And the reasoning behind this algorithm was really to modernize obstetric airway 
and general anesthetic, and also to use it as a standardized teaching tool. We can use this in simulation and make sure that patient, uh, our anesthetists are following all the items put in this safe obstetric general anesthetic algorithm. I haven't got time to look at everything, but we'll look at some of the salient points that are in this um, safe obstetric general anesthetic algorithm. So if we start at the top there, there's several things that we can look at. For example, intrauterine fetal resuscitation is a very simple way of improving placental flow when you have that uh, fetal distress and you're rushing down to theatre. Simple measures such as changing positioning, giving oxygen, etc., can improve the condition to such a state that you, it takes away this pressure, the panic, and you might even prevent doing a general anaesthetic. The next stage is the checklist. We know that the WHO safety checklist improves safety. Well, we've gone a step further and introduced a general anaesthetic checklist specific for obstetrics, such as this, which we use in our hospital. And what we do is this, is that you do this when you're pre oxygenating the patient and your assistant asks you the questions as the anesthetist and you answer. And it looks at things like preparing the patient, simple things. Is your cannula working? Have you given antacid, etc.? Have you got your equipment and drugs? Are they all checked? And how have you prepared for difficulty? What is your plan B if things go wrong? What is your plan D? If you fail to intubate, are you going to wake this woman up or are you going to proceed with surgery? And to answer that, we use the table one from the difficult airway guidelines where we know that seven of the nine factors that are required for this decision are there before you put the patient to sleep. So make that decision at that time rather than leaving it till you've got things going wrong and you've got failed intubation going on and you're trying to make a decision. So let's look at the rapid sequence induction technique and some of the things we've recommended to try and improve safety during this period. Starting off with the simple things like positioning. There should be no pregnant woman going uh, rapid sequence induction lying completely supine. Put them head up. Very simple. It improves airway management. And then we should be taking all the measures to improve oxygenation and avoid these patients becoming hypoxic during rapid sequence induction. And they're all listed here, and we'll look at some of them. Let's look at the first one, mass ventilation. Previously has been discouraged because we're worried about gastric insufflation. But in fact, studies show that if we reduce the peak inspiratory pressure to 20 centimeters of water and we've got correctly applied cricoid pressure, we don't have gastric insufflation. Therefore, please use mask ventilation because it prevents hypoxia. Another simple procedure, apneic oxygenation, something that was regarded as an old technique and it's having resurgence and makes a difference. Using simple cannulas such as this, and providing low flow oxygen, five liters per minute before the patient is asleep. And as soon as they're asleep, increase it to 15 liters per minute and make sure you've got a patent airway. It gives oxygen during that period when you're doing laryngoscopy, when you've got a difficult airway. And of course, if you have extra money, you can go to the high flow humidifier nasal oxygen, which we know that in the non-obstetric patient has an important role in increasing the safe apnea period. Now, there's a bit of question mark in obstetrics where there are two studies which are here, which show that the in high flow humidified nasal oxygen does not perform as well as mask pre oxygenation during the pre oxygenation technique. But this is by judging at the end tidal oxygen levels that are achieved. Unfortunately, the whole pre oxygenation technique is not just looking at the oxygenation technique, the pre oxygenation. There's also the safe apnea period. And this is where high flow humidified nasal oxygen is very beneficial and we should be using it. Moving on to the drugs we use for induction, the debate between propofol and thiopentone. As far as I'm concerned, if we look at all these positive things of why we should be using Propofol, there is no debate and we should now be using Propofol instead of thiopentone. Unfortunately, in the UK, for some reason, between 60 and 70% of anesthetists are still using thiopentone in obstetrics. My question is why? 
What about the debate between saxomethonium and rocuronium? Well, this is a debate that's probably going to continue for a bit longer. And the reason is, these four reasons. The first one is anaphylaxis risk. We know that saxomethonium has the highest incidence of the uh, anaphylaxis. But if you look at outcome, outcome after a rocuronium anaphylaxis is much worse off than with saxomethonium. The dose of saxomethonium easy to calculate. But with rocuronium, do we use ideal body weight? Do we use lean body mass? More difficult to calculate. Can you imagine trying to calculate a dose for rocuronium when you're rushing down the corridor with a category one cesarean section with a patient with a BMI of 40 or 50? Not easy. If you use rocuronium for rapid sequence induction, benzogamidex has to be available for reversal. And this is, has cost implications. If you use saxomethonium and you have a failed intubation, the times you're going to be doing your air manipulation is when your saxomethonium is wearing off. And of course, you may end up with laryngeal spasm and get into worse trouble. So as you can see, there's pros and cons for each of the two, which is why in the UK, 92% of anesthetists are still using saxomethonium. Therefore, this debate will continue for a little bit longer. What about vitiolaryngoscopes? Should we be using vitiolaryngoscopes or Macintosh in obstetrics? And again, I don't think there's a debate here. Vitiolaryngoscopes, we know they give you better views, higher success rates, fantastic teaching rules. And as far as I'm concerned, they should be now the first line in obstetrics. But we have to make sure that firstly, they are available on the labels and that we're teaching our trainees how to use them so that they feel comfortable to use them as first-line laryngoscope. Let's move on to my next topic, which is how to deal with the pregnant woman with a difficult airway. Now, the reason I brought this up is because we've just published this um, narrative review where we looked at over 150 published cases of pregnant women with anticipated difficult airway. And what we found was that the technical skills required to manage difficult airway are no different to when you're pregnant or not, not pregnant. But what is different are the decision-making tools. That decision of, if you have this patient with a difficult airway, are you happy to allow them to labor and know that you may have to cope with the difficult airway in the middle of the night? Or do you bail out and go for an elective cesarean section? If you go for an elective cesarean section, are you happy to do a regional anesthetic, knowing that there's a chance you may need to give a general anesthetic intraoperatively, or do you bail out and go for a general anesthetic at the beginning? If you go for a general anesthetic, do you do an awake airway or an asleep airway? And of course, we have the unpredictability of the pregnant woman presenting at any gestation or at any time of day or night. And of course, the obstetric-related uh, pathology, the pathophysiological changes in obstetrics may affect airway management or even affect the airway itself. So when we came to giving some recommendations in our review, we focused primarily on this decision-making and brought out this decision aid overview, which gives you guidance on how to manage a pregnant woman with a difficult airway. And in it, we also gave you decision aid one of how to deal with a patient who we have to make a decision. Do we go for an elective cesarean section because we're worried about the airway or are we happy to allow it to labor? And lastly, we had a decision aid two to help with that decision of do we go for an awake airway or an asleep airway if we need to give a general anesthetic in this patient? Now, to give you some idea of the kind of patients that I'm talking about with a difficult airway, this is an example. This is a lady who presented at 36 weeks, having had an eclamptic fit and bitten her tongue, and this is what her airway looked like. And on top of that, she also had low platelets. So what anesthetic would you give to this lady who needs an emergency cesarean section? And they gave a spinal anesthetic, which is quite understandable. But next question is, what would you do if she required a general anesthetic intraoperatively because she was bleeding? Good question. Another 
kind of case we had. This is kind of common finding of patients with congenital syndromes. Not only did they have a difficult airway such as this, but they also had a difficult spine and therefore would be a difficult regional block. Patients who were pregnant often want to protect the babies and refuse treatment. And this is a patient we had who had Hodgkin's lymphoma, who presented to us and then refused treatment and disappeared to follow up and then presented back to us again at 33 weeks with stridor and completely narrowed airway and needing emergency delivery. Another epidemic that we're having on our labels, which is the morbidly obese patients. And we have to decide at what point do you feel comfortable for them to go through labor and be able to cope with them in the middle of the night? Or when do we bail out and go for an elective cesarean section? So these are the kind of cases that I'm talking about. So let's go through some of the decision aids that we have put forward. So this is the overview of how to deal with a pregnant woman. So we want our colleagues, our obstetricians and our midwifery colleagues to identify these patients and refer them to our clinic, our anesthetic clinic, where we then do a thorough airway assessment and we have to make a decision of, do we feel these deserve a multidisciplinary meeting where we then have to decide the mode of delivery and timing of delivery? And this then helps us to decide, are we going to allow labour or are we going to go to an elective cesarean section. If we go for elective cesarean section, are we happy with the regional anesthetic or are we gonna go straight for general anesthetic? If we go for a general anesthetic, are we gonna secure the airway asleep or awake? And there's two steps which are really quite challenging. And the first one is that decision of allowing labor or elective cesarean section. And we put this in a little bit more detail in the decision aid one, which I'll cover just now. And the next stage is this, where you have to make a decision between a secure the airway awake or asleep. Now let's look at decision aid one, which is that question. You have this pregnant woman, a bit like the ones I've mentioned, and you want to decide, are you going to allow labor or cesarean section? And the question you have to ask yourself is, can safe airway management be achieved out of hours in this patient? And to do that and to answer that, you have to look at three things. The clinical characteristics of that patient, the airway pathology, the obstetric history, the uh, state, can you do a regional block in this patient? If you need to put to sleep, do you need to do an awake airway in this patient? Do you have the equipment available for this patient on your labor ward 24 hours a day? Do you have the personnel available on, in your hospital 24 hours a day. And if you think you can safely manage that way, airway out of hours, then by all means, go and allow the woman to have labor. But you might consider to induce the patient so it's, she's being managed on a specific day with everything set up for that woman. But that labor needs to be actively managed. You want a good regional block, everybody communicating and monitoring the progress and preparing as if you may need to go to theatre in that patient. On the other hand, you might decide that safe airway management cannot be achieved in this patient out of hours and you bail out and you go for an elective cesarean section. Now, some of these decisions cannot be easy. And one, I'm going to give you two, a, a tool to help with some of these decisions. The first one is this, where you're trying to decide whether you're going to go for regional anesthesia or a general anesthetic in this patient with a difficult airway by using a wake laryngoscopy as part of airway assessment. And this was done in this patient with the Klippefeld syndrome, a bit like the one I mentioned earlier on, who has a difficult airway and a difficult back with the kyphoscoliosis. scoliosis. And this was done by Martin Dresner in 1995. What they did is they did a direct laryngoscopy using a Macintosh blade. You can now use video laryngoscopes and a topical anesthesia. And they had a good view of the glottis. And therefore, they were happy to do the cesarean section under regional anesthetic. In fact, they used a spinal catheter because they knew that if they needed to give a general anesthetic, they'd be able to intubate this patient. Another decision is, 
when you want to decide, do you go for an asleep or an awake airway? And again, you can do an airway assessment using an awake laryngoscopy. And this was done in this patient who was a dwarf, high BMI, had Harrington rods, and they did an awake laryngoscopy, had a good view of the glottis, and therefore did a rapid sequence induction and an asleep airway. Now we're going to move on to this controversial topic of using supraglottic airway device as a primary airway device for cesarean section. And we wrote this review um, editorial in the BJA, which covered this subject. And what we found was that there are quite a lot of studies now. There are at least 11 studies that have been published and over 8,000 patients have been studied. And only four randomized studies, which is just under 600 patients in randomized studies. And what we found actually is worrying is that this is already becoming practice in some hospitals. And I'll pick one study here, which described their practice in their hospitals. So they said the majority of their cesarean sections are being done using Supreme uh, LMA. And quite often it was a patient preference who wanted the use of the Supreme LMA. And it's already become part of a routine practice for at least five years in their hospitals. And in this study, they use the supreme LMA in category two and three cesarean sections and the patients had been fasted for just from four hours onwards, which is not very long. So it's already becoming routine practice in some places, which is a bit worrying. So let's look at the safety side of it. What are the findings? Well, it's reassuring a bit in that there's been no cases of aspiration, which is one thing that we would worry about. There's been one case of regurgitation which occurred during the application of bundle pressure. When we looked at the randomized studies comparing the superglottic airway device and endotracheal tube, in fact, superglottic airway device performed better. There was one failed intubation in the endotracheal tube, and there was a case of laryngeal spasm in the endotracheal tube. So, in fact, the superglottic devices were performing better from the evidence so far. But I'm not going to stand here and say, by all means, go and use superglottic airway devices. No, because we still need more studies. We've only had nearly 600 patients in randomized studies. We need bigger studies than this because we need to confirm in selected patients, is the use of superglottic airway device faster than intubation? And how do we select those patients? Could it be based on BMI, fasting status? What type of anesthetic are we going to give? Are we going to allow the patient to breathe spontaneously or are we going to paralyze and ventilate the patient? Of the types of superglottic airway devices that are there, which is the best for the obstetric patients in this situation? And of course, what is the role of gastric ultrasound? Could we use it to assess gastric contents and then make a decision on which is the best airway technique? Still questions to be answered, but we need more studies. At the end of my talk, and I hopefully I've covered the three areas I mentioned I was going to manage to, about modernizing the rapid sequence induction technique, talking about anticipated difficult airway in the pregnant woman, and controversial question about superglottic airway device as the primary airway device. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mary. That was really a very interesting presentation. I'm sure there'll be lots of discussion about this. Uh, at the end of the session, I uh, request Gunjit to please introduce the next speaker. Thank you, Sheila, and thank you, Mary, as usual, very comprehensive in very short time. And now my pleasure to introduce Mark. Dr. Mark Stacy is a consultant in aesthetist and associate dean at Cardiff. With extensive experience on the management of difficult airway, he is very, very well known for investigating performance and skills under pressure and has helped develop lots of training methods for emergency scenarios. Additionally, for the last eight years, he has been developing strategies to, to improve our well-being, what could have been more relevant during this pandemic. Thank you, Mark, and now runs a very successful workshop on well-being. And I mean, instead, in addition to all this, I would just personally add that every time I hear Mark talk, I just say that if I could just inculcate even a bit into my personal practice, it would just make me a better anesthetist and improve my well-being. So I look forward to hearing you again, Mark. Thank you. 
Thanks very much, Gandit uh, and Sheila, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm going to play a video, I hope. Which will come in now. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope that you're all okay in these extremely challenging times. My name is Mark Stacey. Uh, I'm a consultant anesthetist in Cardiff, in Wales. And I've been asked to talk about uh, human factors in area management. So I'm going to give you a short introduction over the next 20 minutes. Uh, I'm happy to provide more learning material if anybody's interested. I think it's important to realise when you're talking about managing an airway in anaesthesia or in resuscitation, in order to do it well and to do it as well as you can, it's not just about the airway. And in fact, I'm probably going to spend very little of the next 20 minutes talking about guidelines. You're all quite capable of looking those up. So our job is pretty time competitive. My particular clinical interest is managing difficult airways in pediatrics and adults, but also I am an obstetric anaesthetist, which is can be a very time sensitive job. And like most of my sessions, this session will follow what I call my baobab rules. Uh, the baobab is this tree that you can see in the background and the story that the Africans tell about the baobab is that God was so unimpressed by its bloated arrogance that he planted it upside down. And I use it to remind me on a daily basis that arrogance in our specialty is an extremely dangerous trait to have. But it's also to remind me that 90% of what I'm telling you, I think, is correct. Only I can't tell you which 90%. And in fact, the more I learn about the subject, the more I realize 90% is probably a gross overestimate. So I want you to imagine that you are looking after a patient. You are the anaesthetist responsible. It's four o'clock in the morning. This lady is a 30-year-old grand multip with symptomatic COVID. And she is on the red ward, some distance from your normal labor ward patients. The midwife looking after the patient, it's her fourth night on a series of nights. The clinical team, including you, it's your third night on a series of the nights. And the midwife, very sensibly, because of the potential risk of a significant postpartum hemorrhage, has ensured that there is a bag with 40 units of syntonitosin on and 500 mils of Hartman is drawn up, ready to go as soon as the baby is delivered. The woman is on an IV infusion and at four o'clock in the morning, the bag is changed. And at that point, the fetal heart rate drops significantly. And she realizes with, uh, with complete horror that she's actually transfused inadvertently the bag containing the syntocinon. The consequences of this are significant fetal distress and the category one or emergency cesarean section. The anaesthetist hastily with the surgeons and the theater team try to put their PPE on and do a briefing. Anesta starts to pre-oxygenate the patient, induces and paralyzes the patient, looks up to see what the sats are and realizes that, uh, that he has forgotten to put the monitoring on. And now he's got to intubate the patient. So what we've got here is a perfect example of the lining up of holes in Reason's Swiss cheese model. Ostensibly, if you looked at this from a root cause analysis point of view, you would say that the incident was caused by the infusion of syntocinol. But it's much more complicated than that. And this is often poorly understood by those retrospectively analyzing an event such as this. So what does human factors mean to you? Well, usually when I ask this question, people will talk about the mistakes that human beings make, particularly when they're stressed, and strategies to minimize the risk of those mistakes causing more significant harm. What we call a system one approach. More recently, we've started to look at a system two strategy 
which also looks at things that go well or things that go right and see how we can make that side of the scale even bigger while making the things that go wrong side of the scale even smaller. But actually human factors is more than that. It encompasses all those factors that can influence people and their behavior. And in our work, it's the environmental, organizational, job factors and individual characteristics which influence behavior and performance at work. And what I'm talking about here is a variety of skills that we're all quite capable of learning. And the reason that we understand that they are skills does mean that you are more likely, if you understand that it's a skill, with significant practice to turn that skill into a habit. And over years of practice, that habit there may then become part of your behavior in such a way that you're continuously looking to ways to improve your performance, to ensure that when faced with a challenging, time-limited airway potential catastrophe, you have the appropriate skills to manage that situation. And if you go on a human factors course, you'll often be taught a variety of skills, such as the ones I've listed here. Uh, and the idea is you learn those skills and you ensure that you practice and perform those skills in such a way that patient safety is optimized. But as I said, it's more than that. This is the error troika taken from some of the original work done by NASA looking at human performance. And in order to ensure that the system is appropriately uh, managed as best as it can be, ideally your system should be enabled in such a way that and designed that the error is avoided in the first place. That's the bottom section of the pyramid, which is also the biggest section of the pyramid. If the error is unavoidable, then you need strategies to trap the error. And interestingly, often when we design traps for errors, you then run the risk of making that system more complicated, which actually leads to a different set of errors. And at the top of the pyramid, the smallest part of the pyramid, is the human being who has to find a strategy or plan or skill to mitigate the consequences of that error. But frequently when analyzing errors, using hindsight bias, it is the smallest part of the pyramid, i.e. the person at the top of that pyramid who is blamed for that series of circumstances. Because there are three key issues. For any of us, error is normal. Problem is, with the best will in the world, our performance is also variable. But you can mitigate both of these problems by ensuring that the team optimize their communication and optimize information sharing. This is some data taken from eye tracking data. So what you can see here is somebody's uh, vision as they're driving down a dead straight road. Uh, they're looking in the rear view mirror, which is the mirror at the top and then the two side mirrors. And you can see that they're scanning the whole area, area even though this is a dead straight road. And this is what happens to your eye tracking when your phone rings in the car. What you can see here is that the area of focus is narrowed right down, and hence there is a significant risk of fixation error. You effectively become cognitively blind to anything that is outside that small area of focus, and this can cause significant issues. So this is the simplest model of the mind that I use for a variety of different purposes, but I'm going to use it here to look at uh, human performance. And it's based around an understanding of our working memory, which acts as a bottleneck between two things. It acts as a bottleneck between the skill, and for this example, we'll use the airway, and your long-term memory. Now, your working memory is limited. And Ronald Miller looked at this uh, function of the working memory in the 1950s wrote a paper called The Magical Number Seven and suggested that at any one moment in time, we can cope with seven plus or minus two items of information. Personally, I've always thought this was a bit of an overestimate. And this work was repeated by uh, another psychologist called Cowan in the 2000s, 
And he said, it's not seven, it's four plus or minus one. And then, of course, there's the issue of stress. What happens to that number, four plus or minus one, when you get stressed? Well, what we think happens is you become almost a binary unit. So your zero response is your classic rabbit in the headlights response, the freeze response. And your plus one response is your classic fixation error. I must intubate, must intubate, must intubate. And then, of course, there's a minus one response, which is where you run around with your hair on fire. Then, of course, there are a couple of real blocks to this process of putting the skill into your lung. How many of you noticed that in the bottom left-hand corner, I changed the quote each time? If you don't believe me, you can go back and watch this talk again. Because we have a huge arrogance about how good we think we are in a stressful situation. We think we will perform better than we've performed before. But the best we're ever going to be reformed is the best we've performed in practice. And unless you practice that skill in those circumstances, you really have genuinely no idea what you're actually going to do. And there's a saying in the Navy that under pressure, you don't rise to the occasion. You sink to the level of your training. So how can we improve things? Well, we can look at teamwork. And one of the questions I, I encourage you to think about in your teams is, what is it about the teams you've worked and the people you've come into contact with that worked effectively? And what didn't work effectively? Again, NASA looked at this and they looked at the eight different components, which I've listed here. Briefing, communication, feedback, inquiry, leadership, interpersonal relationships, preparation, and workload. And if I were to ask you to vote for your favorite or the most important of those team skills, Normally in a, in a group of people, I will get a spread of votes. But the most important one, the one from which all the others feed off, is of course interpersonal relationships. And I think it's useful to reflect on this as we move forward. Because again, when you go back to your environment, ask yourself, ask your team, what do you do to make a positive contribution to those interpersonal relationships. If you've got good interpersonal relationships, the likely performance of that team is enhanced. If you've got poor interpersonal relationships, well, then the reverse is possible. And they've looked at the effect of rude surgeons on anaesthetist performance in a simulator, and surprise, surprise, it impairs the anaesthetist performance. But I have no doubt it works the other way around. Rude anaesthetists impair surgeons' performance, and rude anybody impairs somebody else's performance. So our behaviour affects the way that our teams function. And you can do that in a positive, neutral, or negative fashion. So, reminding you of the error troika. How can you design systems that maximise that bit at the bottom and minimise the pressure at the pointy bit at the top? Well, first of all, you can look at systems such as pharmacology of some of the drugs we use. The drug on the left is an anesthetic agent and puts people to sleep. The drug on the right is an antibiotic and kills, blood, drug, uh, kills bugs. 
As you can see, they look very similar. And if they're stored in the same place, such as this, there is a significant risk that the wrong drug may be drawn up and injected. Doesn't just happen in anesthetics. MasterChef is a program that looks at improving the performance of chefs in cooking for the entertainment of the general population. This particular episode actually had professional chefs, not amateur chefs, on the program. And one of the chefs made a raspberry souffle, which you can see here looks absolutely beautiful. Unfortunately, when the testers came to taste it, they nearly vomited. What was the reason for that? Because the chef had put salt in the souffle instead of sugar. And if you rewind the tape, what you discover is that the salt and the sugar containers were right next to each other. And under the stress of performing in front of a live TV audience, even a professional chef can make a mistake. So look at a process in your work group. Ask yourself the question, does it work optimally? Could it work better? And how would you implement changes? And we certainly in the current environment with the pressure that our health service is under have had to do this on a sometimes daily basis, but certainly on a weekly basis. And we've got better at some things and other things not so much. Because what we're trying to do is improve situational awareness. I recently, sadly, couldn't find my cat anywhere. So we put up some posters. Next environment. And it's very important that in order to manage that environment, we use a variety of practical strategies. There are practical strategies that we can use to improve our performance. So an awareness of the hungry, angry, late, tired uh, acronym. Those are not recommendations, by the way. Those are recommendations to avoid those particular components. I think it's also important to be aware that your colleagues may be suffering from hungry, angry, late, tired. So if you have sufficient spare bandwidth, can you support them? Additionally, make better decisions. And the more you practice making these better decisions, the more likely you are to ensure that that decision is appropriate in the stress of the moment. And this model here is one of the ones that I teach routinely to encourage people to think about making decisions. But you need to do it in the cold light of day. You can't do it under the pressure of a hypoxic patient in a stressful environment. Sleep is probably the most important performance, performance enhancing agent we know. So maximize your sleep. If you've got difficult cases the next day, do your best to ensure that your sleep is optimized. Ban your phones from the bedroom. Look at strategies that will enable and ensure that your sleep is optimized so that when you wake up in the morning, you are in top physical condition. Also be aware of the nadirs of human performance. So the four o'clock in the afternoon, four o'clock in the morning, are times when we're definitely not at our best. Teach people stuff, and I'm grateful to my colleague Fiona Kelly for the Arachnid Education Tool, which looks at a variety of different components when you're talking about human factors and ergonomics. Uh, and you need to practice these because you can't practice them under pressure. Because what we're trying to do is to ensure that that working memory doesn't act as a bottleneck. We need to be aware of errors. We need to ensure that our stress is managed. We need to ensure ideally that our team are all in the same movie and our environment is optimized. So if we look at some of the factors that might have affected that case that I got you to imagine in the first few series of slides. Ideally, what you want is to ensure that your working memory is not overwhelmed. So what are the key inflexible things that have to be got right? to ensure that that airway is managed in as safe a, pa safe a way as possible and the patient's care is optimized. But then you need a lot of other information that you've dealt with in the cold light of day in your long-term memory, ergonomics, training, teamwork and interpersonal relationships, and awareness of the HALT acronym, 
optimizing your sleep, understanding that things like PPE dramatically decreases everybody's performance, communication, knowledge, stress management, optimal decision making. There's a lot of stuff in there. So thank you very much indeed for listening to me. I wish you all the best in your respective hospitals. It's been a very, very tough time and things at the moment aren't looking like getting a whole lot better. But what I'd like you to do when you go back to work or before you go back to work, I'd like you to write down three things you're going to do as a result of attending this session today. Not just my lecture, but this session. Many thanks and good luck. Thank you very much, Thank Mark. You, Mark. Very interesting session. Yes, go ahead, Binjit. Yeah, that's, uh, we'll just go on with the questions we've received with our audience. And uh, we have Mark, Krish, and Mary. Can we have you with your videos on? Any audio muted? Thank you. Should be on. Sorry. Thank you for. Thank you for the excellent talks and early morning. Good morning in UK. Okay. Uh, first questions for Krish. We'll go with the same order. Krish, uh, we've question, got a question. In the green pathways, how long will you wait between cases? And this varies considerably between various hospitals. What's your opinion on that? Yeah, I think uh, evidence. Uh, are you able to hear me, Gunji? Is the voice coming through? Yes, all good. All good. Good. Right. Okay. It all depends on whether the theater you're using has laminar flow or it doesn't have what kind of a room you're working in. And uh, initially, we were uh, waiting as long as 20 minutes. Uh, that was what uh, was based on research. Then as the pressure mounted, we are now stopping for about five minutes. Uh, that is the break we are giving between the cases, which is what you're doing. But if you look at uh, the aerosol that hangs around, according to research that I found was anything between 18, 8 to 14 minutes uh, is what they found was aerosol in that particular room. So I would recommend that the local practices should vary depending on what you actually facilities you have. And you should ideally give at least 15 minutes between the cases. Uh, if people do come in, they have to make sure that when you are extubating, you keep people out. So when I'm extubating a patient at the end of the case, I send everybody out except me and the ODP who stay there. And we make sure that there is somebody guarding the door so the surgeons don't walk in, which is often the case. They just walk in and walk out of the theater, keep them out. And then where I give my voice is loud and clear often and reaches distance. So I give a shout at the end of it and tell people to come in when it's ready. So keep a 15 minute gap, which is probably the safest for you to protect your own staff because you don't want them to catch the COVID and go off sick. You have to maintain, retain the staff. So that's my recommendation, 15 minutes, and then the staff come in. Ideally, they should have protection as well and uh, do the cleaning that is required of the area before the next patient is uh, brought in. We are suffering a gap of about 20 to 30 minutes between the cases at the moment. Thanks. I'll quickly move on to the next one. Uh, so HFNO is an AGP, but administering uh, nebulized humidified oxygen is not. How come? Nebulized humidified oxygen is not an aerosol? Yeah, because it is an outside, it's coming from outside source. So when you uh, administer something from outside source, it is largely sterile and it goes up, comes up, the nebulization occurs, goes through the nasal passages, larger. Say between cases, we are going to give 15 minutes. Okay. Let's do less cases and let's do them well and let's do them safely rather than trying to do one extra case and put four people at risk. Thank you, Chris. That's a really nice practice. And uh, 
Yeah, just to add, I mean, the, uh, taking from Mark's talk about human factors and the importance of uh, WHO team brief and communication at the beginning of the list so that the whole team is on the same page with the timing between cases and what pathway are you on and which patient is amber and which is green, because I think that leads to more delays because somebody's thinking five minutes and somebody's thinking 20 minutes and, and it's it's not a happy team. So I think that's the most important thing in the beginning to decide and everybody's together. Uh, I'll uh, ask a question to Dr. Mary that's come on the uh, chat. So they've asked, what is the incidence of aspiration in obstetric cases who do not receive uh, prophylaxis? Is there any comparison? Oh, I, I, I think that we don't have that figure, I'm afraid. Um, as you know, research in obstetrics is always a little bit behind any non-obstetric cases. But what I can tell you is that the incidence of aspiration in obstetrics in general has gone down. It's, it, the recent studies show that it's between 1 in 1,000 and 1 in 4,500. Okay. And 1 in 4,500, that was a UCOS study in the UK where they looked after a two-year study and look at all the cases of aspiration. So we say it's not high, but when it does happen, the morbidity can be quite serious. I think they had, if I remember correctly, they had six cases of aspiration of which one patient died, but they thought the other um, comorbidities might have contributed. One patient ended up on ECMO and then several patients ended up on ITU. So, you know, that's actually significant. So although it's low, if it does happen, it's significant, and we need to keep that in mind. Right. Thank you, Mary. Uh, another question that I'd like to ask you, and this is specific to India. We have rocuronium. A lot of people use rocuronium, but we don't You have sugamidex. So okay. And if, if we get it, there will be cost implications. Yes. So, uh, And I liked your um, you know, discussion about uh, between rocuronium and saxamethonium, and you said, you know, it's still, you know, it's still not uh, conclusive as to what, and you give the pros and cons for each. So in this kind of setting, would you say that we should still continue to use choline for uh, RSI in India? To be honest with you, I, I like rocuronium for the reasons that particularly the airway side of things. <clears throat> I know that um, I talked about anaphylaxis, but from the airway point of view, rocuronium gives you the best conditions but you have to use Sugamodex. If you think about it, if you give rocuronium one milligram per kilogram, cesarean sections take 30 minutes average. Well, you're not gonna reverse that with the neostigmin. You need uh, Sugamodex. So you have to have Sugamodex. And I will not use rocuronium as an RSI without having Sugamodex in that situation. So you have to have it. Right. Uh, I don't see any other questions uh, for Dr. I have a question for Mark. Yeah, go ahead. Mark. Hi, Mark. Well, Hi, guys. A lovely talk, <laughs> as, as, as always, every time. We've done so well in improving our uh, performance under pressure with our known teams and in known uh, conditions and circumstances. What is your tips for like unknown places, new teams, working with locums in private hospitals, how do we then get, we, we are still very behind with improving working with new teams under emergency situations. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think one of the points I made right at the beginning of this, uh, well, February, March, was that disasters are going to occur in my unit. And like Mary, I also work in a tertiary referral obstetric uh, anesthetic unit. Uh, problems are going to occur not because of our skills, but because people were starting to panic. People were starting to get tired. People was, were frightened, and we have a we try we, we have a handover every morning at sort of eight o'clock, eight thirty. And at that handover, one of the things that we talk about is the new members, so we introduce them, so we know who people are, and also we talk about the support that we have for each other. And I think the key there isn't, you know, there's a massive skill set. There's always people who can help you. You just have to ask or you just have to tell them that you're not, you're not, uh, you're not doing well. One of the things I encourage both myself and my colleagues to do is I carry small quantities of food in my backpack, usually little packets of chocolate chip cookies. And if I can see my colleagues are beginning to wilt, which is quite common actually at the moment because of the conflict between home, the fact that they're often homeschooling. Most of the people I work with are women and they're, they provide the primary care at home. Um, make them a cup of tea and give them a couple of chocolate chip cookies. And it does actually 
reframe that into personal relationship. It does mean that they they will do their best, the best that they can. Uh, and we've got a sort of, I suppose, a, an approach that what we're trying to do is to ensure that the patient is put firm first and foremost, but also that our colleagues are put first and foremost. And I think uh, it's been a really rough year. I'm sure you'd all agree. And I think uh, the only way we can look after each other is by looking after ourselves. Um, and when I'm having a good day, I'll help other people. When I'm having a bad day, they look after me. Yeah, thank you. I have a question. Thank you. For Mary, if I may ask. Uh, so, Mary, you touched on a very um, kind of controversial uh, area about symptomatic AV device for obstetrics. And you said we still need more robust evidence about patient selection. Nevertheless, in your experience, uh, which are the kind of cases you would want, you would say, you know, we could go up front with uh, using a supraglottic airway device? Um, I think if we did go down that way, it would have to be an elective cesarean section. Okay. Somebody low BMI with no known difficult airway and uh, probably no other sort of comorbidities. So you're really looking for the a really ASA one with no comorbidities. And I think... Um, most of our pregnant women having an elective cesarean section don't fall into that category, I'm afraid. <laughs> right. There's a shortage of those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for people in India who want to start using supraglottic airway devices for cesareans can maybe use this as a starting point. Yes. Uh, Dr. Mark, excellent presentation. I have a question for you. Um, you know, we're, we're focusing a lot on moving away from just uh, technical skills to enhancing the non-technical skills in our trainees. And there's a lot outlined in theory, you know, about um, reducing the cognitive overload and fixation errors. And it, it's all very beautifully outlined. But can you give us some uh, practical tips as to how we could improve, um, you know, um, uh, human factor training uh, in our uh, departments with our trainees? I mean, what are the methods that you use and how can we enhance this? I think it's a really good question. I think, you know, the issue isn't for me around technical skills and non-technical skills. It's the issue around performance, which means you've got to do both. So whenever I teach skills, yeah. I teach them both. I, I teach, I break down the skill initially with a novice to make sure that they have the understanding of what they actually have to do, how to put a spinal in, how to set up a spinal tray, for example. But then on top of that, and you can do this easily uh, at a desk, you don't even have to have a simulator, is, is to start increasing the stress. So you can play with things like uh, you can get these sort of monitors on, a, on an, an iPad and you can give a patient, a, a, give a trainee a deteriorating uh, clinical picture and then see, and you can start to discuss what they do. I think Mary gave a brilliant example of, of two of the key things that I think that we underestimate. One is the planning for when things don't work. And I think the other, which is very, very much underestimated, is, is how we make decisions. And I think for me, I, when I look at airway disasters, when I look at anaesthetic, obstetric disasters, I would say probably 70, 80% of them are caused because somebody makes the wrong decision, not because they don't have the right skills. And you can teach people that. So, you know, and, and we do. And I think um, I, I've got lots of stuff on this I can send if people are interested, but I think um, for me, it's, 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 it's don't just look at it as non-technical. Don't just look at it as technical. Look at it as what's, what, how do I do what I do to the best of my ability? Right. So you would combine the training with both because a lot of people need think that you need simulation-based training. And so you're saying you could just do it around the patient and just increase the level of stress and, you know, use other, uh, you know, devices like an iPad or create scenarios uh, at the yeah. uh, patient end. Yeah. Uh, uh, as I say, and you know, there are lots of things that you can practice away from a patient and probably should practice away from a patient because practicing with front of the patient would scare the hell out of them. Thank you. And me probably. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. And thanks, Mary, and thanks, Krish. Excellent discussion. And thank you. We will hand over back to the organizers. Um, Sorry for overrunning. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, what a wonderful session. And uh, we sincerely wish we could have extended the discussion time for another half an hour, but unfortunately we can't. Uh, for the next session, I would like to invite the chairpersons, Professor Cyprian Mendonca. Uh, he is one of my uh, mentors uh, since my training days. And he's a consultant at uh, uh, University Hospital Coventry in Warwickshire and uh, honorary professor of University of Warwick. 
is uh, also the co-author for DAS 2015 guidelines, and he has authored several books, chapters, and articles. And he runs several courses focusing on error management and human factors. And we got Dr. Sajid Kumar, who is a colleague of mine at the University Hospital Birmingham, and he is the lead thoracic anesthetist here. And he's involved in several uh, organizations, several courses, including uh, his regular update sessions on thoracic anesthesia in, at the Association of Anesthetists. Uh, over to you both. Okay, um, thank you, Sajay, Sajay, Elizabeth, and Sam for your kind invitation. And it's a great conference and uh, excellent organizing this conference. I welcome our guests to our session six. Uh, in this session, we have three excellent talks from three expert speakers from Switzerland, Ireland, and Netherlands. It's a great pleasure to introduce our first speaker. It's a Professor Patrick Schottke from University Hospital Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, he has great research interest in pre-hospital airway management, video laryngoscopy, and monitoring. He has invented several airway devices and intubation aids, um, and I see his great interest in using advanced technology in wireless monitoring and so on, and he's published uh, numerous highly cited papers in, on airway management. And let us now try to understand how one plus one is equal to three in video laryngoscopy. Over to you, Patrick. Well, thank you. I think now there is a recording of my talk, which I'm grateful to share. I'm happy to take some questions afterwards. Thank you. Hello everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to talk you to talk to you about the video laryngoscopy and why I think as a Swiss doctor that one plus one equals three. My name is Patrick Schrepter. I'm a professor of anesthesia here at the University Hospital of Lausanne in Switzerland and a longtime user of this device called the video laryngoscopy. And if I could summarize my talk, it's a, just a talk about the new mathematics of intubation and how these devices have massively changed our approach to this common tool that we do have, which is the intubation. We have been using this fantastic device that has been invented by a fantastic man in 1943. And this device has been extensively published, not only because at the beginning Macintosh had seen somebody using it, not only because he had actually gathered some experience that there might be some reasons why this device is so great. He made some interesting findings and discoveries about specifics, especially demonstrating that the specifics are not that important. And most of all, what I like the most about that paper is he even gave you some advice where you could buy it. Jokes apart, this device is, has been fantastic, has been used for a long time, and has generated a huge array of worldwide specialists of airway management, the experts of intubation who have become experts in understanding what they've been seeing through this little keyhole, but they've also become experts in teaching the airway management by looking over the shoulders of their juniors trying to understand what their juniors were seeing, trying to understand what their juniors were telling them, and trying to find solutions to manage the difficult airway with this device. We come from a world of direct laryngoscopy, where we use this device to pull the tongue away from our site of view to generate a classification. And the interesting thing is there are some close correlations theoretically between what you see but between the cormac lehane classification and the ease of intubation. Now, many papers, and I especially want to highlight this NAP4 study that demonstrates that although we have been using these devices for a long time, the area management is still an issue of concern. And depending on where we are and who we are, there are some key factors that play a big role. Of course, the patient, the, the complex for the patient, the more difficult the intubation can be related to, but of course, the judgments, the own physician's judgments and the team. 
the team. And when I talk about team, evidently you talk about the communication, you bring the information across the existing people who are next to you and are there to help you intubate patients. And of course, education and training. This is true for the anesthesia world, but this is even more true for intensive care and emergency departments. And you can see here the contributory factors, communication, education and training and judgments are one or a few of the main issues that have been highlighted by this great study. If you want to summarize it, direct laryngoscopy is a tool, has been demonstrated useful, but there is the expert and then there is the rest. And depending on the balance of competencies, it can be one bigger than one or one smaller than one, but never or very seldom do the addition to bring this magic number one plus one equals three. As ever in the world, there have been some fantastic love stories, and I want to relate to you about a love story that happened around 2001, two or three, a love story between the direct laryngoscope and the techniques of fibroscopy. These fantastic meetings have given birth to many children. Many children that can be related to with their angoscopy, and each child is as beautiful or even better as the one before. The first child that had been coming out in the market was evidently the glidoscope in 2001. For us anesthetists, it's also interesting to remember that this device had actually been put into life by a surgeon, a vascular surgeon. This could be also something we should remember when we use this device that we can take part in the development of new solution. The indirect laryngoscopes have given us some way of thinking that we need to change the attitude towards tracheal intubation, that we need to go from the direct way we do it to the indirect way, which allows us to position a camera with a specifically designed blade in an anatomy, and that allows us to look around the corner with the hyperangulated with the laryngoscope on a screen which is sitting next to the device. And nowadays in 2021, we still have the two techniques, the direct laryngoscopy, where if you see the larynx, the intubation is okay. If you don't see it, it will be difficult. And the indirect laryngoscopy, where you leave the anatomy as it is, you look around the tongue and you share the view with the whole department or with your whole people who are around you. And by sharing the view, you bring the national, the competencies of your surroundings to your help that might increase or improve the way you will manage the airway. There are some specifics. You need to understand the angle, the three-dimensional anatomy that you see on a two-dimensional screen. You need to understand the trajectory that the tube will have to do to reach a tracheal inlet. And of course, you need for that a hand-eye coordination. To make the things even a bit more complex, at least it looks like, but it's very simple. There are two specific techniques to the video laryngoscopy, the channels and the non-channels. And to go even deeper in the dichotomy, if you use a non-channel, you can use a Macintosh type blade or you can use a hyperangulated blade, each of them designing some specifics related to the way you manage the intubation. Aim and tube. If you have a video angoscope with a channel, the tube will go where the channel leads him to, show and play. And evidently, the success rate will be dependent on your understanding, on using the proper device for the proper anatomy. And this will allow you to use the aim and tube technique or the show and play, depending on your understanding of the anatomy of the patient you need to take care of. Here, a little example of a properly used device in anatomy, which is perfectly fine for the channel type intubation. You have a beautiful alignment. And if you push the tube into the trachea, you will see that the channel will bring the tube where it needs to go. Now, if you have, this is the picture of a normal anatomy. If you have now an anterior line tracheal inlet, you can easily understand that the channel technique will not allow you to bring the tube in an anterior way. And this is where you need to bring the movement of the tube. And this allows us all, for you or also for all of you who watch over the shoulder on the screen of the intubating doctor, that the intubation is a three-step process. First of all, you need to have a look. You need to see laryngeal sighting. Then you need to bring the tube in front of the glottic opening. And then you need to bring the tube 
inside the trachea, the inlet, through the thing. And here you can see and you can share the view on this patient who has an anterior lying tracheal inlet, you will see that the tube, it, the view, the first laryngeal sighting is easy to see. Second, bring the tube in front of the laryngeal inlet, fairly easy. And then look at the anatomy, look at the trajectory of the tube when it goes through the anatomy of the specifically anterior lying tracheal inlet. You see how the tube moves up over the tracheal inlet inside the trachea. By looking, by sharing this, you will bring the team next to you by sharing the view. You can demonstrate, and this is where I come up to the one plus one equals three. This is an interesting situation. Again, interline tracheal inlet, somebody using the tube and the stylet. You see the stylet within the tube being slowly retracted, and it looks like it's going to be a difficult intubation because the tube cannot be thrown in into the tracheal inlet. And here comes the one plus one equals three. The teacher sees what the student is doing. The teacher is teaching. And now the teacher is taking over. Just to demonstrate that by properly handling tube and stylet, you will bring the tube in the anatomy and allow the proper intubation through the specific anatomy. By sharing the knowledge, you improve evidently the performance of your students and you might have some quieter nights at night when you're home and the student or the resident is intubating the patient because he has seen, he has heard, he has taken part into this intubation that you are able to share your own knowledge with the screen of the tracheal intubation. Here is an interesting movie where I am supposed to be the expert. I'm teaching the young residents how to handle the video laryngoscope with a screen. Here you see he's not looking over my shoulder. He's just looking on the screen. I'm explaining him what I will do. And look at how difficult for me it is to bring the tube in sight. And you will see the hand of the student say, hey, doc, you should be doing this. Here, put this. And thanks to his help. I'm able to manage the goal of properly positioning the tube in front of the tracheal inlet to intubate. I think what videolaryngoscopy has taught us, and this is where I'm going to come towards the one plus one equals three, that what we want to reach is success. To be able to succeed, you need some specific skills. Evidently, you need hard skills. You need to understand the device you have in front of you. You need to have the understanding of the patient you have in front of you. But you also must pay attention to the team you have with you. And this is where the soft skills come into play. The usage of indirect or video laryngoscopy has dramatically changed the way we use air, we, we manage airways. Here at the study we did in-house a couple of years ago, we tried to assess the effect of our airway management, the difficult airway management in our institution, just by the only thing that we introduced to video laryngoscopes. You can see in red the techniques we use after the introduction of these devices. And you see that in red, the number of patients we used, we intubated with the help of a laryngoscope dramatically decreased, same with the fibroscope or some other devices. So we need, there is a change of practice, there's a change of skills. We need to learn some new skills, some hard skills, but the hard skills are only part of the success. We need to be able to understand what are, are the specifics to each device, what are the good and bad signs, and what you can bring to your patients with these specific devices. Changes of practice introduced by the usage of vidroangoscope, you see, Patients with a broke with a C spine connection, C spine collar on that immobilates the, the uh, generates a difficult airway because you can't move the neck. You have a small mouth opening. We were able to intubate all of these patients with a laryngoscope by somebody who knows how to do it. We changed the practice in the airway management of patients with an unstable cervical spine fracture using the Goldstone fibroscope. Comparing it to the newly way without bringing in I, I took what it. What we also learned is that it's more. not only her skills, but there might be human factors that play a role. There's experience, the location, specific relation related to the patients, equipment, and time pressure. And this is where we're coming towards that we were able to discover 
or at least was reinforced by the usage of sharing device using devices that allow you to share the view is that the soft skills are big component of part of success. And I specifically liked this editorial published recently about non-technical skills and human factors is or are probably the most radical changes to our clinical practice to the airway management. And this should not be underestimated. I think, and this is my proper de de belief, one plus one equal three by allowing everybody to share the view, to have a look at what you see, to demonstrate you improve the proper area management and you improve the management for the patients, you improve the teaching, you improve the quality, and this is the way to go forward. What I like as an airway provider, the VL has made airway management fun. And I specifically insist on management. Management is a team approach, and this is what we are able to do, deliver now daily with the use of the video laryngoscopes. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any more questions. Thanks. Thank you, Patrick. Um, you very clearly demonstrated us how one plus one is equal to three in video laryngoscopy. Uh, we'll take some questions after the third talk. Uh, now, it's a great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, is Professor Ellen O'Sullivan. She is a consultant anesthetist at St. James Hospital, Dublin. She's been involved with Difficult Airway Society since its foundation, and she's a DAS professor. She has held numerous posts and roles in various specialist societies and councils in UK, Ireland, including she's been the past president of DAS. She's president, past president of the College of Anesthetists Ireland, and been the vice president in the past, she's been vice president of Association of Anesthetists. She is currently the council member of Royal College of Anesthetists. She has co-authored several airway guidelines and published numerous papers and chapters in the book. And currently she is working on ASA difficult airway guidelines and also on um, the project for management of universal airway guides and guidelines. Over to you, Ellen. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and to the Airway Society Kochi and to Elizabeth Sam and Sanjay for the invitation to speak at your meeting. I'm going to talk today about superglottic airway devices um, and their role in COVID times. Now, firstly, I'd like to bring to your attention this fantastic resource. Um, it's the it's COVID Hub. Um, and it was started in early March by the Royal College of Anaesthetists, the Association of Anaesthetists, the Intensive Care Society and the Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine as a resource with information guidance to support the understanding and management of COVID. You can download um, it on, this is, the, this is the website, and in it you'll get lots of um, useful information. One of the first um, publications in that um, resource are the airway guidelines produced by the Difficult Airway Society in conjunction with the Association of it is the Royal College and the Intensive Care Group. And um, again, very useful. And I won't go through all those guidelines, but I will just see uh, and particularly concentrate on superglottic airway devices. And did the hub have any information on that? They obviously um, commented that the use of superglottics during the COVID pandemic um, didn't have much evidence base, but they recommended that if an SGA is used, it should be a second generation and that scrupulous attention should be paid to ensuring a leak-free seal. This is very important. Now, some other groups and um, societies have guidelines. This is a consensus statement from the Safe Airway Society in Australia. Again, confirming also that if you use a superglottic, it should be a second generation device as it's higher seal pressure during positive pressure ventilation decreases the risk of aerosolization and virus containing fluid particles. We all know the advantages of a superglottic airway over tracheal tube, the, the fact that they're faster and easier to insert, 
There is lower anesthetic needs to tolerate the airway, less hemodynamic changes at insertion and removal, less coughing and better sats on extubation, and less sore throat. So potentially there are advantages using supraglottic airway devices in COVID um, because of the smoother induction, obviously less coughing as a result, the reduced need for relaxants, smoother and safer um, extubation and fewer pharyngolaryngeal complications. Um, so let's just look at, um, first of all, our classic LMA as, dis uh, as designed by Archie Brain and came into clinical use in the, in the 19, late 1980s. I think we owe a, a debt of gratitude to, to Artie and his friend, Shania Vergesi, for their, their brilliance um, in bringing this um, into the market. And also, I mean, he, um, Archie's um, imp stressing of the importance of proper positioning. And this is a soft tissue view of a correctly placed LMA lying between the hyoid bone here and the uh, and, and T1. And he was always insistent on its on, on the proper positioning. And this is CT scans taken whilst in cadavers during the work he was doing. And again, you'll see the cough of the laryngeal mass between the hyoid and um, over the tracheal inlet with the tip conforming to the anatomy of the hypopharynx and, and plugging the upper esophageal sphincter. Um, a lot of work was done in the meantime then following the classic LMA to produce the ProSeal in, and launch it in 2000. This was the first double lumen LMA with airway and gastric access, a second seal and increasing sealing pressure. So in our armamentarium at the moment, we have a plethora of first-generation superglottics, all quite similar to the classic, some disposable um, and, and some um, with slightly different features. But the second generation, um, we have an, a number on the market as well, like the iGel, the Supreme, the Protector and, and um, the ProSeal, etc., so what do we mean by second generation superglottic device? We mean one that is designed with features to reduce the risk of aspiration. So you will have a drain tube to, to separate the respiratory in green here, the respiratory tract and the gastrointestinal tract in yellow here. And they have by definition a higher oropharyngeal leak pressure compared with first generation superglottic airway devices. Now this is important because it is the pressure that breaks the seal between the supraglottic airway cuff and the pericuff mucosa. It's often used as um, a surrogate measure of correct device positioning with greater than 25 centimetres of water recommended. And the cough manometers have been, um, have been designed to allow adjustment of the intra-cough pressure to 40 to 60 centimetres of water and eliminate under or over inflation if, if um, this is a problem. Now, I talk about the seal. So the first seal is the nice seal over the tracheal inlet, with the second seal then with the longer tip of the second generation superglottic device sealed quite nicely into the upper esophageal sphincter. So all second generations, by definition, have gastric, as I said, access and a second seal. So there are quite a few of them there. So which should we use? Um, as I said, um, again, um, there's a lack of evidence. But, uh, and again, stressing that the correct positioning is, is really what matters. And most important advantage of the second generation superglottics is that their ability to, your, your ability, sorry, to check the correct positioning of them in the patients. If the cough is intratracheal, you will find that you've got a negative, um, sorry, a positive bubble test. In other words, when you put gel on the gastric outlet, you will get bubbling because of the position of the tip intratracheally. Equally, if you have not placed it in far enough, if you're in the hypopharynx, the bubble test will also be positive. So this is a nice early indicator that you must replace um, and uh, um, improve your position. So I, I, I look for five steps. One is the depth of insertion should be more than 50% of the bite block. And most second generation superglottic airway devices have bite blocks. The gel test, as I said, the bubble test um, should be negative. You can use the supersternal notch tap test as well. And you might um, use, put a gastric, use a gastric tube in and you should get free passage of the tube. I would not use that routinely. And a seal pressure greater than 25 centimeters of water. 
And how do I know it's positioned properly? Because of the five, you can do some of the five step position testing, but you should get effective gas exchange as well with good cap and graph trace and SO2 and um, adequate airway pressure. So perfect alignment, you should have the tip of the epiglottis aligning with the proximal cuff of your superglottic airway, as you can see with that eye gel, with the supreme and with the proceed. The biggest channel, in fact, channel with SGAs is positioning them properly. And we know that about 50 to 80 percent, you got a failed positioning, although they can function um, adequately, but may, maybe not in critical patients. So here we have um, it, it, it placed correctly below that. We have it, it, it positioned um, intricately and then we get down folding as well of the cuff of the supergotic airway device. And to ensure to improve positioning and jaw lift or thrust is very useful. And in fact, I use it relatively frequently to lift the epiglottic structures so that you can place your cough, as I say, in, in that correct position. So looking at um, which superglottic of the many that are out there should be used, I'll just bring you back to the this um, editorial, in fact, which was written by Tim Cook and Fiona and Kelly, and they looked at functioning of, of all LMAs, including the classic LMAs of first generation and the second generation. They looked at um, ILMA, Proceal, IGEL, Supreme and Laryngeal Tube to see how they functioned. In other words, successful insertion, speed of insertion, quality of ventilation, whether they give a good airway seal or not if there's any protection from aspiration, avoiding airway trauma and so forth. And they summated these various features in an arbitrary sort of way, but just showing that the Proceed and the IGEL and the Supreme function more uh, effectively for all these um, functions than the classic LMA and in fact the laryngeal tube as well. So they made the um, point that we should abandon the vintage LMA and adopt second generation superglottic airway devices as first choice. And I think that that, that is happening. Now, are superglottics classified as airway gen, um, generating procedures? Um, the um, COVID-19 has resulted, as you know, in, a prop, in um, the promulgation of a list of medical procedures referred to as AGPs or aerosol generating procedures. And there's a list of PPE which drives the appropriate level of PPE donned by healthcare workers, especially for AGPs. And what I think what, what is characterizing as uh, an AGP? Well, we're all familiar with this. I think intubation, extubation, front of neck airway, awake tracheal intubation, tracheostomy, bronchoscopy, high flow nasal oxygen, non invasive ventilation, face mask ventilation, and suction. But there's no guidance, um, there was no guidance on whether SGA use. Um, is an AGP or not. And if it is an AGP, you would wear airborne level PPE. Now, maybe SGA insertion, um, which involves operator inserting perhaps fingers into the oral cavity, a period of PPV, usually with an ensuing leak, has the potential for contamination via droplet, fomite, and aerosol roots. Maybe the process of insertion of, a G, of an SGA is an AGP. And um, in that situation, obviously, we should use the appropriate um, airborne precautions, which includes your FFP3 um, or N95 mask. Um, so now, looking at COVID guidance and airway rescue, um, we look at the guidelines published by DAS and following um, your three attempts at plan A at intubation, if that fails, you move on to plan B, C, and that's your rescue oxygenation where you try face mask and insertion of second generation superglottic airway device again, like the DAS guidelines of 2015, second generation superglottic airways are, um, are mentioned. And if you succeed with your second generation superglottic and your oxygenation is okay, your options are to wait the patient if planned, perhaps not, maybe not also, and particularly not if it's a COVID patient, you can have an, can have an attempt at intubating via the superglottic airway and or you may go to front of neck airway. And it is recommended that the aim tree intubation catheter is used. Now, um, I did some work on this originally in 1996 with... Um, Peter Charter, as you can see here, and myself at Aintree Hospital. And we devised this 
this ventilation exchange bougie for fiber optic intubations with laryngeal mask airway, and eventually we called it the Intrigue catheter. It's a 19 French gate, French. Um, radio peak catheter with an internal diameter of 4.7 millimetres. It's 56 centimetres long and markings at 5 to 35 centimetres. It comes with two um, connectors. One is a 50 millimetre connector and the other is a lure lock connector. And it has a swivel adapter which allows you to seal it while you're doing the procedure so you can oxygen it the whole time. And side holes here for jetting if needed. You can load it on a fibroscope less than 4.2 millimetres. So any standard intubating scope of 3.8 millimetres or the Ambu Slim Grey Scope, um, which is disposable, which can be useful, like particularly in an emergency. So here you see the, um, this patient who has, in fact, been done under local anaesthetic because he's an anticipated difficult airway. He's Burns patient with this done a no number of occasions as um, and we did a series of burns patients in placing an LMA in the patient and then intubating with the fiber optic scope uh, with the entry mounted via the supraglottic airway device. And again, it's an easy procedure because you, when you come out of the supraglottic, you should be sit, sit straight in front of the larynx, particularly if you've optimally placed your supraglottic airway device. You can do this, in fact, with any supraglottic, but preferably a second ge generation and here you see the patient then we spray it as you go and you railroad your endotracheal tube here, reinforced malincroft reinforced tube over your entry catheter. Now, which second generation should you use for airway rescue? I said you can use second generation, but really um, the ones that have been shown uh, in the literature to be and clinically to be more effective are the, um, the post-seal, is the eye gel and the protector, but not the LMA Supreme or the laryngeal tube. Um, so, in fact, these are the um, two or three supraglottic, secondary supraglottic airways which we use. And this is the plan B in our hospital where we have uh, the um, ambuscope with the, with the eye gel and the entry always ready to go as our plan B in our difficult airway trolley. And this is something as well you can practice with the trainees electively. So when it comes to an emergency, it's something they can perform. Again, just to stress, blind intubation um, via supraglottics is not recommended in this situation as the first go success has been shown to be very poor and um, when intubating with fibre optic um, through the, the second generation supraglottic airway device, the first go success improved dramatically. This is work done by um, Robert um, Greif in, in uh, Switzerland. So again, which of them, um, just looking at this schematic, which was designed by Tim Cook and Fiona Kelly, which sch schematic came, came out best, um, which, which supraglottic came out best. And again, the ProSeal and the iGel, um, much higher success with regard to even blind or guided intubation through them with the Supreme and the L laryngeal tube, um, not, not, not as useful uh, or the classic LME. So in summary, intubation via supraglottic airway device um, it's recommended that you always use fiber optic guidance and blind techniques are actively discour discouraged. The ProSeal and the eye gel um, are described as the most successful to use with the entry intubation catheter. Supreme is not recommended and the classic LMA and um, little evidence. So what happens if you decide following your rescue oxygenation that um, things are a bit um, you still want to go ahead with a, a front of neck airway because the patient perhaps is, is, is deteriorating. Um, so what do, you, what do you use then? Again, as I say, you might have, you have your supraglottic in, in place. And this was a recent paper which was done by um, Conan McCall in, an, in a gynae population, prospective observational study looking at the accuracy of the crack of the member identification in adult females um, in, in, in this group and showing that there was very much increased accuracy of locating a crack of the membrane when you were supraglottic in place oxygenating while you're doing um, your, your identification. So this might translate to better success at your front of neck, your, your um, surgical crack of if you already have a, 
the eye gel in situ, splinting your cricothyroid and also um, helping to identify, to identify the membrane. So important questions when choosing a supraglottic airway device are which ones are easiest to insert, which ones have the highest oropharyngeal leak pressure, which ones can you intubate through, and obviously there's always this cost-benefit dis um, discussion as well. So um, we must also remember that in the COVID area, we must make the procedure safe for the staff, for the um, operators and for those around them, safe for the staff and the patients. So lots of people started to discuss these intubation boxes and, and, and many of them came to, 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 to market and um, there was a lot of research done on those. Um, but also then came papers showing that, um, in fact, rather than being protective, the aerosol block resulted in marked increase in airborne particle exposure compared to other devices or with no device. And conclusions that the novel devices intended to protect the laryngoscopist require objective testing to ensure they are fit for purpose and do not result, in fact, in increased airborne particle exposure. And... Overall, I think with the many studies that have come out in the last year, the most show that they confer minimal to no benefit in containing aerosols during ADP and may in fact increase um, particle exposure. Um, also, this New England Journal correspondence um, implied that they decrease rather than increase safety. So I think many of us have... Um, abandoned um, using any of these sort of, of devices. There's also some um, MacGyver, I call them, um, MacGyver devices like homemade attempts to kind of, um, in fact, improve safety, but perhaps a bit misconstrued. And this was a technique in looking at, at a closed tank probe cover for um, intubating with an atrial catheter through a supraglottic airway device. Um, we do, in fact, um, in COVID patients, use a plastic sheet around the supraglottic airway device and then um, change over to a face mask in, in the recovery just under the sheet and then dispose of it with the sheet. Um, so I think in, in summary, supraglottics and COVID, it's, it's about SAS, which um, is the um, mantra of the, the DAS COVID area management. It's keeping it safe for staff and patients. Um, using techniques that are reliable, familiar, and um, that you have practiced. So getting the superglottic placed accurately um, on first attempt and making sure you have a good seal. And it's about techniques that are timely without rush or delay. So thank you very much for your attention. I will take any questions you might have. Uh, thank you, Alan, for your excellent talk. Um, you uh, enlightened us uh, the importance of second generation supraglottic airway devices and also for emphasizing the correct placement of supraglottic airway devices. We'll take the questions a bit later. Uh, now it is great pleasure to introduce our final speaker of this session, that is Dr. Hans Hutnik from Amsterdam. He has worked at various um, centers in Melbourne and Amsterdam including Netherlands Cancer Institute. Uh, his interests include advanced airway management, neuroanesthesia, and high fidelity simulation. He is highly involved in teaching airway skills. He is the founder and director of Airway Management Academy and member of International Advisory Board for Anesthesia Journal. He has published numerous papers and co-authored books in, in relevant to airway management. Now let us hear about situational difficult airway. Over to you, Hans. No network Leuken. <laughs> Hi all, this is uh, Hans Huytink. I'm an uh, anesthesiologist. Uh, I'm based and working in the Netherlands. It's an honor for me to speak to you and um, thank you for inviting me. I would like to talk to you about the situationally difficult airway. First, let me tell you that there are no conflicts of interest. I'm speaking to you on behalf of the Airway Management Academy. And there is a bit of a conflict of interest with these two fellows. They're sharing the same living room with me at the moment. And I hope they, uh, they will keep their peace during the uh, presentation of my lecture. We'll see how it, how it goes. 
How about other learning goals? Uh, I would like to present some airway cases to you. And I hope you can learn how to manage airways under situationally difficult circumstances. If we talk about situationally difficult airways, it may be caused by poor patient positioning, uh, there may be lack of proper equipment, uh, there may be limited backup. If you work pre hospitally like we do in the, air, in, the, in the ambulance during the COVID area, transporting patients from the one ICU to the other, uh, and managing airways may be a real challenge. Let me take it to Bonaire. I was privileged to work there 10 years ago for a couple of months. It's an island based uh, close to South America. There are uh, 15,000 uh, people living on the island. And um, sometimes big ships are uh, coming to port. And every time these, these large cruising vessels come to port, there were some little surprises for us because many tourists are old and they travel on boats. And uh, we had three or four patients uh, who were brought to our hospital to, uh, to be managed. And they were really, really sick because these uh, ships are rather good equipped. At that time, 10 years ago, uh, we worked with two anesthetists, one nurse anesthetist, one surgeon, one gynecologist. A cardiologist was visiting every 14 days. There were some general practitioners, but no emergency physicians. As you can see, this is a tropical setting, only 36 beds, one operating room, no intensive care unit. At that time, no CT scan, uh, one ventilator, uh, no flexible scope, and no ENT surgeon. Uh, beautiful diving, uh, by the way, as you can see. We had to manage uh, very small patients. They were then manufactured with a small plane to, uh, to, the, to the other islands, Curacao and uh, Aruba. Sometimes we had to uh, intubate patients, and because there was no ICU, we had to transport them uh, this way to Aruba or to South America. And this is the uh, entrance to the emergency bay. This is the equipment we had to work with. And as you can see, uh, accidents can happen. It's, uh, it's a small island, so uh, it's rare. And, uh, it's, uh, the incidence of, uh, of accidents is not, not, not very high. But uh, sometimes uh, people crash the cars or the bikes. They don't wear helmets, they drink while driving, so you may end up with uh, severe uh, injuries. And diving is, uh, is very big, and Bonaire is beautiful, and you can enter the water really easily, and you can exit the water really easily. And that was what this patient tried to do. We were called to a guy who was snorkeling on Little Bonaire, which is a small island close to Bonaire, and uh, it's only accessible by boat. And we had to go there for a rest station. And we had to intubate this guy on the beach. And this is the problem we had. We did not have a video laryngoscope. We used a normal laryngoscope, a direct laryngoscope. But the, the sunlight was so bright and it was so, uh, the sun uh, rays were reflecting on the white beach and on the sand that you have really big problems seeing your equipment. So this may be a very challenging airway in a situation in a difficult airway because of the sun. Is it difficult? Yes, it may be really difficult. Is it a difficult airway? Not sure, but the situation where you work um, is, is really difficult and challenging. I would like to present a new way of defining airways to you. I rather like to speak about basic airways or advanced airways. And you can uh, define a basic airway uh, this way, it can be managed with basic techniques by a trained person, and the airway rescue is most properly possible. In contrast, an advanced airway may require techniques that are not often used, and these patients should be managed by a team that has special skills and access to special airway devices. I think most of our patients have basic airways, maybe 10% or so have advanced airways, depending on where you work. And in these cases, it's really, really important to find complexity factors. Complexity factors <clears throat> and the context determine what kind of help may be needed during airway management and what kind of equipment can be brought or what kind of technique can be used. And complexity factors can be found during a special checklist. 
This is the way you can do airway assessments. Do airway triage, you use the face checklist, patient factors, but also human factors, for example. You can triage your airways into basic or advanced, and if you have an advanced airway, find complexity factors. Uh, complexity factors may be, for example, time pressure. If the blood pressure is low or if saturation is dropping really fast, you may end up with an easy to manage airway, but because of the time pressure, it may be really advanced. So complexity factors are key. We've described this in, um, in an article in Anesthesia, it's called The Myth of the Difficult Airway, so you can, you can read it. You can also download the Airway Triage app which uh, can be uh, downloaded on your phone. And uh, you can find out for yourself if this is a helpful uh, technique to, uh, to triage airways. In these advanced cases with complexity, it is necessary to personalize airway management. It may no longer be possible to use guidelines or protocols because the complexity is too high. And I would like to present you some examples of these airway cases. This is a guy who was intubated in Bonnell it's uh, a guy who uh, uh, had a cardiac arrest and then uh, he needed intensive care units uh, in intensive care, uh, special treatment, but there was not available in Bonaire. So we had to fly him to Colombia. The thing is, this, this guy had never traveled before. So we had to improvise and um, you can see his airway on this passport. I've never seen it before. Uh, we had to call in a photographer. They made a passport and then we were able to to call in an air ambulance team from uh, from Colombia to travel uh, to Bonaire and uh, uh, get this guy to a, a decent hospital. What are situations with airways? airways? Uh, can be caused by location, by the environment, or it can be caused by the patient uh, uh, self. Uh, let's look at location. You may work pre-hospitally, end up an environment where you have to care for diving uh, victims or uh, you, you may work on an air, air ambulance or uh, you, you may work out of theater. And uh, if you work out of theater, you will notice that the normal equipment may not be uh, readily available, help may not be available. So even an out of theater uh, location in your own hospital may cause a situation different that way, but things are different. Let's look at an unusual situation that happened in Amsterdam. It was a case of flooding in, and there are no uh, uh, big lakes or uh, very big rivers and close to this, this, this hospital, the VU University Medical Center where I worked at that time. What happened, there was a breakage of a water pipe. So within an hour, the basement of the hospital was flooded and all patients of the hospital had to be evacuated. You can see the, the, the level of water because this guy is sitting on top of his truck. <clears throat> we had to work uh, clinically and evacuate all these patients uh, within a day. And the military was, were called and many uh, ambulances were called and all uh, patients were transported to different hospitals. We had to manage airways under really situational difficult situations. Um, is it unusual to end up with a situation that will their way? I think it is not. Because if you think about your own career and all your patients you care for, the situation may be sometimes really challenging. This is another example. This is a girl, eight-year-old. She had uh, Down syndrome and she was presented with an unstable uh, neck. And what the neurosurgeons tried to do was to uh, exchange the hello frame for a, a cast. And what we had to do is sit the patient right up on the operating table. We had to intubate her. And then they were working for 19 minutes to make a cast. And as you can see, this is a rather <coughs> a strange situation because she's not lying on the table. She had to sit her up. We had to intubate her or put in an LMA um, while she was wearing a hello frame. And I think in these situations, preparation is key. So preparation is key is of key importance when the situation is difficult because you have to be prepared. The, the size LMA is, is, uh, is also is of importance in these patients because she has uh, is eight years old 
and you can use adult equipment, uh, pediatric equipment may be available, but maybe not, not be the right size. You have to determine the size and the flexible scope, see if your tracheal tube fits the LMA and if you can intubate through the LMA. So we had to figure it out before we started. And what happened, we started with LMA, she was spontaneous in breathing, and because the, the, the procedure was taking 90 minutes and we had to sit her up, we decided during the procedure to intubate her the tracheal tube through the LMA, which was uh, uneventful, but we, we were prepared. And this is how it looks like. You can see the, the tracheal tube was uh, introduced through the LMA. In this way, she, uh, we, we were uh, uh, able to manage her airway very safely. If you work pre hospitally for example, in a helicopter emergency medical service, you may end up with a, a situational difficult airway. We were called to uh, a baby, 26 weeks old, very premature. It was a home birth and the paramedics uh, called, uh, called for help because they could not intubate and only back mask ventilate. As you can see, the baby is placed in a plastic bag for temperature control and um, a rendezvous was, uh, was done uh, with the ambulance and the helicopter. And this baby was intubated in, in the back of the ambulance and it was really, really difficult because it was blue, premature, there was no saturation uh, measurements. Um, there were no um, uh, breath sounds because of very stiff lungs. Uh, it was difficult to detect the heart rate and we used uh, defibrillator pits uh, to get that and uh, there was no IV access. So you may end up in a, in a situation with a patient with a difficult airway um, and uh, it's, it's, it can be very challenging. It's a good example of a situation in difficult airway. So I think you can conclude that the situation of difficult airway may be common. And so better be prepared. How can you prepare for these airways? I think the best way to, to do this is, is train as a team and uh, use simulation. So if you simulate if you, uh, a situation in difficult airway, you, you know you can, you can manage these airways and if, if a real patient uh, comes to your hospital. And the question is, can you manage a basic airway under situation of difficult circumstances? Even a basic or easy airway may be difficult to manage if the situation is difficult. And then it's the question, is it the basic area or an advanced airway? And I think because of the complexity, uh, you may end up with many patients with advanced airways because of the situation. I think use airway triage app to, uh, to be prepared. Uh, another example of a situation with difficult airway is this, this, this woman who uh, fell down in her bathroom and her... Um, Blood thinner caused severe bleeding. She had a, a facial fracture and tried to find out for yourself how would you manage this airway? Could you do an awake intubation? And if yes, how would you topicalize the airway? How would you um, administer oxygen? Because the nose is totally occluded. Um, would you use a video ringoscope or would you use a dioscope because of the blood in the airway? So this is, a, is an interesting case. Uh, I've called it the no-nose airway because these patients can cause really, really a lot of trouble. It's a good example of a situation with difficult airway. We managed to uh, with a direct laryngoscopy and we had a backup tracheostomy because she was uh, desaturating really quickly. We thought we cannot topicalize the airway, we cannot administer any oxygen, uh, and our plan B was put in an LMA and intubate through an LMA, but the intubation was, was uh, luckily for us, uh, really uh, uneventful. We used suction on collar and propofol, and we were able to, to, uh, <coughs> to uh, secure the airway really fast. Go back to Bonaire. We um, had an interesting case. Uh, I was on call and uh, one of the family physicians uh, gave me a call. So I have a, an eight-year-old boy who had um, late dinner at Kentucky Fried Chicken and he swallowed the bone. Um, I asked him, um, are there any symptoms? Can I see the boy? So send him please to the hospital. And when we saw the boy, he had a hoarse voice. And he was coughing. It was 11 p.m. at night, and uh, the, the situation was as follows. There was no ENT surgeon. I, I didn't have at that time a flexible scope nor a video scope in the operating room, and I was a little bit anxious to, to, 
to put them under anesthesia because if this if this bone is wedged in the larynx, uh, I may I may de- um, worsen his clinical situation. So um, I tried to visualize the bone on an X-ray. So we, we took an X-ray. This is the X-ray. Try for yourself to find the bone. Uh, I had really difficulties finding the bone, the piece of bone, and, and see if this was uh, wedged in the airway or in the esophagus. And then um, I decided to, together with one of the family physicians um, to, to call the radiologist back in Amsterdam, send them a mail, send the photographs to, uh, to, to Amsterdam and see if they could uh, locate the bone. And this is, um, this is, the, is the mail we wrote to them. And uh, uh, it's in Dutch, so I'll translate it for you. So my question to the radiologist was, okay, please uh, let me know if this chicken bone is wedged in the airway or is in the esophagus. If it's in the esophagus, I will, I will be, uh, the boy will be fine, it can wait. But if it's in the airway, we may need to do some, some emergency procedure. And then the radiologist uh, mailed back to me and said, okay, this is, this is an interesting case, but sorry, I can't help you. I c- cannot see if the bone is uh, stuck into the airway. I, I cannot locate the bone, so I'm sorry, I can't help you. So then I had to decide what to do. There was no air ambulance at night. Um, I contacted the ENT surgeon, asked him if they could help the boy the next day. So we, had, we then made a plan to uh, medivac the boy to Curacao. It's an island next door. In the early morning, uh, uh, medivac was, was, was arranged. So I went home, back, back, back home. I couldn't sleep because I said, well, is this, is this the right decision? But yeah, if you're on a, a tropical island and there's no help, what do you do? Next day, I came back in the, into the hospital in the morning, and what happened? The boy was already gone. I said to the nurse, what happened to the boy? I said, oh, we sent him uh, with the air ambulance uh, uh, and the pilot to, uh, to Curacao. But I said, I'm the doctor. I'm supposed to fly to Curacao. What happened? Oh, so the nurse said, this is what we normally do. So the only thing I could do was uh, make a phone call, and I called the, the ENT surgeon in Curacao. I said, what happened? And uh, he said, oh, the boy is fine. And I asked him, uh, were you able to locate the bone and, and get it out of the airway? He said, no, it's not a problem at all. We didn't, we didn't, didn't bring him to the operating room. He said, what happened? He said, it was really easy because when patients arrive from, from uh, other islands, a cultural swab is done. So one of the nurses uh, took, a, took a swab, stuck this to the nose of the patient, he coughed and the bone came out. So this was a case that, that solved uh, very easily. I was really anxious and I tried to, to make uh, the right decision. And in the end, uh, the solution was really, really easy. So just put in a swab and the boy's coughing and the bone will come out. Thus, I think the situation of difficult airway can occur everywhere and can make every management challenge, even in your own hospital. You better prepare. Better be prepared for the unexpected. I think you can do that with simulation or, or uh, talk uh, some some case scenarios with your colleagues and uh, try airway triage app to um, to uh, triage airways into basic uh, or advanced. Thank you for your attention, and uh, I hope you like the lecture. If there's any questions, I'm really uh, happy to answer them, and I uh, hope to see you next year or live in live in India. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you, Hans. Uh, sharing your great experiences of managing highly difficult airways in the challenging environment and circumstances with the limited resources. Um, I will may I now invite all three speakers to join us for the QA session. Okay, thank you. Um, as we're looking for the questions from the delegate, uh, I will start with one first questions to Patrick. Uh, Patrick, um, there are lots of uh, video laryngoscopes uh, available in the market now, and particularly you mentioned the channeled and non-channeled. And how you make decision about which is the best one, and uh, is there a real difference between the channeled versus non-channeled? Is the non-channeled better than channeled? <laughs> or in a given resource limitation, can we buy only one type? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Can you hear me fine? Yes, yes. Okay, I think the best BL is the one you understand the best. 
So I'm not going to make any advertisement for any one of them, but I think there are some major differences between the ones that have a channel and the ones that don't have a channel because the handling is different. As I said, it's the one is you have to align the anatomy with the channel and the tube will go where the channel leads him to. Now, in specific cases where the anatomy does not align well with the channel, uh, the channel might restrict the tube movement. So I would say in the ideal world, you choose one with a channel, one and one without. Now, if you have limited resources, you must always understand to try to use the, this, the tool that will cover most of your patients. Because evidently, the types of patients that come into your institution will depend on the type of institutions. So I wouldn't say there is one better than the other one. That's the one, the best one is the one you use the most. But this allows me to say one topic. If you have difficult airway, use the device you know the best. And in some institutions, it might still be the DL. In some others, if you use regularly the VL, maybe the visual angoscope might be of advantage. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. So <laughs> I will uh, want to ask a um, couple of questions about the supraglottic airway. Uh, thank you for your excellent talk. Um, uh, firstly, a bit of uh, regard to the intubation to the supraglottic airway devices. Uh, I know entry intubation catheter, the most of the work is done in, during the time of uh, LMA Classic. Uh, now there are a lot of second generation supraglottic airway devices with the uh, favorable features for intubation through them and particularly fiber optic guided intubation, what we call as uh, one stage or a direct intubation where you can load a size six and a half or seven cup tube over the fibroscope and intubate directly through that. So do you think the role for entry catheter in the future? Um, yeah, that, that's that's a, a good question. Um, I, I still prefer to use the entry catheter. It fits snugly over your... Um, over the scope. You don't have a cuff that can get caught. I know we don't have epiglottic bars now in the newer LMAs, but in the past that was a problem. But the cuff, particularly our kind of uh, high volume, low pressure cuffs are quite bulky and they can be a, a problem getting through, particularly if you have pathology there. And also I feel um, that the advantage of getting the entry and you can railroad whatever tube you want over it then if you're using a ray tube or whatever tube you want over it. So I, I still prefer the the um the the entry with, with the fiber optic scope. And as I say, I know it fits snugly over my scope. And when it comes to railroading it 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 is easier. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, one more slightly different question. So I know we got um, a wide application of supraglottic airway device, clinical indication and clinical use is day by day it is increasing. So what's your views on using supraglottic airway devices so for laparoscopic surgery mm -hmm. and you some literature described for some robotic surgery? Yeah, yeah. I, I think um, particularly the second generation supraglottic airway devices can be safely used in certain situations, including laparoscopic surgery. I tend to be careful about my choice of patient and my choice of surgeon as well, um, particularly for gynae laparoscopic surgery. Um, we do a lot of diagnostic laparoscopies. I'm very happy in the lower BMI patients to use supraglottic airway devices, knowing my surgeon and knowing um, how long he takes and so forth. Um, in the obese patients, I still think it is quite difficult with the pressure in, in the abdomen and so forth to use supraglottic airway devices. So I'm quite particular in my choice. And any patients with a history of reflux and so forth, obviously, I wouldn't specifically use it. But they are a fantastic um, armamentarium for me for my laparoscopic work. Um, when it comes to things like, I don't use it my in prone patients ever. I think you must have a plan B. And at least with laparoscopic work, you can, you can exchange and you, you can put a tube in. When patients are prone, I think it is quite, um, your plan B is, is difficult if you have a misplaced super um, second generation, super, any superglottic airway device. So I think just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. 
And I have done it, but I would not teach it. I would not recommend it. And I'd find it hard to defend it personally. I know that's something that's debated and there's a lot published on people using it in prone patients. But I still think it's quite a risky procedure. Thank you. Thank you. I will hand over to Sajid to see any more questions from the delegates. Thanks. Thanks, Cyprian. And um, thanks um, for all the speakers. Wonderful session. Um, I have a question to Hans. Um, I was listening to your talk. Fantastic talk. Um, the initial slides, I thought I'll ask you whether I can, you know, get that job. But uh, when you showed the clinical uh, scenarios, I thought, let it be. I'll stay back in Birmingham. Uh, it's quite <laughs> wet and murky here. But my question is that if you have to design an airway kit for all these kind of unusually difficult scenarios, what is one toy that you will have in your kit? Your pure personal preference and why? That's a tough question. I think I would take um, a video ringoscope. And I would take uh, an eye gel, I think. And uh, I will take uh, a Frova catheter, a scalpel, a bougie. And I think that would be um, most of the equipment I would take with me. I think most of the cases can be managed with that. And of course, a flexible scope. <laughs> 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 You've got both the parents and the, you know, the love child, isn't it? I think there's no universal kit for these patients. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And then you spoke about um, simulation. So how would you design a simulation for a situationally difficult area? Because the situation is going to be different in each scenario, isn't it? That's right. I think you can be trained to, to react to certain stressful situations. And uh, if you end up in a difficult situation, then um, you can train it in the simulator. But of course, not every scenario can be trained. But most, most cases like uh, uh, different patient positioning or out of hospital uh, situations can be trained in the simulator. And if you train that very well, you will, you will know that you can improvise. And mm -hmm. I think that you can uh, stop for your act. You, know? you don't have to act immediately. So I think you can, can learn how, how to do certain different uh, situations. I think simulation is very powerful. Uh, it's very powerful to do that. But of course, you cannot train for every uh, yeah, strange situation. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Um, here is a question for um, Ellen. Um, we are we are bound to answer this because this is from Sajay. He asks, um, with the obvious evidence uh, of better safety profile of the second generation SADs, why are we still using um, classic LMAs in our normal practice? Are we ethically correct? Uh, yeah, another another very good um, debate. Um, yeah, well, I, I prefer second generation for all the reasons I, I, I outlined and the safety profile. But yet I there will be a small percentage where because they're bulkier, most of the second generation, you may have difficulty. And if you don't get the if you don't place it optimally quite quickly, I sometimes do change over to um, a, a first generation. The reason being you have the cuff. So you have a deflated cuff. You can place it under the structures and then inflate and move the structures out of the way. The second reason, the type of surgery I do, I do a lot of maxillofacial with LMAs and the surgeon I work with can work around the slimmer classic versus, you know, the bulkier um, eye gel pro seal or even um, the protector and so forth. So I still think there's a place for the first generation superglottic airway devices. And occasionally when you have a failed second generation, I, th I think it's quite a good rescue because of the ability, the narrowness, when you've a fully deflated cuff, you place it with Draw, draw thrust and then lift all the structures so occasionally it, it works when your second generation isn't sitting so well so um, to answer the question preferably second generation but have a backup first first generation still so I wouldn't throw them out yet thank you um, we have a question from one of the delegates who's asking whether we can use video langoscopes to confirm the position of SADs that's a very good question because to get optimal placement, um, a lot of people, in particular Andrew Van Zondert has written a lot about this, pl placing all your LMAs with um, uh, with a, a scope and um, more to place them rather than even check them. And um, because of the bulk, this is quite difficult. I have tried it and I, I do it sometimes. It is quite difficult to do that. Um, it's easier with the first generation. 
because it takes up less space in the oral pharynx and you can put your video laryngoscope in and you can place it. it. It isn't in that it lifts the structures for you. So placing, if you're really worried, placing it with um, a, a video laryngoscope, particularly if you've used a muscle relaxant, is quite a good idea. Thank you. Um, there's another question for Hans, um, because we are in the COVID time. How will you um, prepare yourself um, in terms of PPE when you're going for one of these cases? Yeah, you have to, <clears throat> I think you can do that in a simulator as well. And, and there have been uh, very good examples <clears throat> of hospitals who do that. They train their teams in a simulator and how to don and off uh, PPE and then how to react to these situations. Yeah. I think that's the, that's the best way to be prepared. Thank you. May I ask one more question to Patrick quickly, please? Thank you. Uh, one of the problems which I come across uh, commonly, particularly with the non channel hyperangulated grade, <laughs> the design and the curvature, the bougie, standard bougie with a tube tip or sometimes tube as well, get stuck at the anterior commissure and finding difficulty to advance what I call as anterior impingement. I will come across this problem and do we need to redesign our tubes? I find the tubes currently designed up during from long time for the direct laryngoscopy. Do we need a different design of tubes without bevel and so on? Yeah, everything comes back to understanding what the problem is. And uh, I think I like to outline that the intubation process is a three-step approach. The visualization is always, or most of the times, good with the VL. And then we have this problem bringing the tube through the tracheal inlet. And in the, in the, if the anatomy is specifically anterior and the angles are very steep, then evidently the tube must do this up and down movement. And by using properly stylets and tube movements, you may, you be, be, you may be able to make this tube dance. That's what I call the tube dance. So it comes down to understanding the anatomy and the devices you have in your hand and ha how you can mobilize these two devices, stylets or bougie and a tube. Okay. Thank you. I think we're nearly to the time for the questions. Any more questions, Rajit? Um, we don't have any more questions. I think um, we have a short of time. Uh, and I would like to thank all the three speakers, um, eminent, eminent talks. Thank you so much. Um, for your time, and we will move on to the next session. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Bye. Thank you for that excellent session. And now we are on to the last session of the day, and possibly the most awaited session. You know, it's going to be a live uh, case-based discussion led by none other than Dr. Imran Ahmad, uh, who will be well known in India anyway because he has been doing. Um, it talks in Indian conferences for the last, you know, every other week for the last uh, <laughs> couple of years, I think. Uh, anyway, I mean, he is the current uh, honorary secretary of Difficult Labor Society UK as a consultant anesthetist at Guys and St. Thomas Hospital London and uh, lead for DAS um, Awake Tracheal Intubation Guideline and also a co author for uh, DAS Intubation Guideline 2015. And uh, the panel members, you have seen the panel members in the previous sessions, but I'll just introduce the names. Professor Ellen O'Sullivan, Professor Ram Kumar Venkateshwaran, Professor Patrick Shotkar, and uh, uh, sorry, Hans, uh, Dr. Hans Huti and uh, Chris Radhakrishnan. Uh, lovely. Uh, thank you, Sajay. I'm just going to try and uh, uh, share my screen. Uh, so that we can uh, hopefully then ah can you all see my screen okay yes 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 yeah and you can all hear me yes lovely um, good. okay well, well good morning from uh, from the UK um, and good afternoon to everybody over there in India uh, you can probably guess from what I'm wearing I'm actually at work today uh, and hopefully I won't be disturbed for the next forty five minutes or so um, you've already introduced our um, uh, our our uh, uh, our experts for this session. Uh, I'm just going to put them up again. We have uh, Professor Ellen Sullivan, Professor uh, Ram uh, Bakhetswaran, uh, Hans, and uh, and and uh, and Krish. Uh, so what I'm going to do is um, uh, the, aim, the aim of this session is, is essentially uh, an interactive session where what we're trying to do is, is just present um, some interesting area cases. And, and I had them as interesting area cases because um, 
I thought they were interesting, but after seeing Hans's uh, <laughs> talk, I might rename this as boring airway cases. Um, see how our our experts will, uh, will 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 manage the case. There's no right or wrong answer, and then um, uh, and then just see what I did, uh, and just just share with you how I managed the case. These are all real life cases that we've that I've had to actually had to deal with, and it'd be just interesting to see how how we manage these cases in, in different places uh, uh, under under different um, circumstances. Um, the aim is not just to talk about the uh, uh, the, the, the obvious, uh, you know, uh, ba a barn door uh, cases where you know you, you know you're going to have to do an awake intubation. I, I want to just challenge the thought process a bit more. So something like this is fairly obvious. Most of us will probably do the same thing here, but um, but, but I'm going to uh, talk about cases where where they're a bit more like this. Well, this is another one where again it's quite obvious what we're going to do here and, and what what the challenge is. But I want to just just to, just to scratch the surface a bit and go a little bit more deeper uh, and, and challenge. Um, uh, our thought processes. So this is the um, uh, the first case, and what we have here is a 55-year-old male uh, who's presented with an unstable T4 fracture, and that needs urgent stabilization with a, with a posterior approach. Um, but the problem is the patient has also had a failed intubation previously, uh, on, on which occasion the patient required an emergency surgical tracheostomy by an ENT surgeon because they, they just couldn't, uh, can't intubate, couldn't ventilate in the patient, and therefore they had to do an emergency surgical airway. A uh, patient has uh, ankylosing spondylitis because of a fixed neck and, and has limited mouth opening. This is uh, his airway assessment. Uh, what you can see here is, is that he, uh, this is his neck extension, that's all he's got. You can see his previous tracheostomy scar. Uh, when I ask him to open his mouth, it looks okay from from in front. But when I ask him to um uh, uh, to, to see how many finger mouth, fingers it is, it is actually only just just about two finger breaths mouth opening. Okay, so that that's his airway assessment. So I'm going to go uh, over to our, uh, our panel. I might, I might start off with uh, with Ram first, if I may, and and ask him how would you manage this patient's airway for for his uh, fixation of his fractured T4 vertebra. Sure, Imran. Thank you. Just an audio check. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Thanks, Imran. Uh, before I, I know I start answering, I mean, I give you my answer to this airway. I had just a couple of questions. Uh, the history does say that on a previous occasion, the patient had a difficult intubation. And how long ago was that? Because we know that ankylosing spondylosis is a, is a progressive disease. And obviously, we don't expect the airway to get any more easier as we move along. Uh, so it also mentioned that there was an emergency surgical tracheostomy. So if you can, if you would like to share what happened on the previous occasion, that might help in our planning for the next, uh, for this occasion. Yeah, so, so, so the last anesthetic was, was about two years ago done by a consultant, an experienced consultant in East who, who thought that the an ankylosis spondylitis was okay and he would be, uh, or I think it was he, would be able to intubate the patient, uh, but, but was unable to. Uh, um, and was unhappy to do a, uh, his own uh, emergency quantum neck airway. And so a, a surgeon was called, and that's why it was an emergency tracheostomy. That's what the surgeon opted to do at that time. Okay, Imran. So the easiest answer, I think, would be you know, a surgical trach again. But uh, to add another angle to the discussion, I would think that uh, because this patient has an unstable spine at the T4 level, uh, again, positioning in the prone, pos uh, prone position is going to be another issue. And uh, I would... Uh, Actually, I like to have this patient awake at the time of positioning, uh, so that we don't, you know, we are able to kind of log roll the patient, and we don't further uh, create any more neurological deficits. So I would go, you know, the simplest solution would be for a surgical trach again this time, under under local anesthesia, of course, and then uh, assist the patient to position himself in a prone position, and if required, you know, do a second neurological examination just to make sure that uh, you know, the act of positioning has not created any further issues. And uh, of course, again, if I know the senior consultant who has uh, handled this case earlier, uh, I would certainly you know, uh, consider that because it's, I have not ruled out a possibility of an awake fiber optic aided intubation, but I would think the safest way would be a tracheostomy. That's my answer. So, so you've opted for an, an awake uh, a surgical tracheostomy under local anesthesia, positioning and, and also awake positioning. Uh, please, yeah. Away, um, and then induce anesthesia once you're happy that the, uh, the yes, patient is yes. Okay, uh, I'm going to go down my list. So, Ellen, uh, what, what would you do? Uh, excuse me. I think looking at the patient there, um, I would be happy to do um, an awake, um, first of all, an ease endoscopy. 
to see what I'm dealing with. But with the view to continue, if I had a good view of the larynx and to do an awake fibro optic intubation, um, obviously coughing will be an issue, particularly if it's a T4 fracture and so forth. So I think I would prepare him quite um, quite well with local anaesthetic to, to limit that. But um, I, I, I'm sure there's going to be um, <laughs> some issue with that, but I, I would definitely go for an awake um, fiber optic intubation in this patient. And um, I, I don't know if you can tell me if he had any difficulties with his nasendoscopy or anything. And you, you do an, 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 a nasal approach? I would do a nasal approach. Um, I think because the angle is better and it's easier in difficult areas. Yeah. Lovely. Okay. Uh, I've got uh, hands next. Morning, hands. You're on mute, I think. No, sorry. I to <clears throat> thank you, uh, Imran. Good morning. I would uh, go for an awake intubation. I think positioning in the bed can be a bit of a problem. Uh -huh. he, he will be put in a prone position. I would use, I think, high flow nasal oxygen, a topical ice, and uh, I think you can either go for a nasal or oral approach. I think if you put it in a prone position, maybe oral approach is, is okay. The mouth opening seems okay to do a flexible intubation. And uh, I think as a plan B, I would go for uh, for tracheostomy. I think that's the thing for plan B. Yeah. So you go for uh, an awake... Uh, uh, awake flexible intubation, yeah. uh, And you would prefer an oral or a nasal, or you don't mind? I think you can uh, choose both ways. And if you put in a prone position, sometimes if they, they put prone, the uh, tube in a nasal position may not be ideal. So maybe I would go oral, oral intubation. Okay. And Chris, finally, morning. Well, uh, well uh, I agree with the, uh, all the procedures are possible, but I think three-point immobilization of the patient is important, particularly if you are dealing with somebody with a, unstable fracture of T4, your attempts to do anything, fiber optic or tracheostomy, can uh, make the patient move suddenly, causing more problems. So make sure either there is inline immobilization or there is three-point immobilization. I would prefer an awake nasal intubation. However, you can also do, if you are going for oral, you can do an awake uh, video laryngoscopy and intubation as well. That is possible. Okay, lovely. Okay, so... I think uh, we've got more more uh, options for a um, uh, an awake intubation, uh, either nasally or orally. And I think orally is probably uh, uh, slightly one. Uh, personally, I think a nasal might be tricky in a prone patient because you, you, there there is risk that it can that it can kink or or you might struggle with ventilation once they're prone, uh, and you might realise that too late. Uh, so I actually went for uh, this option which was, uh, uh, I haven't got the whole video, uh, but I, I did an oral awake intubation using a, a flexible a scope, uh, sorry, flexible bronchoscope, as well as a flexible endotracheal tube, reinforced tube, uh, secured the airway, and then we uh, 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 prone the patient and put the patient to sleep. So a bit of everything that you suggested. And when we didn't opt for a nasal for the reason that we thought it may kink once we had the patient in position, and we didn't want to, um, uh, to have to compromise that once the patient is prone, especially knowing how difficult his airway was. That's good. Okay, so uh, that was a, a, a fairly straightforward one for, to start off with. This is our, our next case, uh, an 18-year-old uh, 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 young girl uh, who has known treater, uh, treacher Collins syndrome. She has a, a, a subglottic stenosis, and now that's resulted in, in, in her being quite stridulous, enough to her to be quite symptomatic. Uh, she has limited mouth opening and neck extension. She's quite small, only 42 kilos. And uh, she needs a, um, uh, the surgical procedure she needs is, is, a, is a pan endoscopy to assess the level of the, uh, and, and the extent of the, st of the stenosis and also treatment of her um, tracheal stenosis if, if possible, because she's now is symptomatic uh, from this. Uh, this is her uh, airway assessment. So her mouth opening, uh, don't forget she's only 42 kilos, is, is again only two finger breaths. Uh, and uh, she has quite limited uh, neck extension, which you'll see in a second. So this is her trying to extend her neck. Okay, so there's hardly hardly any movement at all. Okay, and the surgeon wants to do a pan endoscopy and um, uh, and uh, possibly uh, treat the, the the subglottic stenosis. Okay, so uh, let's start off with um, um, Ellen. Oh, um, thank you very much. Um, now, looking at that, that patient, she, she's 18 and I would have developed a rapport with her. So because she's quite young and might be quite anxious and I would like to do 
personally an awake fibre optic intubation on her. She didn't look that striderous there. She wasn't drooling and so forth, um, but I would be cognizant of that. So I would definitely put high flow nasal oxygen on her and I would do it with remifentanil, which I find is an anxiolytic as well as um, uh, and I would be generous enough with that because I feel I could probably get um, an LMA in there as well if, if I if I had to. Um, but I would talk her through it and I would do an awake um, nasal intubation with um, high flow nasal because that does relax the patient, particularly if they have strider, the strider tends to be more relieved with the high flow nasal. Um, I know she has limited neck movement, but I would probably do it sitting like you, Emran. I do it from the front in this situation, I think, and, and chat to her as I was doing it. I think the difficulties are her age, um, anxiety with the with the stride or, um, but I, I I don't see any problems with doing a wake fiber optic on her. Okay, I'll just add, add a couple of uh, uh, points. One is um, she, she's, she's, she was very petite. So uh, um, and the nasal, uh, I think you'd be very restricted by the tube size because of how small she is. Mm. Uh, you, you might not come across on the, on, on the video. And secondly, the surgeon wants to do a panidoscopy and the surgeon wants to try and dilate the, uh, the stenosis. Um, oh, so yeah. the tube may, may cause a problem with the actual procedure. Oh, um, yeah. Down. Sorry, uh, I, I, I absolutely neglected to. Um, <laughs> the st- <laughs> he was going to operate on the stenosis. Yeah, yeah that's my, exactly. so exactly. that's a completely different scenario because you obviously he probably would like um, a tubeless field here in that situation. So I would, um, looking at her front of neck, it looked okay. So I would probably put a, a cannula in there and um, be consider jetting her jetting her it depends what you tend to do for your surgeons for subglottic stenosis um mm. he may want to use a balloon dilatation in which case you could do it with just high flow nasal oxygen and put a cannula a little needle in here as a safety backup okay okay i'll move on to hands yeah <clears throat> i'll agree with the apnea oxygenation and uh, i think that's the, the the most viable option and, and, and you make the surgeon happy do we know how long the procedure will take? Uh, uh, probably, well, it, it'll probably take a good half an hour because um, you'd have to position the patient and then uh, then deal with the actual stenosis. Yeah, and I think because of the nasal passage, where we will be difficult. I think this this is a very viable option, and I would use uh, general anesthesia, propofol, remifentanil, and do apnea oxygenation. And what happens if she if she desaturates during the procedure? Yeah, I think we can ask the the surgeons to uh, for a rescue. You you could do back mask ventilation in between. That's yeah. not like but that would be an option, or increase the FiO two. And if you really have to uh, have a backup plan, I think you could uh, uh, put in an ILMA. Yeah. Put for in rescue. a and uh, a laryngeal mask airway to 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 reoxygenate maybe. Okay. And see okay. if you can restart apnea oxygenation. Yeah. Okay, fine. Um, and uh, Ram? Yes, uh, yes, Imran. Uh, I kind of agree with uh, all that Ellen said. In fact, my plan is almost uh, like what Ellen said. But I just want to add on one more thing. If we, uh, since the patient looked reasonably comfortable, would it have been a good idea to get an, an MRI done and a virtual reconstruct you know, of the uh, tracheobronchial tree? That will definitely give both the surgeon and the anesthesiologist a little more information as to what kind of problem we are getting into. And I was planning actually a, a good topical anesthesia and have the surgeon go on with a nasal endoscopy and maybe do a balloon dilatation. But uh, having seen the mouth opening, I'm now tempted to also consider a supraglottic airway device as a backup. And uh, the surgeon could definitely then have a fully anesthetized patient and could operate through the, you know, the LMA, I mean, could pass the scope through the LMA and uh, maybe definitely do a balloon dilatation. Again, the MRI report would be important. And if required, even a you know a, a incision of a synotic segment. Another point that crossed my mind was if an adult, 18-year-old uh, you know girl is having strider, I expected that the uh, the the size of the tracheal stenosis would probably be around four millimeters, not not more than that, for her to have such extreme strider. So that was a word of caution in my mind. But uh, when you showed us the picture, it didn't look that bad, like Ellen said. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, that's what I want to add on, Imran. Lovely. Okay, yeah, I, I get the point of imaging. Uh, we, we did have imaging, but we, that was from a, a, a while ago, and uh, and it showed a, a marked supplement stenosis, uh, uh, which is why we wanted to assess it dynamically and then uh, treat it if, if they could. 
Uh, Krish, right, it, it tell us not only the diameter, but also the extent, you know, the vertical extent yeah. of how, how, how narrow is it and how wide is it, the whole, yeah. Uh, yeah. It will okay. probably give us a better idea to go in. Yeah. Okay. Krish? Right. Uh, this is uh, one of my Monday cases, routinely. <laughs> so uh, nothing surprising for me at all in this case. The important point here to understand is that the surgeon is going to do the procedure. He needs to do a pandanoscopy. He must have access to the airway. So what I tend to do with these patients is position them for the procedure the surgeon is going to do, get a venous axis in, total intravenous anesthesia. I may choose to use OptiFlow, keep the patient oxygenated. I have a twin stream, or you can use your uh, monsoon or whatever you like. Once the surgeon gets the scope in, I give them a good anesthetic, remain fentanyl, patient is off to sleep, surgeon inserts his laryngoscope uh, in the uh, and then I connect my high frequency jet ventilation, jet ventilation, patient has got total intravenous anesthesia, happily asleep, surgeon's got the full view, and then he can uh, dilate or whatever he wants to do, balloon dilatation sometimes with a two minute balloon inflation. It all goes uh, happily. I've done BMI, so 55, narrowed down to three millimeters, four millimeters. So I'm not concerned with these cases anymore. Okay, that's great. Uh, the uh, the uh, the only premise for what you've just said is that you, the surgeon needs to have access to the uh, to the subglottic area. So Correct. what happens if the surgeon cannot get access in that situation? When why? Well, he should. If they don't have, you always have a backup. You can have front of neck access, which a surgeon can do. You can do a variety of things to rescue that airway that uh, others have already discussed. But as a matter of routine, if the surgeon with a straight blade often can get into the space, if he can't get in, well, wake the patient up, rescue the airway, wake the patient up because the surgeon can't do the procedure anyway. Yeah, exactly. So that, that I wanted to highlight the fact that. You're frozen. Uh, so I'll just show you what I did. So, so this is. Um, uh, 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 we did a, a nasendoscopy uh, first because I, I want, sorry, I'll get the volume there. I went to nasendoscopy first because uh, I just wanted to assess the airway myself to see how bad is, is, this, uh, is this stenosis. I opted for the oral route because her nose was so small that I knew that I wouldn't be able to get any, any decent sized tube if I needed to. But I didn't want to intubate her anyway because I knew that would affect the surgery. And if she had a subglottic stenosis, we may have struggled to intubate her. So just going through the uh, cord, you can see. Uh, uh, just how marked uh, her subglottic stenosis is. And, and we know that we will not be able to intubate this, this girl. Impossible. No, no chance of intubating. So it has to be some form of superglottic or subglottic ventilation. Um, so we opted to, um, to uh, thrive the patient. Uh, so apneic oxygenation, put the patient to sleep. Surgeon was unable to get any access whatsoever. Could not... Uh, actually, no, I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. Uh, yeah, surgeon was unable to get any access. I then woke the patient up and we opted to do a, a surgical tracheostomy because we knew that the patient uh, needed uh, airway protection. So uh, we actually did it under, uh, uh, under uh, uh, local anesthetic. So she was awake um, and we, we've topicalized her, uh, lots of local anesthetic, slight mild bit of sedation, and we, and we secured the airway subglottic below the level of the stenosis. And then we, um, uh, but we knew that we couldn't treat the actual problem because he could not get access because of the, the fixed neck and the limited mouth opening. Uh, so, so we ended up just doing a tracheostomy and protecting her airway. And we didn't actually treat the stenosis in the end. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a nice one just to show that you need the options and you need to have a plan B available to you as well. And also the fact that, you know, an awake tracheostomy is, is an option as long as your conditions are, are right. Uh, and it does take a bit of time. So you need to make sure that you give yourself time and it's not, uh, you know, not done as an emergency. In, in more controlled conditions. I won't go through the whole thing, but you can just see that we did that. We did a, 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 a local uh, tracheostomy um, 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 while she was slightly sedated. Okay, good. Another case now. Uh, so this is a 35-year-old um, a lady, and she has quite marked interstitial lung disease, okay, uh, uh, quite severe, uh, and at all costs want to avoid a general anesthetic. She has pretty poor lung function as a result. She also has a, um, a, a tracheal lesion, which, 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 which they want to uh, biopsy. Uh, this can be done by a flexible bronchoscope, uh, but uh, if you this, this is done by the bronchoscopists, um, and therefore the, their bronchoscopes are quite large uh, because they are um, uh, they've got the extra bits on them, and because they want to maybe do more than just take the biopsy, uh, and, and therefore the, the, the smallest size tube you, it'll fit through is a size nine endotracheal tube. Okay, uh, and we want to avoid a general anaesthetic at all costs. So um, how do we um, uh, do this procedure. 
Uh, let, let me go to Krish first. Uh, well, uh, Imran, these cases we used to do You're in Liverpool. Muted, oh, Am no, I sorry. muted? Am I muted? I shouldn't be. No. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Ah, yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, Krish. Yes, okay. Yeah, funnily, I used to, I learned my uh, first thing when I was working at Liverpool. We used to do a list uh, where the bronchoscopy was done purely with sedation. We used to give a bit of fentanyl and uh, midazolam and uh, get bronchoscopy done in a lot of number of these patients. So we here want to avoid general anesthetic. So we can either rely totally on uh, sedation, uh, with a, maybe awake sedation with a bit of remifentanil if needed, and then use topicalization of the airway, just as we do for an awake fibroptic intubation, and then see if the surgeon is able to do his scope is rigid scope and do the biopsy without the patient going off to sleep. That would be my choice. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a flexible bronchoscope, but uh, so you're saying do it awake like a normal awake intubation, uh, but just not intubate. Yeah, don't intubate. Okay, cool. Uh, let's go to uh, Hans next. Yeah, I would prevent intubation as well. I think uh, I've done cases like this, but for example, putting in uh, ILMA, intubating Lerner's mask airway. If you topicalize the airway very well, uh, Patients tolerate the, the suprapleural airway with a little bit of propofol, and then they can go with a flexible scope through the ILMA, and you've got a protected airway. The case can take as long as, as, as they want, and uh, you have a bit more uh, security than, than only with sedation, as Chris suggests, but I think sedation is an option as well. Do we know where the, the lesion in the trachea is situated? Is it, is it very... Uh, mid trachea. Sorry? It's, it's, it's halfway down the trachea, but also mm -hmm. in the yeah. left and right main bronchi as well. So I think if you prevent intubation, you won't end up in any problems with that lesion. So I would go for a supraglottic airway after topicalization. Yeah. And so okay. you prevent GA. Yeah. Okay, Ellen? Um, I think I'd, I'd agree with Krish. Um, and I would do, uh, as for an awake fiber optic intubation. Uh, but yeah, okay. So thrive, topicalize, and, and yeah. do it away. And then, yeah. And, and, and what's the um, what, what's the backup if the patient starts to desaturate? Um, an LMA. I mean, the patient should hopefully tolerate an LMA well, and you've topicalized, so you can use an LMA. Lovely, Ram. Uh, yes, Imran. I just like uh, one more investigation before we go on. I'd like to know how bad the interstitial lung disease is. So whether a patient requiring a continuous supplementation with oxygen. And in any case, I think in addition to what uh, Krish and Ellen and Hans have said. I would definitely consider some method of uh, continuous oxygenation on this patient. But I think in interstitial lung disease, that's a major issue. Now, they breathe well, but the oxygen doesn't get across uh, the uh, alveoli, as we know. So I would definitely concentrate on some method of continuous oxygenation, good topical anesthesia. And uh, I think it's only a biopsy. So I don't think there'll be, uh, and as Chris said, do it like any uh, you know intubation, but pass the fiber scope. Um, yeah. Of course, Excellent. you have to have a very, uh, you know, as, as Ellen mentioned, I think, uh, you have to have a very understanding uh, surgeon. You know, yes. I think good teamwork is very important. So if you really know your surgeon well, I think this is uh, a piece of cake. Yeah. yeah lovely. Excellent. So, um, so uh, I think the, 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 this case highlights, um, it, it's not a patient with a difficult airway. It's a patient who needs access to the airway and, and oxygenation support during the procedure. And so we're using our skills as, as airway anesthetists to provide those conditions, but, but, but avoiding a general anesthesia, which is, which is the key thing here. So I did um, basically what, what, um, what's, uh, what, what uh, you've suggested. So I topicalized the airway with a sedation. We, used a, we actually used a supraglottic airway right from the offset. We had that in right, right from the beginning. And the advantage here was that um, I was able to, uh, ox patient could breathe spontaneously. We give some PEEP, we give some CPAP if we needed to, and we passed the, the flexible bronchoscope through the, 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 the connector, uh, uh, as you can see here. Once the patient is awake, uh, we, we turn the optical low off and we, we were just ventilating uh, spontaneously through the supraglottic airway, uh, use that as a conduit, and the surgeon was unable to access the, uh, the trachea, do the biopsy, uh, and, and if the patient desaturates, uh, we, we could just give a little bit of PEEP or, or do some pressure support ventilation. Very simple technique, something that we often forget is that putting in a supraglottic airway awake is an option and it does allow us uh, access as a conduit. So I just thought I'd share that, uh, just, just to, for us to think about that, something we don't, we don't think about very often. Uh, so Imran, we, Imran, Imran, Ram here. Uh, just, cool. just a question. So this was done by the bedside, maybe Okay, so uh, no, my next case, 
uh, I'm just going to stop whenever I've got about 10 cases here, so I'll just stop when, when I need to stop. So, uh, Sadly, just let me know. Uh, what 64 year old male, uh, he is, needs a, a pan endoscopy and biopsy for an oral tumor. Okay, uh, the CT, the, the uh, imaging was done a, a few months ago, um, and uh, and he's got a, a, a reasonably sized um, base of tongue tumor. Uh, he can swallow liquids, but struggles with solids when I assess him in the morning. Uh, he has no other respiratory symptoms. And the plan was for me to do a, uh, an, a sleep intubation with a microlaryngeal tube so the surgeon has access and then can biopsy the, um, the, the area uh, of interest. Put the patient to sleep, and this is what I found. This is what I saw. So that's the uvula. There's a big, massive, large tumor there. Okay, so, so unexpectedly, that's what I found. Patient's asleep now. So what would you do now? Uh, let's start off with uh, hands. I think this is an impressive tumor. It's difficult to, to, to put something in. <laughs> and uh, how did you put the patient to sleep? What did you use? <laughs> Can we wake the patient up? Uh, no. I, I gave a big dose of muscle oh. relaxant uh, <laughs> at the curum and I... Uh, <laughs> Oh boy! <laughs> I would like the patient to wake up and do an awake tracheostomy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, so I've I've committed myself to a general answer. I was not expecting that view. Okay, what I what I maybe would do as a rescue or plan B if the patient has had used uh, aptocurium, I would probably use video laryngoscope and uh, try to do a VAVI, a video laryngoscopy assisted flexible intubation to see. If you can maneuver and find something like a black hole or something with air bubbles and try to intubate the airway, I think okay. that would be a, yeah. a viable option. If you're lucky, if you're uh, fluent in the technique, it's, it's often a very good rescue technique. Yeah. And you can, uh, if you can back mark ventilate, you can, you can do that and then put a video okay. in and, and try uh, to find the whole effect. You need, but you need two anesthetists for that. Yeah, you need actually you, you need an extra hand. So what I always do is you put in the video laryngoscope, and you can ask anybody to hold this like I do, and then you you get the flexible scope, and you can use the flexible for yourself. So actually, you need an an assistant, not to an assistant. Okay, Ellen. Um, I have a huge lot of experience with the Bonfis and because um, I worked in Liverpool as well. <laughs> no, no, and um, and I would. Um, there is a technique called paraglossally, which comes yeah. just to the larynx. And that looks like you could get under it just at that point. Funnily enough, what we what we did a lot is put the gloved hand in the mouth just to put push the structure a little bit to the left. If you come in from the right paraglossal side, um, it, it's a very nice technique. And your tube is there once you're in. And even if it bleeds a bit because it, it's a rigid Bonfi scope, um, it works very well, but I think you have to have experience with the Bonfi, or, or else you wouldn't be trying that. But that's what I would do now in that case. Thank okay, um, Ron? Yeah, I'm Ron. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I've got to go back a bit onto the history. I'm sorry. So was there any postural variation is uh, what I would like to have known. Because, uh, you know, there seems to be a kind of a disconnect between uh, the uh, clinical findings that you gave us and what you really saw on table. There seems to be you know, a huge disconnect. So, you know, was anything seen on oral examination? Did you see a part of the tumor? Was there any postural variation? All these things would probably help us again. Uh, to, if it's a pedunculated tumor, we don't know, you know, yeah. whether that would change. But uh, uh, certainly otherwise, uh, once you landed in this kind of trouble, I think the only thing is uh, try to get past the mass as atraumatically as possible, since we cannot back off now, as you told Hans, you can't back off at this point, uh, continue oxygenation and try to get past it uh, with either, uh, you know, uh, a ball fields or maybe even a flexible scope at this point. Again, a hybrid technique. You know, you could possibly use a flex flexible scope so you know exactly where you're going and uh, probably less uh, less traumatic also. So okay, good. That's, that's, that's what I would have uh, yeah. thought so, so of, yeah. You would criticize the anesthetist for not doing a thorough history and examination. Not uh, really, Imran. <laughs> but I think that's important. I just, there are a lot of residents, a lot of residents listening on to this program. So I'm sure that, you know, we have to emphasize that, yeah. You're, yeah. you're absolutely right, actually. Uh, and this is a Saturday list. The, the, the surgeon was, was a, a registrar, ENT registrar. There was no other consultant surgeon around. I was doing the list with him, fortunately. And, uh, and there was a big disconnect, you're absolutely right, between the clinical find, uh, between the history and what we could see to actually what we found when you put him to sleep. Completely, I was not expecting this at all. And that's why I, I shared it. It's a huge it. surprise. I feel it's a huge yeah. surprise to you, yeah? 
Thanks for this at all. And, uh, and, and that's what I want to know. What would you do at this point? So, Krish, over to you. Yeah, I think uh, you're able to see the mass as, as that. So, thinking on your feet, because you have time, uh, is not on your side at this moment. You can't do too many things. Be asking for a fiber optic scope or mobilizing people at that particular stage. This is an unexpected, sudden problem. So one thing is the view is clear in front of you. You know the mass. The first simple thing is to see if you can get a bougie down that, just above it. Mobilize it and get a bougie down. Very often you can. And if you cannot, then the other option is to have some kind of a rigid stillet, just like the glide right stillet. Get it closer and just pass the mass and see if you can insert the tube in that way. So often I'm just saying what you would immediately do. There are so many options available to you. What would you do at that particular moment? My option would be the simplest option of using a bougie and see if you can get around that and get the tube in. Otherwise, you may have to do other things that others have suggested. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. So it's, um, uh, unfortunately, obviously, uh, at, at that moment in time, I, I don't have any videos <laughs> uh, because uh, it was a bit, a bit hectic and very unexpected. So what I did was I did try and intubate the patient with a video laryngoscope. Uh, and uh, I was very worried about um, bleeding, uh, and he did start to bleed a little bit just by placing the video laryngoscope in because it was very friable. Uh, so, but, so, uh, but I had a flexible bronchoscope uh, uh, nearby, and so with, with, a, with a lot of jaw thrust, uh, we did an, uh, a, an asleep oral uh, intubation using a flexible bronchoscope, and, and we decided to do a, a tracheostomy uh, uh, um, uh, because the, the, the red star was not keen on doing anything in the upper airway because he was not experienced enough and there's no consultant available. And we phoned the surgical consultant, and we all agreed that we should do a tracheostomy, cover the airway, and bring him back and then deal with him later. Uh, so that was that was that case. So uh, uh, yeah. So uh, uh, fortunately, I was able to do a, a, a fiber optic intubation uh, while he was uh, asleep. Um, uh, uh, but I think a rigid scope like the Bonfields, like the Proview, would have been something maybe more more useful because you could just sort of almost gently manipulate yourself around the around the around the mass. Uh, I don't know how much time we've got left, but I'll just carry on until I get stopped. Uh, this is case number five, about fifteen. 15 minutes more, Imran. I'm, I've got the okay. timer going here. Okay, lovely. Yeah, so 15 minutes to go for the 45 minutes, yeah. I have two more cases. Yeah. Two more cases. Okay, this is a, a 33-year-old lady. She has spinal muscular atrophy and she is completely wheelchair-bound. Um, she is now only able to move her right arm, uh, but even that's getting progressively weaker. And she has presented because she's 36 weeks pregnant uh, and the plan is to, uh, to how do we deliver the baby? Um, on assessment, she has difficulty with swallowing and uh, uh, especially uh, uh, solids. So she can just pass, uh, uh, swallow liquids. She has obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, she has extensive spinal surgery in the past for scoliosis and has got rods running down the whole, the whole of her C spine down to her lumbar spine. Uh, very difficult to position because of all the contractures that she had. And she has much worsening respiratory function um, over the past few uh, months with the pregnancy um, uh, progressing. Um, so the plan is, is uh, how do we safely deliver this baby um, uh, for, for, for this sort of patient? Uh, this is her airway okay, assessment, okay, uh, and uh, this is her mouth opening, which is uh, that. Uh, she, she, uh, we had to help her lift her hand up to, uh, to see how many finger, finger breaths it is, but it's obviously about one. She assured me that if, if her partner extended her neck a bit more, that her mouth opening is much better. So, so we did that. And uh, that was <laughs> how much better it got. Uh, so, so it's still about what one finger uh, uh, mouth opening. Okay, so uh, Ellen is uh, uh, an obstetric anesthetist. So I might uh, start off uh, with you, Ellen. Um, I'm just going to ask, um, what is the obstetric plan? Um, I mean, is, is she, are they planning to section her at this point? She's 36 weeks. Yeah, so, so, so the reason why we got involved is because they, they want us to know, what, uh, ask us what to do. And we, we all opted for an elective section because uh, of the high risk of, of her airway in case things went wrong. And the fact that regional anesthesia was going to be so difficult in her because of the, 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 the spinal surgery that she's had. Yeah, so basically um, she's going to have a cesarean section electively. She cannot have a regional, so she has to have, um, has to have it done under... Um, general anaesthesia um, I would um, personally looking at her there obviously I wouldn't attempt an oral 
fibre optic, but I would do a nasal fibre optic. I know some people say that's contraindicated in obstetrics. I don't think it is really, as long as you use vasoconstriction to the nasal, the nares. So I personally would attempt an awake fibre optic intubation um, on this lady, plan the section and, and um, do that. And um, again, using high flow, which because of the oxy oxygen need, and particularly in obstetrics, I always use awake fibre optic, um, high flow um, for my awake fibre optics in obstetrics. And counselling the lady, she looks cooperative and um, she's not in any distress. So I would really, really, particularly doing awakes in the obstetric patients, I think you need to, mm. to um, discuss it with them and tell them exactly what you're doing. Um, with regard to sedation, um, I tend to use remifentanil, low dose remifentanil for these, about one to two nanograms per mil. Um, again, tell the obstetric and the neonatologist that, that you're using remifentanil. We haven't had issues with that. So I'm not sure what your, your plan B would be, but uh, <laughs> we might plan A. Yeah. Uh, lovely. OK, uh, let's go down. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, Ron. Yeah, I'm Ron. Thank you. Thank you first for, uh, you know, after having blocked all, all avenues, you at least made the, uh, the cesarean <laughs> delivery optional, you know. So you left that decision uh, to be a combined decision between the obstetrician and the anesthesiologist. And I'm glad you gave us that option because uh, once you reach 36 weeks of gestation, then uh, the, the fetus is mature. And I think we should do an elective planned cesarean delivery. My plan was to go for a good uh, topical anesthesia, planned awake fiber optic nasal intubation. And uh, because the mouth opening was restricted. Uh, once the tube is in, I would probably use less of, you know, smaller doses of uh, maybe rocuronium. Uh, because you know that the patient also has a, you know, a spinal muscular atrophy. I would definitely keep this patient in the ICU, possibly a few hours of elective ventilation because we don't know how good her respiratory musculature is. So I would go very cautiously at the point of extubation, maybe even extubate over a, a tube exchanger if, if required. And I'd take care of uh, you know, her post-operative pain by maybe using a tap block or an erector spinae block so that we don't have to use too much of sedatives in the post-op period. Minimize relaxants, minimize sedatives. I think that would be the, the mantra, so to say. And uh, care, the patient, care for the patient in the ICU. And extubation strategy should be as, as uh, uh, extensively thought out as an intubation strategy. Thank okay. you. Uh, Hans? I think all has been said. And uh, I would go for an awake uh, nasal intubation, as Ellen has said. I think it's not contraindicated in a pregnant patient if you use vasoconstrictors. And uh, I think you, sh you should be prepared to do an emergency surgical airway if all things go wrong. I think if you prepare well and use high flow nasal oxygen, this, this case can be done with an awake nasal intubation. Okay, well, awake nasal. Okay, um, and uh, Chris? Well, there is uh, lim mouth opening is limited. And I know well that uh, the in pregnancy, they don't really like nasal intubations because of the congestion and the bleeding it causes. We, that is an option available in a difficult scenario. So the problem is we can, I get a tube in this lady, either using a fiber optic or really nasally, or if uh, permits uh, with a bit of, bit of video laryngoscope and a stillate, if there is room for that orally, I would try if a oral tube intubation can be done, I would prefer that in this patient rather than nasal. But the problem of intubation or airway management in this patient is only a fraction of the problem. The problem is management of this patient as a whole, ventilation and post-operative care. That is a major problem here. Airway is a smaller issue. You can do any of these. I have done one of these cases. The spinal is ruled out because you will have rods in the back and straightening and you can't access the spinal. You'll be spending wasting your time. I have found in the patient that I did, was to put the patient in the left lateral position and we could intubate, do the fiber optic better in that. So what happens is if you attempt a fiber optic in this patient in the usual way that you do, either standing in the front or at the head, and if you don't succeed, worth trying a different position, putting the patient in the left lateral position. And sometimes that is successful. That's what happened in a patient that I did, where I actually could do a fiber optic with the patient in the left lateral position. So consider all those options, but managing the patient overall ventilation is the challenge. Yeah, uh, I, I totally agree. And, and it is a very challenging case. Uh, uh, what we ended up doing was, um, uh, uh, I, I, as, you, as you all suggested, 
is um, uh, I actually opted for an oral um, uh, uh, airway intubation because I wanted to avoid risk of bleeding from her from her nose because I knew that um, uh, it would be uh, a, a risk. Uh, and then if you have to, if she does bleed, then then she does have a tricky airway. And then managing the airway uh, it would have been uh, more challenging than it already was. I'm not going to show you the whole video, but it took me uh, three attempts uh, because she had a lot of secretions there, and, and it was quite difficult to even though we put a high scene patch on overnight. Uh, to, to see where we were, but 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 just to say, uh, in the end, we, we were successful on, on on the third attempt to do an oral um, uh, awake uh, intubation using a flexible bronchoscope. We secured the airway, put the patient to sleep, did the uh, elective section, and then we extubated her um, after having done uh, 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 rectus uh, sheath blocks um, as as Ram suggested. Uh, but that, that was a, a real case, and uh, and options were very limited uh, in, in that situation. Okay, it's going to move on to our uh, um, uh, final case, uh, unless we do this one very quickly. We may have one, may have to squeeze one more in. Uh, this is a 45-year-old male uh, who, uh, uh, he's got progressively enlarging rhinothyma. He's otherwise completely fit and healthy, no airway compromised. He needs surgery for his, uh, for his rhinothyma. This is his uh, airway assessment. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. I can see it's, it's, it's quite a large uh, rhinothyma, but when you when you look into his mouth, his mouth opening is, is actually quite good, uh, and uh, his uh, uh, tongue protrusion is okay, uh, but, but that's essentially his, uh, there you go, there's his mouth and that's his nose. Okay, he needs excision of that lesion. How would you manage the airway? Uh, let's go to Krish first. Well, uh, sit him up. Let him open his mouth wide, spray the mouth, do an awake video laryngoscope standing in front of the patient and get the tube down. Send him out to sleep. So uh, awake, uh, oral VL intubation and then Correct. The standing okay. in front of the standing in front of the patient. You can yes. do that training at the top end, but I think it is a lot easier to see the with that kind of a mass. Even if you stand at the top end, you see rightly are going to see the mouth opening. You're better off standing in front with the patient in an uh, incline. Certainly, we were discussing the channel, the non-channel, something like a Pentax airway scope or an air track, or even a King Vision with a tube already mounted would be a fantastic video laryngoscope for this procedure, standing in front of the patient. Uh, so a King Vision, uh, if you're facing the patient, you won't be able to see the screen. If it's, you can, if you, if you incline the patient sufficiently enough, you can do that. Uh, if you have Pentax airway, you can adjust the screen a little bit. So I have used a Pentax before. But uh, air track also works with a distant monitor. Yep. Air track would work fine. So anyway, I mean, it's a question of uh, being there on the ground and thinking what is feasible. I'm just thinking here, sitting yep. in my chair. Yep. Well, how would you oxygenate, Krish? There's no nose. Uh, this is no nose airway. There's no nose. <laughs> well, I, I, there is there is a nose we cannot see, but there is a nose I'm sure which works. So okay. you can either you can either put oral uh, high flow uh, oxygen through the mouth and then go in from there. Oxygen. The chap is alive. He sees. He doesn't need us when he's eating and uh, sleeping. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we have to remember that he is oxygenating well enough. So just mm -hmm. supplement oxygen. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, Ellen. Um, I, I would actually do the same. I have quite a bit of experience of air tracks from the front. Um, and I think that works very well because you kind of bring it in and it won't get in the way of the rhymophyma. I might put a little buccal oxygen with just a little ray tube in the side. Buccal oxygen can be useful for that as well. Um, or just your stand, bog standard awake oral. <laughs> yeah. uh, would anybody do it on a laryngeal mask airway? That's the other option, yeah. I mean, I, I agree with Imran. I think we don't use those enough. I use in all my trauma cases it, when the, there's trauma to the nose. I did one recently. Even with blood in the airway, you can put an LMA in nicely with a bit of local on. And I think um, either an IGEL, but even a, 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 a classic LMA, some local, put that in and then inch way through it. Okay, wh wh why would you not do that asleep? Um, you couldn't oxygen, if for this gentleman, you mean? Um, because you you can't really um, yeah you you could chance it but your your plan B then is if you lose the airway if this falls down over his airway um, it it might it might be more difficult so it's yeah. always safer to do these things awake 
Yeah, no, I agree. In fact, uh, uh, the, the biggest uh, problem here is is his, his impossible face mask ventilation. Yeah, which uh, which is why I've, I've, I've highlighted the case. Uh, and the plan uh, from the uh, for the anaesthetist on the on the day doing the list was, was to put in a laryngeal mask airway because uh, he yeah. felt that actually it won't be a problem to put it in and to ventilate. But my yeah. worry, what? Yeah. I'd yeah. like to say something. Sure. Um, would you consider? I mean, would you consider doing the entire surgery with the supraglottic airway or just as a bridge? Uh, to anesthetize the patient, and then I would I would add that as my second option: place in a supraglottic airway device, and then use a hybrid technique, maybe use an entry catheter. But I would definitely be comfortable with a oh. conventional tube in place, so that there's going to be a lot of bleeding when the surgeon operates, and we don't want any problem with the you know, aspiration of blood. So as a bridge technique, I agree, but I would definitely go for a more definitive airway. Yeah, Again. so I agree. That's what I meant to bridge. I wouldn't. I would not not intubate this guy. No, I think from Imran's question, I misunderstood. He said, would anybody go with a supraglottic airway? So I presume that, no, I'm sorry, Alec. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a genuine question. Was, was Would anybody consider doing this just under a supraglottic Not me. No. Not me. I've lost everybody. Uh, yeah, you can still see everyone. Yeah. As a bridge, as a rescue, yes, but not as a definitive airway. Fine. Uh, I seem to have lost everybody, but I'm just going to just show you what I did. Sorry, Han, I'm just going to move on, uh, and I'm going to show you what I did. Uh, and, and, and I, so, so I shared the screen. To, we're down the last three minutes. They must be indicating four, to us that we're done. Awake intubation. Imran, you have to share the screen. We can't see your screen anymore. Yep. Uh, and uh, that was done successfully. Uh, uh, and uh, we, we secured the airway with a reinforced tube and then I put the patient to sleep and then we did the case, which is we quite strange. can't strict. see your screen, Imran. Could, uh, could the share, could the share your screen. So, Jay, can you... Oh, I, mean, I seem to have been kicked out. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> your time's up. Yeah, yeah, okay, let me, st let me share... Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Here we go, share again. For the honorary boot. Yeah, there you go. Okay. I can see you now. Okay, wow. yeah, so I, I did do an oral um, uh, awake intubation uh, uh, with a flexible bronchoscope, but I completely agree we could use a video laryngoscope. I just want to show you this little little clip here. Uh, this was my first attempt. Can anybody tell me the 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 the, the mistake? Yeah, the Murphy's eye. The Murphy's eye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you see that's how? a great picture? That's a great picture. I've, we've uh, all done that once. Happened to me as well. <laughs> yeah. so always check your kit before you start. It's very simple little things can cause you big problems. So I always show that just to show you know even even those of us who do it on a regular basis can get stuck sometimes. Uh, how are we for time? Yeah, time. We've just got one minute. Mm -hmm. Take okay. the time. No, it doesn't matter. Finish off this, please. Yeah. This, this one's done. I think th this case is done now. So I will. I'll. I'll, I'll stop there because um, uh, we can go on for for, for ages now. Uh, I uh, can I just uh, bring in uh, Professor Mishami because she wanted to make a comment on the obstetric case. Ah yes, please, Mary. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 I, I'm sorry. I couldn't resist that. I really needed to just comment on it. Absolutely fantastic case. And I'm not trying to um, advertise our paper, but actually the way you presented it really followed the decision aids that we, we recommended. You know, if you look at the initial recommendation of multidisciplinary decision of deciding do you go for labor or cesarean section, et cetera. And also just for obstetric anesthetists out there, one of the things we included in the paper was a resource of the 150 cases all summarized as to the pathology and how they were managed. And if you ever want to look up a case that you have and you don't know how to manage it, it's available and it's all online linked to that paper. And in fact, there was one case with the patient with exactly the syndrome you just uh, described there. So thank you very much. And one of the other things that they mentioned is, or that was obvious is that there are a lot of people who've done nasal, awake nasal intubation in obstetric patients. Yeah. I think that's a myth that, Mary, yeah. that needs to be debunked. Um, unless they have platelet issues. A lot of people avoid it and they struggle more because yeah. patients have big tongues, there's more edema and a nasal goes right down the back and up the face. So yeah. I, I think we've been all taught that, but I don't think there's any evidence behind it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks for allowing me to comment. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Uh, 
I, I never claim myself to be an obstetric anesthetist. Thank you very much for the, the <laughs> wonderful question. But you question. have a case there. You've got one case on those 150. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Uh, okay, so um, Sajay, are we... Are we yeah, are we... with that note, uh, I will... I mean, this was a very wonderful session and it was a wonderful day. And I hope, you know, people, uh, the delegates and other speakers and chairs enjoyed as much as I did. And I have to thank all the wonderful and eminent speakers and chairs who spared their time on this Sunday uh, in the mid mid middle of this COVID pandemic. And I know you are all very busy. Thank you uh, from the bottom of our heart on behalf of the organizers. Uh, and the delegates have joined us from 43 different countries and nearly 2,500. We had, we had to stop uh, the registration at the end because the platform couldn't handle more than that. So thank you, everyone who joined us. Thank you for the organizing committee for helping out this, with this. And the technical team, Evan Logics, did a wonderful job. And uh, this uh, the, the conference was live streamed by Anastasia TV on their channels, YouTube channels and Facebook channels. And thank you them. And uh, you can see on on, on the left hand right hand side uh, there is a provision for putting your feedback. Once you fill in the feedback form, there will be an option for you to uh, download your certificate. Uh, uh, probably we'll have to come back after an hour or so to uh, you know see the correct form to submit. And once again, I thank everyone who you know spent their time during um, the conference. And thanks a lot. Thank you, Sajay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks. Nice Thank day. you. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks, Imran, for uh, for leading us through this wonderful discussion. And thanks, uh, Ellen, Hans, uh, yeah. Krish. Uh, as well. oh, nice Thank seeing you and you guys. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Take bye. care. Very awesome. Thank you. Bye. bye. I'm, so I'm bye. logging off. Goodbye. Goodbye.